بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله Thank you all for taking the time to join. Uh, we are just having some technical difficulties. Just going to get this all set up and finalized. Bismillah. All right. So we are starting this conversation today about deceptive desires. And really the goal of this conversation is to help us understand in detail what desires are, help us understand and find ways to curb these desires, and to help us figure out ways to channel the energy that we channel towards desires in a little bit of a different direction. We're in a world right now where all of us, every single person is obeying some desire or another. You and I, we are created to worship. We will either worship God, we will worship money, we will worship fame, we will worship followers, we will worship something or another. And the human being has a desire inside of them. It is a desire to want to worship something, but not all of us worship the right thing. That's just something for us to keep in mind. We live in a time where people say, oh, why do you worship God? Why do you have a religion? Well, even if somebody doesn't actually say outwardly that they're worshiping God, inwardly, they are worshiping something and they're just making that thing on a pedestal. They're putting that uh, goal that they have on a pedestal. Right. So in the, in, the, in the old days, you would have the idea of very, very formal shirk. There's a there is a statue that somebody you know makes and they're going to bow down to the statue. And now those statues are more figurative statues that people erect and they bow down to those statues. And those are the different types of things that you and I worship. So Allah actually asks in the Quran, have you seen the one who takes his hawa, his desire as his Lord? And that's an important consideration for us to keep in mind because you and I can actually be worshiping our desire. Somebody who has unleashed and uh, not uh, tamed sexual desires can just be worshiping their sexual desires. Somebody who is not able to stop yelling at people and who's always getting mad at people, they're just worshiping their anger. They're really, really uh, not able to control their anger. So in these conversations, we're gonna be going through one desire a week, inshallah, if Allah gives us assistance. And we're just going to be talking frankly. We're going to talk frankly about things like sexual desire, talk frankly about the desire for fame, talk frankly about the desire for followers in this world of Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and YouTube and every single other social media platform it is that exists. Many of us, we are trying to always gain more followers. We're trying to get more likes. We're trying to get more people to validate us. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why that happens and what we can do to tame it and curb that energy in the right direction. So let's start a little bit with just what the framework for our desires um, is. So let's 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 try and establish um, the uh, framework for desires by thinking about how you and I are created. Allah says in the Quran that you and I are created weak. He says, "Audhu billahi min shaitan rajim." Khuliq al insan daifa that the human being was created weak. We are actually created with a very very significant weakness inside of us, and this weakness actually makes us susceptible to so much more than we would want to be susceptible to. So, you know, you have those moments where you're like, I got everything under control. I'm, I'm, you know, conquering this, I'm conquering that. And the next thing you know, we screw up again. We fall short again. Uh, we slip again. And that's because that weakness that we have, right? Now, desire is also not something easy for us to control. Desire is something that is created by God to be strong. It's not supposed to be weak because it's not supposed to be easy. That's one framework I want all of us to keep in mind as we have these conversations. That frame the framework for success in life is that life has challenges and life has tests. And if everything were to be super easy, well, where is the test, right? If God is trying to reward us with heaven, then there has to be certain tests along the way in a kind of an exam to see, okay, is this person going to get an A? Is this person going to get a B? Is this person going to get a C? What type of grades are they going to get? And then based on that is the final outcome. So the natural propensities that we have are supposed to be difficult to conquer. Imam al-Ghazali, one of the chief scholars in the religion of Islam, he actually says that the most difficult propensity inside the human being to deal with is that of desire. And he says it is the oldest capacity in, in, in humans, in the man, and it is the first thing to be created in a child. Now, 
So this opens up the conversation. Is a desire a bad thing? Like, should we just eliminate desires? The answer is no, right? You have to have the desire to eat. I, I, I'm hungry right now. I need to go eat food at some point. If I don't eat, if I have no desire to eat, what's going to happen to me? Well, I'm going to eventually lose energy. I'm not going to be able to do anything. I'm not going to be able to uh, do the work that it is that I need to do. I'm not going to be able to contribute in whatever way that is possible to society. And eventually, God forbid, you might actually die of hunger, right? Um, the desire for the sexual desire that's created in the human being for a reason. You're not supposed to eliminate it. You're supposed to channel it in the right direction. You're supposed to channel that desire in the direction of uh, permissible marriage. And then that allows somebody to, you know, procreate, have kids and spread uh, goodness and spread children in the world and hopefully spread Muslims in the world. So there are all these different types of desires. Again, our goal is not to eliminate them. The goal is to channel them in the right direction and to curb them and to make sure that they don't control us. One thing for us to always keep in mind how we can evaluate where we're at as human beings. If something con is controlling us, if something is controlling you and me, something's wrong. If you and I are in control of whatever it is that's inside of us, right? ultimately Allah's in control, but if we are able to control ourselves, then that means we're progressing along the path well. So never let something control you. Never let your impulse to you know, just eat everything it is that you see control you. Never let uh, the different things that um, you and I might be tempted to do, might be tempted to look at, might be tempted to engage with. Don't let anything control you because you and I are supposed to be the ones in control of our inner world. So let's talk a little bit about what desire is. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about how we go about balancing it. So desire is a natural propensity inside of the human being, a natural propensity which makes us want to engage in um, whatever activity it is that we are that we're talking about, right? So our goal is to bring this desire into a state of moderation. It is to bring the desire into a state of moderation. Just one second here. I just want to check something. All right. Sorry about that. So the goal is to bring the desire into a state of moderation. We want to bring it into equilibrium. So I'll give you an example. Let's say that somebody is like always overeating, like just all the time they're overeating, right? Well, the goal there would be to bring that desire of overeating into moderation of eating at normal times by doing what? What would we have to do? What the scholars recommend is you actually have to fast in order to bring the overeating into balance, right? How does that work? Well, if you fast, if you are on one end of the spectrum is somebody who just eats everything it is that they see. And on the other end of the spectrum is somebody who is trying to regularly and constantly fast in order to bring the person who's overeating into the middle. You can't just reduce the food by a little bit. You actually have to start fasting and go on the other side of the spectrum. Because if you go on the other side of the spectrum, you are now able to balance this desire and bring it into the equilibrium that you need to bring it into, right? So that's something for us to, to really keep in mind. The goal is not to eliminate it, is to bring this desire into equilibrium. This is going to be the case with every single thing it is that we're talking about, right? You can use the desire for food to eat everything that's halal and that's haram. You can use the desire to, to uh, enjoy, to drink, and to drink alcohol and to party. You can use those desires in the wrong direction. Your goal is going to be to channel them in the right way and ultimately to bring all these desires into a state of equilibrium. So another very, very common desire that we have. What is it? That desire would be the desire for the, the desire for anger, right? It's very, very normal tendency in the human being to get angry. So how do we balance this tendency to get angry? Well, what we're supposed to do is we're not supposed to eliminate anger. You don't get rid of anger, but you channel anger in the right direction. Because Allah says in the Quran that those who restrain their anger, He says, that those who restrain their anger. So when you're really upset, when you're just about to unleash on somebody, uh, the goal is to restrain anger. It's something I know personally I need to work on, right? That, that if I'm getting in a moment of anger, how do I go about restraining it? Now, if the human being completely eliminated anger, let's say that desire for anger was just gone inside of you, well, how are you going to get upset about wrongs that are happening in the world? How are you going to get upset about social injustices? How are you going to get upset about things that people are doing that they shouldn't be doing? 
right, about corruption and all these other problems that happen in the world. How are we going to get upset about that? Well, that faculty of anger and that desire of anger is in there to help us get upset about the right things and to not focus on the petty stuff that is that we get angry about. So it's to, again, bring it into equilibrium. So in this kind of treatment of desires, you have a variety of different types of people. So we're just going to roughly categorize the types of people that you have when we're talking about desires. And again, class is focused on deceptive desires. We're going to be talking, inshallah, about a different desire every single week. And the uh, focus for right now is just to help us give a little bit of a framework for what a desire is. How do we go about understanding it? So you have somebody, and these are from Imam al-Ghazali, he says you have somebody who's like never really ever had their desires aroused. And so they can really quickly respond to treatment. They can really quickly treat the desires and bring them all into equilibrium. That category of person I doubt exists in the modern world today, but maybe there's a couple people out there. If so, um, you know, let us know how you're doing. Uh, but then there's a second category. This is the category of somebody who recognizes when they're following desires, they recognize their kind of foul acts, and at the same time, they sometimes behave in the proper ways, but they're not necessarily in the habit of behaving righteously or of uh, taming their desires. This person has to uproot the corruption and uproot the desires and then go through a process of self-discipline in order to actually tame the desires. That's the goal for this person, right? Then you have somebody, the third category is someone who like actually thinks that following your desires, like just unleashed following of desires is a good thing. And this person is generally going to struggle to change, right? But it's still possible. And then finally, you have the person who like boasts about being arrogant. They boast about like, oh, the, you know, how many girls or uh, they've slept with, how many people they've hooked up with from, you know, and illicitly um, about all the different, you know, partying it is that they've done. They boast about these types of things. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with changing your life after you and I slip up in those areas. But there's definitely something problematic about talking um, uh, from a like boasting about all of the things that we've done that are actually bringing negativity and negative energy inside of ourselves and in society, right? So the person who loves corruption, who loves evil, they're very difficult to change. Somebody like the the president of the United States who just left this the presidency, thank God, right? Just completely, just obviously corrupt inside, and then his corruption was so bad inside that it just seeped throughout the whole country. You have hundreds of thousands of millions of people, in fact, who are corrupt now because of the fact that one person's corruption was so strong, it impacted others. Keep that in mind. You can have a light that's so strong inside that impacts others, and you can have a darkness that's so strong inside that it impacts others. So those are the couple categories of people. Now let's think a little bit about um, how do we channel these desires. So we talked about what these desires are, and we spoke about the different categories of people that exist. And we also spoke about the fact that we need to bring these desires into some state of equilibrium. That is the goal. Bring the desires into a state of equilibrium. You and I have to understand ourselves in order to like really ever succeed in life. Keep that in mind. You, you, we cannot succeed in life if we don't understand ourselves in some way or another. What does that mean? Look, I can understand myself outwardly, like, oh, okay, I look like this, I'm, you know, this tall, I weigh this much, I like these things, I'm interested in this, I'm not interested in this. This is a basic level of understanding. You can do that. But the goal of the human being, there's actually a statement um, that one of the righteous said that the one who knows themselves, himself or herself, knows their Lord. The first process of starting to discover the meaning, you know, people ask you, what's the meaning of life? The first way to start to discover the whole me the meaning of this whole place that we're in is to start to get to know yourself and it's to get to know the good and the bad. It's not difficult to get to know the good. Everybody likes to get to know the good. We love when people tell us, oh, you're like this. Oh, you're so, you know, you're so nice and you're so kind and generous and you know, oh, you're good looking and you're helpful, but all the different things it is that people tell us. And, you know, the, the ego, the nafs, it likes that. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, keep it coming. You know what I mean? Like, keep the praise coming, keep the likes coming. They love, it loves that. But what's hard to get to know, so that's easy to get to know the good about yourself. And it's important to know the good about yourself so you can amplify it. What's difficult is to get to know the bad about yourself. The, the things like, you know what? Where am I weak? What are my blind spots? Where do I struggle? What are the things that I'm that I'm that are a challenge for me? That's difficult, right? But that doesn't mean it's impossible. It does not mean that you cannot know the bad about yourself. It just takes a little bit more work. 
And so this is a very, very important aspect of this journey of spiritual purification and this journey of spiritual progress to actually uncover and deeply think about the parts inside of us that we need to work on. But in order to know that, you got to know what your inner world looks like. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So you and I see every day, we see the outer world, right? We see everything going on, everything that's 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 happening in the, the outside that our, our eyes um, are able to see. There's also something called the inner eye. The inner eye is a part in us that's able to penetrate and see the inner realities of people and first and foremost, understand our own inner reality. This is something that the more somebody progresses spiritually, if Allah wishes to gift them with this, they are given this gift. And this is based on hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, beware of the firasa of the mu'min, beware of the piercing inner sight of the believer, because verily the believer sees by a very, very powerful piercing sight, right? So let's understand what this inner world looks like. You and I have a couple parts. You have what's called the nafs. So imagine the nafs is in the middle, okay? Then you have the nafs is the ego, it's the lower self. Then you have the door to the spiritual world, and that's called the ruh, the spirit. And then you have the, um, the nafs, which is the door to the dunya. It's the door to like all of the things it is that we uh, that, that can pull us down about this world, the, the, the fame and the followers and the money and the sexual desire. So that's the nafs. The nafs is, is the, door, the door to the world, the dunya and the world. The spirit is the door to the spiritual world, the unseen, right? The, the idea of spirituality is the more you work on refining your spirit, the more access you have to these unseen uh, lights and unseen breezes, which bring about tranquility and calmness and all these other wonderful gifts that um, help somebody. In the middle, I misspoke earlier, in the middle, you have the heart. That's a little heart. You have the heart in the middle. You've got the spirit on this side. You have the nafs on this side. Now, the more you obey your desires, the stronger the nafs gets. So the nafs is like, it's like you're working it out, right? You're working out this arm, the stronger the nafs gets, right? The more you obey and you, sorry, that you, that you don't obey the desires and that you, that you follow the practice of self-discipline and you work on yourself, the stronger the spirit gets, right? So now the spirit is getting a chance to work out. And then in the middle is the heart. Now the heart is going to be influenced by whichever side is stronger. The heart is just this kind of like, you could almost say this like innocent bystander and all this that's getting influenced by these two sides, right? This isn't easy. The heart has, an, the spirit has angels that are helping it. The nafs has de the devil and are the shayat, the various shayatin that are helping it, right? So these are the different types of desires that, it, these are the different categories of the inner world of the human being. Now, what is our goal? The goal is when people say the idea of like purifying the heart, right? It is about taming the desires so that the nafs doesn't get strong. You want to weaken the nafs, right? So like my non-existent biceps here, you want to make them completely go away on the side of the nafs. And you want to make the other, the spirit strong. You want to make the spiritual biceps strong. You want to make the spirit um, in a very, very uh, formidable place, right? That is really the goal. What happens then is the heart starts to get purified. And now you can actually start to listen to your heart. People say, right, this idea of like, oh, you got to listen to your heart. But you can actually start to listen to your heart because you know that the heart is in a state. Sorry, I'm just plugging this charger in. You know the heart is in a state of. Sorry about this. The heart is in a state of purity, right? So when the heart is in a state of purity, you can start listening to the heart. But don't follow your heart when it's not pure. That, that's going to mess you up because you actually could be following the nuts. Most of the time we are following the nafs. Most of the time when people say that I'm going to listen to the heart, it's the nafs has been working on us for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And so really the heart is like this small little thing that's just gotten overtaken by our desires. So that's very, very important to keep in mind. And then, and I don't want to get too, you know, um, uh, hopefully it's not too confusing. Next time, you know, see that whiteboard, I'll try to draw, draw on that whiteboard. Hopefully you'll be, you know, be able to read it. I've heard that my handwriting is very illegible. But clear, that's why we have keyboards and you can type. All right, alhamdulillah. So the inside of the nas, the last thing, is there's this thing called hawa. That is the word for desire. The hawa is like speaking to the nafs, right? In addition to shaitan, it's like, oh, do this. Oh, do that. Do this. Come on. Just look one more time. Do, you know, go. It's, 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 it's all good if you, uh, uh, you know, go and work that job that you shouldn't be working and, and, and you know, go and go gamble. It's all good if you drink a little bit. A couple more hits of that pipe, it's not going to do anything. 
go take a hit of your vape pen, right? It's the Hawa is literally like whispering things partly inside of us. It's a desire inside of us. It can also get strong and makes enough strong. And we haven't even spoken really much about shaitan. Like the, the devils are here to make things even worse for us, right? They actually uh, continue to nudge at us, nudge at us, nudge at us uh, in order to make the nuts stronger. So all of this to say, goal is what? Eliminate, sorry, curb the desire, make the nafs weak, make the spirit strong. You become strong. Life becomes easier to navigate. Um, and inshallah, it ends in a, in a good outcome. That's the kind of very, very basic formula that you and I have. But our goal then as these desires come is we just want to keep trying to bring them into equilibrium. We want to bring these desires into equilibrium. So now I'm just going to talk at a very, very high level about the, um, the ways in which these desires are formed inside. Okay. So you have, uh, different parts in you. And these are all based on a framework established by the scholars of the spirituality, especially Imam Ghazali. And they basically talk about, like I said, the nafs, the ruh, uh, which is the spirit and the heart. You also have these like faculties working inside of you. And they're basically teaching you or they're bringing you down, right? So you have what's called the rational faculty, which is the intellect. The rational faculty is supposed to be in control and in charge. So the intellect is supposed to be telling you what to do. So do this, don't do that. That's why knowledge is so important. Gaining knowledge is so important because the intellect becomes more powerful. The more powerful the intellect is, the more, um, in, a, in a good way, we're talking about spiritual knowledge here, not just like going and learning a bunch of facts and figures and then you know being intellectually arrogant. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the more and more the intellect knows and understands the religion, the more it's able to guide the rest of the body. Got it? Then you have another thing inside of you called the appetitive faculty. The appetitive faculty is the faculty inside of you which primarily governs the desire for sex and the desire for food. These are what are called the chief mother desires inside the human being. Somebody who cannot control these will not be able to control any desires, which is usually what you'll see really corrupt people, again, like the, the past president of the US, who completely was just unleashed with his sexual desires um, and just was not able to control any other desire on top of that. It eventually led for a corrupt desire for power. He tried to even hold on to power, tried to stage a coup. You see where this leads. You see how evil just one or two untamed desires can make somebody and then how far that darkness spreads. So this appetite of faculty, it governs the desires inside of you, the appetite of faculty. Talking about the desire for food and sex. We'll talk about those in the, in, 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 in the coming weeks, inshallah. The person who's able to control, right? The Prophet Sallallahu he said, he said, the one who's able to guarantee me what's in between their mouth and what's in between their private parts, I can guarantee for them heaven. That's talking about the food, right? According to many of the scholars and the tongue overall, like in terms of being able to control your tongue. Um, and so you could also say anger and the private parts, meaning sexual relations. Some... <coughs> excuse me, somebody's able to control these two. The Prophet said he can guarantee them heaven because they're very, very difficult to control. Excuse me. So all of this to say that you want your intellect to be in charge and you want the intellect to govern you. That's what you and I want. We want the rational faculty to be in charge. And then we have the appetitive faculty, which is the faculty which controls most of our desires. We want that faculty to be in submission to the intellect. Those are the two kind of basic ones that we want to cover for, uh, for, for today. So our goal then over time is any desire it is that we have, we just think about it. And this works for all traits, but specifically for desires, you just want to bring it into equilibrium. Okay. So it's like somebody is like completely doing, you know, um, uh, Let's we, we mentioned food earlier. Let's say sexual desire. Someone is just like on Tinder all the time or they're addicted to pornography, all the things that are very, very prevalent today. And if you're a parent um, of somebody who is a teenager, um, especially teenage boys, just be very aware that that like it's highly likely that they're getting exposed to very, very um, dangerous and haram uh, imagery out there. Um, that's that's that in a time when their desires are just developing, it's stimulating the desires in a very, very wrong way. And so these conversations are very important to have as families, right? So we have this uh, desire that can get out of control. Someone in that state would need to regulate that desire, right? There's spiritual medicine someone can apply. 
Prophet Sassam, he indicated to us that if somebody sexual desires are out of control, they should fast and that will help tame them. Why? Because these ones are linked, as we just mentioned, and they help clean the inner world and they clean the desires and they bring it into, into equilibrium. Or they can get married and permissibly, they can then engage in sexual relations that will help channel and that desire in the right direction. So that's a perfect example of how to bring something in to balance. We just want to slowly and slowly bring these things into balance. And so our, our goal then over the course of these conversations is we're just going to be talking about the very, very obvious desires. And then eventually we'll get into the more subtle desires that exist inside of the human being. The more subtle desires are those desires that the desire for religious um, uh, people to notice you in religious gatherings, the desire for people to praise you, those types of things. And then, of course, we'll talk about the more obvious ones like sexual desire, desire for food, the desire for, 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 for you know, excessive desire for money, the desire for uh, being in charge, the desire for power, the desire for people to listen to you, the desire for arguing, all those types of things we'll try to cover. And then the more we can bring this into equilibrium, if Allah wills, the more successful we're going to be in our life. And so we'll end here with a story of somebody um, who's a very, very important figure in the history of Islam in America, uh, Malcolm X. So for those who know the story of Malcolm, Malcolm, every single desire it is that was out there, Malcolm, before his Islam, was engaged in it, right? Hustling, um, dealing, gambling, drinking, smoking. I mean, everything it is that you could think of, right? Uh, this, uh, sexual relationships. But then Malcolm X he eventually found right, the nation of Islam and then eventually, alhamdulillah, he found Islam. And you saw somebody who, and it's not like it's just like a magic switch that happens and some, someone just completely stops all the stuff that they were doing before Islam. There's still work that has to be put in. And you saw somebody who they might have been the most, the person most deeply engaged wherever they were on the streets, let's say, or when they were hustling, they might have been most deeply engaged in certain desires. And then they were able to curb those desires. And then what happened? Not only did he curb those desires, he got all of his desires into equilibrium. And then he channeled the, the, the most powerful desire. This is a secret. The most powerful desire are not the weak ones. It's called the highest desire that you and I have is the desire for knowledge. If somebody becomes really into learning, the, especially having the desire to know Allah, the knowledge of Allah, then the desires that are inside of them, the other desires will automatically start to get tamed, inshallah, because they will be focused on a higher purpose and they will already have put some work into taming those desires. So what happened with Malcolm? When Malcolm was in jail, he would read an insane amount. He would literally be reading and they would close the jail. They would close the lights at a certain time and Malcolm would have um, a light that he would be reading with. And then when the guard would come by to just check on every single cell, Malcolm would close the light and close the book. And then the guard would leave and he would keep reading. That's how much his desire for knowledge increased. And then his desire for learning about Allah, learning about Allah's religion increased, such that he became somebody who was into learning and then into spreading knowledge and spreading justice. And that desire became so strong. It's a good desire, right? It's a good desire because our goal is to channel the desires that pull us down. You and I have desires that are pulling us this way. There's to slowly channel them, bring them onto the horizontal playing field and then slowly channel them vertically towards Allah. What does that mean? We can desire Allah. You can desire Jannah. You can desire getting to know Allah. You can desire the love of Allah, all positive things. If those desires become powerful enough in the human being, these lowly desires that you and I have, they become, they, we stop wanting to follow them because you're like, dude, there's so much more I could be doing, right? Who cares about this? Who cares about getting high when I could be getting like spiritually high in the right way? Right? Like who cares about these things? So these desires, so he channeled the desires from literally being dragged down and then he started to be pulled up, a magnetic pull. And he, he channeled these desires in the most positive direction, alhamdulillah. He was then able to go out and he was able to spread immense good, bring people who are struggling with significant parts of their life back into goodness. And he was able to become one of the most, um, if not the most significant uh, Islamic figure in the in the history of the United States. I mean, subhanAllah, Malcolm X, look at, look at this type of impact that he had, all because he was able to control his desires and he was able to bring them into a state of equilibrium. So that is the type of potential that you and I have. We can't let the lowliness of desires, the lowliness of this dunya, the lowliness of all these appetites that we have bring us down. 
That's what animals do. The animals, they just, all they want to do is like, they want to eat. They want to be with other animal. They want to copulate. That's all animals want to do. That's not what you and I were created for. We do that stuff at a limited level. We bring it into equilibrium and we focus on what's important in life. What's important in life is getting the desire to be focused vertically on getting to know Allah, the desire for loving Allah, the desire for loving the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the desire for spreading khair, the desire for spreading good, the desire for serving. All these types of desires are positive ones that we can bring about once we tackle the, the basic ones. So inshallah, we'll spend the next couple of weeks talking about the basic ones. We'll talk about how we work on them. And then, of course, the work comes in and we have to, it's a lifelong struggle. It's a lifelong journey that we put in, that we, that we have to put work in, to taming each and every single desire. We work on ourselves, then we try to help our families and then our communities, societies, and so on and so forth. Allah says in the Quran that he does not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So we got to work on what's in ourselves and Allah will start to change our condition, change the condition of our family. And then hopefully he will allow us to help change the condition of the society that we live in to help bring it out of the state of immense corruption and immense uh, obsession with the wrong type of desires, bring it into equilibrium. So we pray that Allah blesses everybody. We pray that we, he blesses the efforts that we're trying to make. For, uh, and we, we pray that he uh, assists everybody. Uh, we'll do a short prayer, short dua, and then we'll go ahead and end. We're going to try to keep these classes 30 to 35 minutes, inshallah. So we'll do Wednesday every evening, 7 uh, p.m. Uh, PST, um, inshallah, 7 to 7.30. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma aftahu alayna fatu al-arifin wa fiqna tawfiqa salihin. Ya Rahman ar-Rahmin, Rabbana taqabal minna anika anta samir al-Rahim wa tuba al-Layla anika anta swab al-Rahim. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, we ask that you accept this. Ya Allah, we ask that you pardon us. We ask that you allow us to curb our desires and to channel our desires in the right way and to bring them into a state of equilibrium. We ask that you put barakah in all of the efforts it is that people are doing, Ya Allah, to spread your religion, Ya Allah. And we ask that you allow the Prophet Sallallahu to be pleased with all of us. And we ask that you are pleased with all of us. And we ask that you forgive all of those it is that have passed away from COVID and from any other disease amongst the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Allah, in the recent days and in the recent weeks, and that you grant them the highest stations of paradise and all those who are sick and are families and are the families of our loved ones, Ya Allah, that you cure them and that you remove all difficulty uh, from our life and from their life and that you bring immense barakah and immense khair into our life and anybody who it is that is here that is struggling or that intended to be here or that is just making any good intention anywhere in the world that has any difficulty, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you remove all their difficulty, that you bring khair and ease and positivity and happiness and optimism into their life, that you remove all of our anxieties and depressions and that you bless all of our affairs inwardly and outwardly in this world and the next صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين Thank you so much السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله So today we are going to be talking about the different types of desires that a human being has and we're going to just do a quick recap um, in terms of what we covered last time and then we're going to dive into uh, a couple of the different categories of desires uh, that you can think of that you and I might have So last time we just talked more about the introduction and the framework for how desires work, what are the types of desires that we have. And uh, this time, really, the goal is to help us develop a deeper understanding of why desires can be so negative for us, why they can hurt us, and why obeying our desires can be so harmful for us as human beings. So a couple of things for us to keep in mind. First is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that the one who restrains their nafs from following its desires, that for them, heaven is the reward for that, right? So Allah alludes to this in the Quran regularly, that if you control yourself, inshallah, you're going to get a reward. You're going to get heaven or you're going to get some other type of reward for it. And so that's important because what we're seeing is that the path to heaven, the path to the pleasure of God, the path to goodness is facilitated and really the path is set up in a way that we have to control our desires in order to get to the end goal, right? So if we control these desires, if we control our sexual desire, our desire for food, our desire for fame and wealth and all these other things that we have inside of us, we will be able to travel that path in a more effective way. But if you obey your desires, whether they are the apparent ones or the subtle ones, whether you're following the desire to outwardly go and do something that you shouldn't be doing because of a carnal appetite, or whether you're obeying some inner um, desire to get noticed and you pray only so people can praise you and you give charity only so people can tell you how awesome you are and how wealthy and generous you are, whatever desire you're following, that, that leads away from the path of heaven. And so that's just one major point for us to keep in mind here. 
And as um, you know, folks have questions, uh, the live chat feature, at least in YouTube, is working. So please feel free to chime in with questions. I'll do my best to address them, inshallah. So we, we, we covered, uh, we discussed this just briefly, um, the types of desires that, that you have. But I want to dive into it a little bit more in this class. So our goal is to go from basic carnal appetites to what are called the stronger spiritual desires, okay? So as I mentioned, the goal is not to eliminate your desires. You do not have to get rid and be a desire-free person. Islam is not the type of religion that says that you have to become completely abstinent in everything and you have to achieve kind of a monk type of status. No, alhamdulillah, the Prophet sallallahu who is our role model, he married, he ate food, he fasted, and he broke his fast, right? He didn't fast every single day, uh, nafil fast. Of course, in Ramadan he did, right? But he would pray at night and he would also sleep at night. He married, he engaged in relationships, right? So this idea of complete abstinence um, from the desires that we have to completely eliminate them, that's not what we're talking about here. The goal, though, is to curb our desires. It's to get them in control. You don't want anything controlling you. Think about this as a human being. Only Allah should control you. Don't let something else, your lust or some desire for food or some bank account or some money or all these types of things control you. No. When you get an inclination, they're like, oh, I have a decision I could make. I could go and buy a car and, and get live within my means and buy a car that I can afford in either a 0% APR loan or buy a car that I can afford um, all cash. Or you could get the you know, super fancy, the Mercedes or the BMW or whatever it is, and it requires you taking out an interest loan. Well, desire leads you to haram. So you following that desire to be the big boss and to be the big shot and drive the car it is that you might want, but you can't afford it and it requires an interest loan, we might not think of it as a big deal, 1% APR, 2% APR, but that's technically, I mean, not technically, it's very validly haram. But which part of us, how, how do we go about controlling that? It's about limiting the desire. For the person who doesn't have a desire in the first place to go beyond their means, who doesn't have a desire in the first place for significant wealth or all these luxuries or status or these types of things, they're not going to go and do these types of things, right? So that's something for us to uh, keep in mind. So now let's get to um, uh, the, 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 the way for us to travel from following these carnal appetites to actually achieving these more spiritual desires it is that the human being has. So the basic appetites right, that you and I have, we have the basic appetites of uh, sexual appetite, the appetite for food, Those, that's what everything's built on. And then the appetite for money and the desire for, for, for wealth and the desire for status, those are, those are other ones. Those are the things that pull us down, okay? Those things pull us down. What you want to go to is you want to traverse up. The spiritual journey is a journey upwards. It's a journey towards um, uh, a closer relationship with Allah. So in order to traverse upward, you have to desire up things that are high up there. Does that make sense? So hopefully we want to desire what are called spiritual desires. So what does that mean? It means that we want to have a couple of things. There is a way to transform yourself. There's a way for Allah to transform you, for an inner alchemy to happen, that rather than desiring these base things, you start desiring high things. Like what? You start desiring love of Allah. You start desiring tranquility. You start desiring peaceful moments so you can worship Allah. You start desiring knowledge. You start desiring moments where you can learn. You start desiring sitting with wise people who can teach you, right? These are the types of things a human being can actually start to channel their desires. So rather than somebody who's like, you know, partying all the time or clubbing or um, just caught up in all the different things that we can be caught up with, especially in Western society, you start to channel those desires into the right direction and start to focus on what would be called these higher value spiritual desires. So that is very, very important. That is the goal of this path for us to take this, the carnal desires and for us to traverse instead of just following the carnal appetites, we try to follow the we try to shift those carnal appetites upwards and we instead eliminate the carnal aspect of them and we start to channel them towards spiritual desires. So now you and I know the goal. What's the goal? We got to get from A to B, right? We got to get from, from, from the situation we're in right now to a higher situation where we start desiring the right types of things. Now, this is a journey though. It's not easy, right? This journey requires inner work and inner balancing. What you and I want is we want to figure out what are the different keys that will unlock different parts of us that will allow us to traverse this journey, right? So self-mastery is what becomes important here. You, might, you and I might have heard of this concept, self-mastery. It is the idea in the, in, of literally mastering your nafs, of mastering yourself. Yourself, your nafs does not dictate you. 
You are not a slave to your nafs. You are not a slave to your desires. You are a slave to Allah. If you are a slave to Allah, you will desire Allah. You will love Allah. You will want Allah. You will yearn for him. Allah says in the Quran, those people who uh, the, the, uh, uh, have a uh, yearning and they're aspiring to Allah. Right? He mentions that. So that's who we want to be from. We want to be from the people who have this desire to get close to our Lord. That's not going to work if we're caught up in all these other types of things. So we have to we have to reduce those things. We have to channel the energy in the right direction. But it requires hard work. It does require hard work. So just like if think about it like this, if somebody who wants to play a game, like let's say they're playing a sports game, right? It's the Super Bowl just happened. Um, and the team that won the Super Bowl, for them to win, so Tom Brady and his team, right? For them to win the Super Bowl, you think it was just like, you're there's chilling all the time, you know, drinking and hanging out and eating food? I doubt that. No, they were working out. They were hustling. They were practicing. They were, they're up early and working out. They are in different various games. They are, of course, winning all the different games in the season. And then they get to the Super Bowl and then they have to work really hard in that game to actually win. So that required work. But the work paid off, right? It paid off in a, in a reward. Right? You got a ring and you get a trophy and all these types of things and you get bragging rights to say you won. But other than that, the reward is limited to this world. But they put in the hard work, the sweat, the blood, sweat, and tears, and the hard work in order to hustle to make it happen. Now think about this. You and I, we have a chance to put in the hard work to conquer ourselves, and we get way more reward than the simple reward of winning a Super Bowl or getting some money or some prize or status in this life. That's nothing. We get the reward of, inshallah, eternal Jannah, eternal Jannah, eternal paradise, no worries, no sicknesses, no problems no challenges, all calmness and tranquility and hanging out with the prophets. May Allah bless all of them and bestow peace and blessings upon all of them, right? No family tensions and problems and illnesses and COVID and all these types of things, and let alone blessings upon blessings upon blessings, abundant blessings that Allah showers upon his servants in paradise. But it takes hard work to get there, right? It comes in a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that paradise is surrounded by difficult things. And so it makes it easy to get to. And that hellfire is surrounded by beautiful things. And so it's you, 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 you will yearn and incline that the desire in you will incline towards the path of the hellfire unless you and I tame our desires. When we start to tame our desires, our self becomes okay with the hard work and the self mastery needed in order to achieve the best outcome, which is the outcome of traversing the path to paradise. So let's talk a little bit about um, what types of desires exist. So you have the obvious ones, and then you have the subtle ones. So I think I've already mentioned the obvious ones like a lot, but I'll just mention them again. Sexual appetite, appetite for food, the desire for money, the desire for fame, the desire for significant amounts of wealth, the desire to be in charge, the desire to be famous, the desire to have followers. These are all like in the, the last couple are very much linked, right? You'll see people in this society they will do everything it is that they could and they'll be really promiscuous. And generally speaking, they have no control over their food and their diet many times. And then after they get to a certain point, it's not about that stuff. Like well, now I got to make as much money as possible through whatever means as possible. And then while they're doing that, what are they spending their money on? They're spending, many people are spending their money on, you know, uh, activities that they shouldn't be doing, going clubbing and this type of thing, over and drinking, having tabs at the bar that are like thousands of dollars. Right? Just overdoing it, living this excessively lavish, unnecessarily exuberant, extravagant life. Then, oh, that's not enough. Well, now I got to be in charge. Maybe I'll run for office. Maybe I'll be. Maybe I'll try to get to the CEO status in my company. That's still not enough because the nuffs is never full. Now I want to be famous. I got to run for office and be famous. I got to be in charge of people. I got to be powerful. I want followers. Now everybody can get followers because of these different social media platforms. You'll see the desire goes on and on and on, and it never leaves you. It never leaves you. It, different desires target different people depending on the age you're at. But you see this in politicians all the time. I mean, I see it even in the, the president of the United States, the past president. All of these desires were extremely manifest in his life journey and up to the point where the desire to be in charge was so manifest that he was trying to stage a coup in order to stay in charge. But that's just desire and all nuffs. Definition of nuffs is that, right? The nuffs cannot handle losing. The nuffs cannot handle people when, when they don't praise you and, and so that example was an example of pure nafs. You and I follow an example of spirit, of the Prophet ﷺ, who is a spiritual, um, who is our spiritual guide, right? He is, he is the Prophet ﷺ. He is the one who 
teaches us how to attain stations of spirituality that draw us nearer to <laughs> nearer to Allah. Excuse me. So those are their parent desires. Those are obvious. The nafs, it likes those desires, you know? Um, it, 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 it likes those desires. And so it's obvious. But remember this, the nafs, one time I remember one of my teachers told me, he said that the nafs will try to take its share of everything, including obedience. It will take its share in obedience. And Ibn Ata'ila in the Hikam, he mentions this, that the nafs wants its share in everything. So now let's get into obedience. Why does the nafs want its share in obedience? Well, what the nafs wants here is it wants its... Um, uh, it wants to be noticed in some way or another. So with disobedience, it's very clear. What is the nafs not, what is the nafs uh, getting? It's getting fulfillment of these different appetites. But when you start worshiping Allah and you start trying to get close to him, you start following the religion, you want to, now what the nafs says is like, how can I get, how can I get a portion of this? So it says, oh, you should pray so people can tell you, look at how great you are. Oh, you should do this so people can say, look at how religious you are. Oh, you should say this so that people can praise you. Oh, mashallah, mashallah. Oh, you should do this so people can like your status. Oh, you should post this religious statement or any statement, whatever, so people can praise you in this way or another. Oh, you should do this, give this much money so people can 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 tell you how generous you are. Oh, you should learn knowledge so people can say, wow, look at this guy, look at this girl, she knows so much. This is the nuts trying to get its share in obedience. And this is very much a possibility it comes in a very, very, very famous hadith where the Prophet some indicated that one of the first people to be thrown in the hellfire will be the scholar who taught people so that people could say he was knowledgeable. And the scholar who recited Quran so that people could praise him, not for the sake of Allah. And this is what's happening here is that the desire, the nafs is taking its portion of the worship and the desire, this is called, these are called apparent subtle desires. So you have obvious desires, you have the subtle ones that are hidden. Once you break past the obvious desires, you've got to work on the subtle desires. Because if you don't, you can still be ruined. You can still be ruined in this life and in the next. Um, Allah protect us. But it's not just about defeating the apparent ones. But Allah starts to help you. Allah helps always. Allah says that he, that he takes the believers out of darkness and into light. And uh, Allah is the protecting friend of the believers. And he takes them out of darkness into light. And so know that Allah can take you out of the darkness in, of desire into the light of trying to obey him and the darkness of obeying him for the wrong reason into the light of obeying him for the right reason and the darkness of insincerity to the light of, insin of, of sincerity. That's all up to Allah. He will, inshallah, do it. But we have to put in the effort. Allah says in the Quran that whoever strives in our way, surely we shall guide them. So you and I have put in the effort. And, and, and we know that hadith where the, you uh, you go to Allah walking and Allah comes running, right? You go to him a hand span, he comes an arm span. So we put in that effort. But the apparent desires are there, so don't discount them. Don't think, oh, you know, I'm not drinking, I'm not smoking, I'm not clubbing, I'm not, you know, on Tinder all the time, I'm not doing... And if you are doing all those things, there's a lot of hope. Allah will forgive you, inshallah, and Allah will facilitate a path to goodness. Don't let anybody ever tell you, like, you're too kind of, you know, sinful or, or or messed up for salvation. No, nobody has that right to say anything. Allah is a Rahim. But some people might think that, oh, you're caught up in these types of things. And once I leave them, oh, I'm good. I've, I figured it out. I'm bound for heaven. I got my spot reserved in heaven. You know, and it's not how it works because there's still work to be done. And I have to work on a daily basis, on a weekly basis on ourselves. The nafs will always try to trick us with something or another. Tricks are up its sleeve, trying to get to you. And the desires have to be conquered in order for the nafs to be defeated. So, as we just mentioned. Now, there are a, a couple other things to keep in mind. The more you obey any one desire, the stronger it gets. As I mentioned last time, it's like feeding. It's like you feed that desire. So the more you follow, let's say with sexual appetite. This one's obvious. The more one follows their sexual appetites, the more they're going to want to continue to engage in illicit sexual relations, right? And so you have... Uh, somebody who's just not able to control themselves here. The more you eat and overeat, the more you're going to want to overeat. So this culture in the U.S. of buffets and this type of thing, it encourages regular overeating and unhealthy foods don't help with that. And then, of course, you and I uh, know that the country has an obesity problem. So this is because desires are followed. And then you have like ads come up like 7-Up or Sprite, which everyone says, like, obey your thirst, right? These are targeted ads to make you obey the nafs. It's really just saying obey the nafs. Right? Obey your thirst, obey your desire. So it tries to get you to obey that desire for food 
or for 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 um, for you know beverages and whatnot. So that being said, simple solution here: you lessen the amount that you do of that thing, and it will start to get better. Right? People who have pornography addictions, let's say, which is a very big problem in the Muslim community, um, unfortunately, but it is a problem, and unfortunately, it's not talked about that much either. The more one works on themselves and reduces the amount that they are engaging in or watching, the more they will be able to conquer that desire. It doesn't go away completely. That desire has to be eventually curved then into a halal situation where one gets married and is able to release that in the right way. So that's the, the, the kind of high level path. But here's the tricky thing. When you get into the subtle desires, we have apparent ones and subtle ones. When you get into the subtle ones, the more you follow the subtle ones, the more your nafs will trick you into thinking that you're all that and you don't really need work on yourself. So the, the other ones, it's obvious. Like you and I know, okay, if we're you know, doing something very obviously haram, I'm like, okay, I gotta stop. But the nafs doesn't work like that. When you start to say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna worship so people can notice me, or I'm gonna speak, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, learn so people can say this about me, this type of thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get followers um, so that I, I can be, get, get more and more influence in the hearts of people. What's happening here? is that their words affect you in a way you don't know and the people's eyes and their gaze at you and all the different ways that they're following you affect you in ways that you don't know. And that gets subtle because it makes the nuff stronger, but the nuff tricks you into thinking that it's becoming weaker. So hopefully this makes sense. As you get more and more religiously oriented and worship oriented, the nuffs will get to a point where it's like, look at you, you're, the, you're all that. You're the most religious person in your family. You're like, you're the person who like, you know, your family wears a job and has a beard and this, this and that. And nobody else does that. Look at you. And then what people end up doing is the nafs tricks them so much. And I've seen this happen that they'll spend all this time talking back, talking smack about other people because they're like, oh, look at this person and that person doesn't do this. And this person doesn't cover theirs. And this person doesn't dress like this. And they're just losing all their good deeds and backbiting. Meanwhile, they're puffed up thinking that there's something. That's the nafs. That's desire being followed. And we ask that Allah protect us. Because there are very subtle things that can completely ruin our good actions, right? So the path then is a path of self-control. And the path is a path of working on ourselves and rejecting these impulses and rejecting these desires when they come. And we have to just be on guard for whatever subtle one comes up or apparent one comes up. So I'm going to just give a kind of very general overview of how the scholars recommend curing this stuff. And then we'll get into specific ones in the future conversations. So at a general level, if you and I are into something, if we can reduce it, stop completely, it's good. But gradual reduction is better than not stopping at all. So let's say that somebody like um, uh, smokes a lot of weed, right? Okay, smoking a lot of weed, it's very common now these days. It's legal in, in many states. In California, it's legal. People are smoking. Okay, well, you're like, okay, I want to stop smoking weed. Hopefully you should want to stop. It's not good. It's an intoxicant. It's considered haram by consensus of the scholars. I'm sure people, we are, you know, people already know that there's not really a need to discuss that, but so you want to stop. Well, you might not be able to stop clean. If you can stop clean, alhamdulillah. But what you do is you gradually reduce it. So you're doing this much, you reduce it to a little bit less. Okay. Less frequently, less frequently, whatever device you're using, you use less of it and less of it. Right. And you slowly reduce the amount such that the desire goes away. And you replace it with something less evil. Okay, so you might go from weed to like hookah. And then you, because you just like the act of smoking. And then you leave the hookah and you go to, you know, chewing some gum or something like that. And then you eventually leave it completely, right? The, the, the entire idea of the, the smoking. So those are, those are ways. Gradual reduction works for obvious desires. But leaving at the completely is better. That's better. But it's not easy always to do that. So gradual reduction is a method that we have and that we're able to follow. Now, there are a couple of remedies for us to keep in mind. They're what are called over-the-counter remedies, and then they're called specific remedies. Okay, so over-the-counter, these are like, you know, basic remedies that scholars have given us that, okay, this will work in general to curb all of your desires. And then there's specific prescriptions you and I need to be given for individual things that we're going through, and a very qualified uh, spiritual guide can help us with those things. So over-the-counter, five things are needed. You can nail these five things. If we can nail these five things, we'll be, inshallah, in a very good place. And may Allah assist us. First is you and I have to have the determination and the intention to work on ourselves. We have to say, I, I want to work on myself. I'm not just going to be a person who's complacent. I'm going to improve. I'm going to work on myself. That's the first. The second is we add in regular doses of being hungry and fasting. So fasting curbs desires. It, it diminishes desires. We all know this. And Ramadan is coming up. May Allah allow us to reach Ramadan and get us, give us the full barakah, fi khair wa lutf al-afiyah of Ramadan. 
but Ramadan helps to eliminate these desires. So what you do is in your daily regimen, have some portion, even if you don't fast for the whole day, where you just don't eat all the time. You want to have hunger because when hunger is there for portions of time, hunger facilitates the suppression of desire because a full, when you give yourself everything it is that your nafs wants, I want food now. I want this now. I want French fries now. I want ice cream now. Just get it. As soon as you get it, instant gratification, the nafs gets built stronger and stronger and stronger. So you and I have to curb that. So the first is determination and intention. Second is some regular amounts of hunger and fasting. Third is consistent amounts of worship and thicker. So we have, if, if you and I are trying to work on ourselves, we got to get in a worship regimen, a worship routine, not just like, the, um, this is in addition to the basics. Alhamdulillah, the basics are important. This is five prayers and beyond. So you add in extra prayers, right? You add in Nawafil prayers. You add in the Hajjad prayer. You add in extra adhkar that somebody would do. The, the three things I would recommend adding when somebody uh, uh, has, has, is doing their fart in order to help curb this. First is the regular, what are called sunnah mu'akkada. They emphasize sunnah after each prayer or before each prayer, of which in the Hanafi school, at least, is two before Fajr. Uh, two after Dhuhr and uh, uh, two after Maghrib and two after Isha, right? So those would be good prayers for us to make sure we do. Second thing then is to do the Sunnah Dik Adkar, Sunnah Dikr of the morning and the evening, right? You can um, find this Dikr in, in, in compilations. There's one called al wir the Latif that I would recommend, W-I-R-D, uh, al Latif. That is a compilation of the Sunnah Dua's that Prophet would do every morning and every evening. Try to do that at least once a day in the morning time. And, and in addition to that, Surah Yasin would be good to read every day based on uh, various hadith where the Prophet encouraged us to do that, especially in the morning time. And then the third thing is to add in the Hajjad prayer when possible. So the Hajjad prayer is a prayer that is a special connection. It brings a special prayer between you and your Lord. This is prayed at any time from after Isha, right? And b before Fajr. So ideally, somebody gets up 20 minutes before Fajr and just prays two rakat the Hajjud and asks Allah to help them in whatever situations they're facing. This is known as the hour of, of where Allah's call, Allah's, Allah's uh, uh, asking. There's a hadith, Qudsi, that indicates Allah comes down in no anthropomorphic way. He comes down at that time and asks, is anybody asking that I may grant them? Is anybody asking forgiveness that I may forgive them? Does anybody have a need that I may fulfill? This is the time to be close with your Lord. So determination and intention, hunger and fasting, worship and dhikr, and uh, regular. Then the fourth is turning to Allah in complete sincerity and begging him for help, begging him for help. If you and I want to work on ourselves, we can't just like take this stuff, uh, you know, in a relaxed way. We got to ask. We got to ask with sincerity and beg Allah. Ya Allah, help me. The scholars recommend doing it in a way that you were as though you were drowning, like you were so in need of help. Not like, Ya Allah, help me. Like, ya Allah help like really from the bottom of your heart begging him and inshallah allah will answer and the fifth is spending time alone this is an important ingredient we can't always have our devices with us this means virtually as well we can't always be with people but right now most of us are alone anyways in quarantine or in you know covid situation we have to have some moments it's just us and solitude just solitude thinking about what's going on in life giving ourselves time to process our thoughts spending time alone with our lord these are the five, intention and determination, hunger and fasting, worship with and thicker, um, turning to Allah and, and begging him for help and spending time alone. You'll see that somebody who's gotten the basics already down and then starts doing this stuff, you will start to go through spiritual transformation. This is tried and tested. This is a science. This is not just some made up thing. Tried and tested science by, of course, the Prophet and the Sahaba to begin with, and then all of the greats who came after them that have continued it. So this works, but we have to put in the effort. This is the medicine. You and I need medicine. We have sicknesses. We now have the medicine. What do we do in order to curb our desires? Let's know what they are. Let's figure out the subtle ones and the apparent ones. And then let's know that when we embark on a path to work on ourselves, Allah will facilitate it for us. Allah, Allah rewards the intention. The intention of the believer as it comes in a hadith is better than the action. So make the intention now, whenever you're, whatever you, you're, whenever you are able to, when you're watching this or afterwards or some other period of time make the intention you want to work on yourself you want to work on your desires you want to work on curbing these desires and you want to work on getting closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah allah will facilitate that and may he make this immensely easy for you and immensely easy for all of us um, and facilitate all khair and all goodness um, we see some questions in this live chat so if anybody has questions please post them and we will
and we will answer them inshallah. So somebody posted here, I'm conflicted. My ADHD is something that is making me shift my focus and struggle with khushu. Please talk about people who suffer from these mental struggles every day. So this is regarding focus in prayer and concentration from my understanding and um, your struggles are, are limiting you with that. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you for sharing and thank you for asking the question. Um, the first thing to note here, um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, is that uh, Allah only tasks you with as much as you can bear. So Allah says in the Quran, أَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِشْرِطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ النَّفْسًا إِلَّا وَسَعَهَا That He only burdens a soul with, with, with as much as it can bear. So Allah will not burden you with a difficulty or with a limitation or with a struggle more than you can bear. If you can bear it, Allah knows though what you can bear. This is in keep in mind. You and I don't know. Allah, Allah believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. Right? So Allah says, okay, you can do this. I'm going to put you to the test, but I believe you can do it. You're, and you and I are like, ah, I can't do this. Right? But Allah knows we can do this. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. And if you're struggling with something, it's a test from Allah. And inshallah, Allah will relieve you from it. And may Allah give you complete shifa and cure from these difficulties. Just know though that Allah is testing you and that he believes that you can improve and get better and work on yourself through that test and that difficulty. Second thing to keep in mind then is don't beat yourself up over when you don't have khushu, when you're not able to focus because of the situation that you are in. It's okay because Allah is testing you in that situation and he knows you're going to have weaknesses, but the desire for you to want to improve is already beautiful. So that's the third thing is take basic steps. For khushu in the prayer, it's recommended in the beginning to recite. Before you start the prayer, recite Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas, Surah Al-Nas, to repel the shaitan. Then, before you engage in your farth prayer, engage in at least uh, some sunnah raka, right? Some sunnah rakahs where you try to get focused. The third thing is to make sure that the area you are praying in or that you are trying to do dhikr in or whatever it is, is clear. It's not full of a bunch of stuff and because you need focus and concentration. And then try to make sure that the noise is fairly limited. And then just try to have focus. Okay, I'm going to make it a focus. I'm going to make it a goal to be focused in one rakah or half of one rakah or a quarter of a rakah or in two rakah, whatever you're at. You don't, you, it's okay if you don't achieve full khushu in four rakah. I mean, that would be such a miracle if we had that. May Allah give that to us. But just start with something basic. It's okay if at Fajr time you're tired and you're not able to focus necessarily. You and I know we have those things to work on. But begin with these solutions and inshallah, it will help. Um, so, so try that out and, and let's, let's inshallah see how it goes. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to type them into this chat. Any questions related to this conversation about desires or something else that's relevant, please feel free to type it in. We'll wait just another 30 seconds, um, or so. And, uh, if not, then we will go ahead and end with a dua. Bismillah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll see if anything comes up. And if not, then uh, I'll just go ahead and end. And um, if anything comes up, please type it in. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum salam. Ya Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntum min al-dhalimin. Ya Allah, ya Rahman, ya Rahim, ya Kareem, ya Hanan, wa Manan, ya Zajjalali wa Ikram. Ya Fatah, ya Allah, please open up the doors of your mercy for us. Ya Allah, ya Rahman, please pour your mercy upon us. Ya Allah, please facilitate goodness for us and our loved ones and all the people it is that are watching and that intended to watch and that intend to work on themselves in our Muslim community and in anywhere in this world, Ya Allah, inwardly and outwardly. Assist them, Ya Allah, with your special assistance. Please help us with all of our problems and challenges. Please remove the anxieties and difficulties and stresses and problems and challenges and illnesses, whether those are mental or physical or spiritual or psychological that we have, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, you are a companion and, and our sister and, 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 and our, our, our source of assistance and you are the one who helps us. Please help us, Ya Allah. Please help us, Ya Allah. You are the one who assists. Please help us with all of our problems. Please cure us of all of our difficulties and our challenges and please give us the ability to get close to you and please allow us to control our desires and to live a life that is pleasing to you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammadin wa alayhi wa sallam. Salim alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum inshallah. We'll see you next week. Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma Salli Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi So, we are talking about deceptive desires. So we're just going to continue this discussion, uh, inshallah. And today we're going to be just reviewing this framework that we've set up for deceptive desires and talk a little bit more about what the desires are that the human being has. And then from there, inshallah, we are going to go over 
um, a specific desire in each class. So what we've been doing is on Wednesday nights, inshallah, we're doing a class um, once a uh, once a week, 7 p.m., just for about 20 or 30 minutes or so. We're going to be covering different desires that you and I have. So today's topic will be focusing on this kind of framework of desire, and then we'll be talking specifically about the desire for food and what impact that has um, on our uh, on ourselves and on our spirituality. Cool. All right. Bismillah. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, as we've been chatting about, you know, we live in a world where everybody is really obeying their desires. And God says in, in the Quran that you and I can be slaves to him or we can be slaves to our desires. We can take our desires as our Lord. We don't want to be that type of person. That's not the type of life that we want to live where something material is controlling us or some carnal lust is controlling us. No, we want God to control us. We want to submit to God. That's really the type of uh, approach that we want to have to our life. So Allah says in the Quran that whoever restrains their desire is going to be able to uh, enter paradise. So that is one of the ways to enter paradise is if somebody is able to restrain their uh, their desire and they're able to restrain and control themselves. So it's like right when you're about to do something haram, something that you shouldn't do, Right when you're about to look at someone you shouldn't look at, right when you're about to eat something you shouldn't eat, right when you're about to drink something you shouldn't drink, you control yourself. And that is at the essence of this religion, is it's all about self-control. It's all about self-discipline. It's all about trying to find ways in order to calm your nafs down, which is the ego that you and I have, and then find ways to grow our spirit. The, there is a constant war inside of us between what's called our nafs, which is our lower self, and our spirit, which is the spiritual self. It is trying to help us ascend. The spirit is trying to help you ascend to higher places. The nafs is trying to pull you down to lower places. It's your job, it's your task rather, it's your goal to control the lower part and to tame the nafs and then to focus your energies on cultivating the spirit. That's what spirituality is about. Spirituality is the idea of achieving a station achieving a nearness to God by cultivating your spirit. Let's talk a little bit about how to do that. And let's talk a little bit about how desires play into this. So first of all, we all have desires. Desires are not a bad thing as we've been chatting about. Um, it's, it's normal to have like a sexual desire. You and I are going to be attracted to people. That's normal. We are going to have a desire to eat. If we didn't, we would starve. We're going to want to eat. We're going to want to eat good things. It's all normal things. We're going to want to have a desire to like earn some money so we can have a home. We're going to want to have a desire to have clean clothes. All those things are there. It's when those desires get out of control that problems start happening. So it's when you and I start to obey our sexual desire, let's say, to the point that we start, you know, doing things we shouldn't be doing. We start, you know, scrolling on Tinder and swiping all the time and trying to just like uh, release that desire. Or we start to uh, engage in watching pornography, right? Or somebody is channeling that desire in by having illicit relationships or someone starts to have an affair or somebody starts to have... Um, any other type of relationship that we know we know we shouldn't be in. That's when that desire becomes problematic. But the human being who controls that desire is going to be rewarded significantly, right? And that's in this life and the next. Nobody likes somebody who can't control themselves. And you see how ruined human beings are who can't control themselves. Even the last president of the United States that we've mentioned before, I mean, literally all throughout his life, no ability to control himself, like none, right? And then to the point where... Um, uh, you know, when he was younger, he was engaged in a variety of different affairs, sexual assault, rape cases against him. And then it became about the desire for money. And he got that and then the desire for fame. And he got that and then for followers. And then from there, it keeps going. Now you want power. Okay, I want to be the president. Now I'm not going to let go of the power. I'm going to stage a coup. These are all because the inner self is not tamed. When the inner self becomes tamed, then inshallah, you and I are able to achieve levels of success because you walk around and you're like, dude, I'm not going to submit to that thing you're submitting to. It's, it, it gives you a, almost a type of freedom. It's a really beautiful thing that when you are not a slave to a desire, you have freedom. When you are slaves to a desire, you do not have freedom. So those are the obvious desires. Then we've mentioned um, subtle desires. And what are subtle desires? These are desires that are, as you get closer and closer to God, as you get closer and closer in spirituality, your, these subtle things start to pop up and you have to be on guard for these as well. These are desires like wanting people to notice you. Oh, I'm worshiping. Someone watching me. Oh, I am reading extra prayers. Is someone going to notice? Oh, I'm going to post this, this, this comment. Or I'm going to post this video. 
is somebody going to take notice um, of what I'm doing, right? It's, it's this idea of validation from other human beings for your religious actions. It's called ostentation, or in the Hadith where the Prophet said, it's called the riyat in Arabic. The word is a riyat. It's called this kind of bragging ostentation, or it's just like being full of yourself. Oh, you think you're all that, right? And all of us have met people. We've all met people, um, uh, unfortunately, and we might have been there ourselves, where uh, it's like this type of judgment because somebody says they're more religious than you, and so they make you feel like, I know what I'm doing, and you don't know anything. And thus, as a result of that, I'm better than you. Well, in the Quran, the one who says I'm better than you is Satan. Shaitan says, uh, uh, like, I am better than Adam. I'm better than Adam, alayhi salam, because, and he has faulty reasoning, of course. He thinks because he's created from fire and Adam's created from clay, alayhi salam, that, that that's why he's better. But that's what religious people can also become arrogant. And that is a very, very big problem because that's called a subtle desire. It's you using your religion to become arrogant. And when that arrogance starts to enter into yourself, that desire becomes difficult to control because now you're impressed with yourself. And then you'll see people start to fall. This happens all the time. You know, really, really famous people who gain fame through religion. We see this a lot. I was reading about like different preachers and these mega churches and whatnot that, um, you know, for whatever reason, these people gain a lot of fame. Uh, and then they, they think that they're all that. And then they get caught up in affairs. They get caught up in scandals, caught up in all these other things because their desires were never controlled. They just shifted the desire from a basic desire that you and I might have to a more um, uh, unique, subtle desire that somebody who's on a specific path might start to have. So that is something to be on guard for. Now, the goal is not to eliminate desire. Again, we need that. We need our desire in order to live, in order to function. The goal is to channel our desire in the right direction. That's our goal. So what does that mean? It means that th what is the right direction? There is a way for you and me to take our desires and to rather than fall for material things, it's to have spiritual desires, high aspirations. So we want to channel these desires to three areas, to loving God, first and foremost. We want to have love of knowledge, number two, love of knowledge and wisdom. And number three, we want to actually enjoy worship. These are, again, high aspirations. Like you're probably thinking, like, how am I supposed to get here? I'm the same way. I'm like, this is really hard. This is just the so what, this is what the scholars mention. This is what's kind of mentioned is the higher stations. And so we know the goal. Yeah, that's gold medal. That's the first place. Okay, now how am I going to get there? It's slow and steady process to get there. But if you make the intention, the door opens. That one of the great saints of our religion said that with the one intention, if you make it sincerely, 70 doors, 70 doors of tofit, meaning divine assistance and blessings and guidance open for you if you make that sincere intention. So right now, one thing all of us should do, make an intention, especially because we're in a blessed month of Rajab and because Ramadan is right around the corner. We got two months uh, before, uh, yeah, right about two months or so. Make an intention that I want to change this. Year. This is the year I want to change. We all know in, the, in life when we've had major changes and the intention is the first thing that comes when you want, you and, you and I want to change. So have that high aspiration, that high himma, it's called, um, the high goal, right? And then start working towards the goal. So there's a general method for controlling desires, and then there's specific methods for each desire. The general method is that you and I have to bring every part of us into, um, you and I have to bring, rather than every part of us, we have to bring certain faculties that are inside of us into an equilibrium. What does that mean? That means that like, let's say, this works for all character traits, by the way. Let's say somebody's like super cheap. Like someone's like super cheap. They just, they're known as being, you know, stingy. For them, in order for them to become moderate in their spending, they need to go to the extreme of generosity. This is what the scholars prescribe. Go to the extreme of generosity. Always be the one to pay. Always be the one to donate. Always be the one to give up front, right? And then they will go from this, this place and they, they, they force themselves to go here. They'll end up in the middle. That's called equilibrium. So in Ramadan, we have a whole month of fasting, not because... God wants us to be hungry all of the time. Like we don't have to fast 12 months out of the year, but it's because 11 months out of the year, most of us are in this category. We're always eating. We're always engaged in desires. We're always caught up in something or another. He says, yo, for one month, stop all that stuff. At least during the daytime, stop all that stuff. And then you will be calibrated because you, you would think logically God would say six months you do this, six months you do this. But God says in Ramadan that like the blessings are multiplied by 10, 
50, 100 times, 1,000 times, depending on God's generosity, right? And his generosity is limitless. One of his names is Al-Karim, the generous. That in Ramadan, that generosity is so amplified that whatever we do, it's one month, but God helps us become, bring up, brings us into an equilibrium, right? In that one month. And then we leave Ramadan emerging, emerging from the month of Ramadan, hopefully like, okay, I'm feeling better, I'm feeling more balanced. And then we got to start that kind of struggle again. So desires have to be conquered, but it's a slow process, right? And by the way, as you, as anybody has questions, whether you're, um, just post them in, in, the, in the comments and inshallah we will, or in the chat or whatever it is, and we'll, we'll try to get to them um, at the end, inshallah. Uh, would love for this to be a discussion as well. So that is the, the goal from the equilibrium perspective. Now the general kind of over the counter, you know, remedy for this is first you have to learn Knowledge is a medicine and knowledge is a light. So first, we have to learn. Second, you have to put in the struggle. Okay. I got to put in the work. I'm mean, you're just like when you want to go to, you know, want to work out, you got to like lift, you got to put in the hard work, you got to run, you got to train. Same thing with spirituality. In order to grow, in order to gain and control desires, you got to put in the work. So you put in the work, right? You gain, learn the knowledge, you put in the work. But the most important thing is you beg a lot to help you. Because you and I are not about to do this alone. I mean, this world is full of craziness. There's too much going on. It's not easy. We can't do this by ourselves. So we ask Allah, Ya Allah, I'm really struggling with this thing. Like, I cannot for the life of me control myself in this, in this situation or that situation. If somebody's struggling with, you know, smoking or drinking or partying or in illicit relationships or with, you know, on another side, like someone is trying to do good, good deeds, but is struggling with people noticing them and wanting to be noticed and wanting to be praised. You just turn it to Allah, you turn the affair over to him and you say, Ya Allah, I'm trying my best, but I need you to help me. Because Allah says in the Quran, those who strive in our ways, surely we shall guide them. You and I just have to try. Remember that this religion is not about getting an A plus. It's not. Sometimes we think that we got to be perfect. You weren't, we weren't created to be perfect. Allah says in the Quran, Billah that we created mankind weak. We, he's created us weak. We are weak. We, are, we, we gotta sleep. We gotta eat. We gotta use the restroom. We're weak people. We, we, we get tired. We, 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 we can't lift like an, an, an insane amount of things at the same right at one time. There's, we're weak in so many ways. We're weak with our knowledge. We're weak with our abilities. But in our weakness is our strength. Because when you show weakness before Allah, Allah assists you with His strength. And then He gives you the ability to succeed in ways you never knew. But when you rely on yourself, well, we're weak, so how can you rely on something weak when you have Allah, who is the al-qawiyul mateen, who is the strong and the mighty one, right? He can assist you. So when you and I are focused on our desires, or not focused on our desires, focused on trying to control our desires, remember, it's about not, this is the general kind of over-the-counter remedy that's given by the scholars, by the Prophet Learn the knowledge, it's the light. Put it into practice, spiritual struggle, and then rely on Allah. Beg Allah, Ya Allah, help me. Whatever it is you can do, and never let anybody I don't care who they are. Don't let anybody ever close the door on you. If some religious person or a family member or even a parent has closed the door and says, you're never going to change. You're never going to be fixed. You're never going to do this. You've just done too much bad. Just ignore them and remember your relationship with Allah is unique. Allah forgives whoever he wants. He forgives whoever he wants. There's so many stories in the Hadith that one time there was a prostitute, a prostitute, and she was... Um, uh, she, she went, she was super thirsty. And so there was a well, and, you know, back in the days they had wells. Alhamdulillah, now we have like access to running water. Uh, and may Allah give water to all those people in the world who don't have access to clean water. So she went down to the well, she was super thirsty. And she, she, she used, um, some way to, 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 to get water. So there was no bucket. So she just kind of used her hands. Right. And then she came back up and she saw there was a dog who was super thirsty, just like her. So she's like, yo, this dog is thirsty. I would, I needed water. I should figure out a way to get this dog some water. So she takes her shoe and she goes back into the well and she brings water uh, in the shoe and gives it to the dog and the dog quenches his thirst. And Allah forgave, the Prophet said in the Hadith, Allah forgave her for that action. He forgave all the sins that she did again. And it's a prostitute, right, who's committed, you know, uh, uh, promiscuous sexual actions we shouldn't be doing. Um, and But she had a certain softness in her heart which led her to do this good deed and Allah forgave her for that. So you and I, like Allah's mercy is limitless. It's not an excuse for us to do whatever we want and be like, yeah, yeah God will forgive you. That's another extreme. But what it is, is it's a way for us to remember that our Lord is forgiving 
and don't let someone constrict Islam into this like narrow view of you've got to do one, two, and three, and then you get into heaven. And if you do A, B, and C, you're going to hell, and other and that's it. And their interpretation of religion is the only interpretation. No, religion is vast. There's room for everybody. There's room for us in our mistakes, and there's room for us always to turn back to Allah. So begin that process now, inshallah. So that's the overall method. So let's talk specifically about this desire now for food. Um, and why am I talking about the desire for food? Well, we live in a time when um, the country that, especially you know, in the West, uh, food is like everywhere, right? So we have buffets. You have immediate, can, you know, feed, have apps that you can just order food on. There's always snacks in our pantries. We're just always eating. Now, what does food have to do with desire? It's interesting. So food is actually known as the mother desire. It's literally the chief desire. And I didn't know this at all until I started reading about it, how important controlling the stomach is to controlling the rest of your body. So think about it like this. You and I have a muscle, an internal spiritual muscle called discipline. That spiritual muscle is primarily governed by what we eat and how much we eat. So if we eat a lot, then it's going to be covered in a certain way. If we don't eat a lot, then, uh, or if we eat a lot and if we eat to excess, then that muscle won't grow. If we reduce our food intake and we fast and we control ourselves, then that muscle begins to um, build itself, the muscle of discipline. So food is this kind of mother desire that we know how to, where we have to control it, which is why Ramadan is so important and why the Prophet some fasted in Ramadan and many times outside of the month of Ramadan. I mean, it was so important because he taught us that uh, patience is half of faith in the hadith. And he said, fasting is half of patience. So if you have faith, patience is one half, fasting is one half of that. So you can say fasting is like a fourth of faith, you know, in this hadith. And then we know the five pillars of Islam. Fasting is one of the five pillars, right? So we know how important it is. So food control is important, but this is not just food control with regards to fasting from, uh, from, from pre-dawn until sunset, like in Ramadan. That's not what we're talking about only. We're talking about food control in all the situations, right? So, when you and I have a full stomach, this is what the scholars mentioned. When you and I have a full stomach, we start to get more energy and we start to have the desire to do more things. Now, it sounds kind of weird because most of us are always full, right? But think about the times when you've been hungry and the weakness that you feel and the like overall lack of desire to sin that you feel, right? Ain't nobody about to be hungry sitting there like hungry and thirsty and then going to be like, oh, let me, you know, swipe right here and let me do this. Like, that's not going to happen, right? Or like, oh, let me go and, you know, smoke some weed because I'm really hungry. Like, you know, that's just going to make you more hungry and give you the munchies. So that's not going to work, right? So usually when you're hungry, there's a lot of humility that forms. And remember, this is a spiritual alchemy. So alchemy is the process of transforming lead into gold. It used to be done back in the day by like proper alchemists. Now, spiritual alchemy is an internal process of transforming yourself, transforming yourself in, a, in an amazing way. From, from the weak state that we're in right now to a more developed state. Food, controlling what we eat is one of the best ways to do that, right? Because this internal humility starts to, to form and the desires are then tamed in other ways. So the food is the chief desire. And then the next desire that follows that, which we'll be talking about later, inshallah, probably the next week, is sexual desire. So immediately, right? The desire that governs our oh, not ability to lower our gaze or oh, watching things we shouldn't be watching or watching pornography, whether it's clear pornography or soft pornography or watching um, or just, you know, engaging in illicit sexual relations. We're living in a culture where like marriage is not really a priority anymore. Everybody's just hooking up with each other. It's people are having sex at younger and younger ages. And like, we got to talk about this stuff. I mean, these are things that are happening. So we shouldn't shy away from having the discussions of what's important of what's actually happening and what's relevant in our society. Because we know we struggle and we know we got to control these things. Um, so food is this mother desire, though, that's con that needs to be controlled. What does uh, overeating do? It brings a level of, so this is like from a scientific and a spiritual perspective. It's mentioned that it's, it makes somebody lazy. It clogs the mind. It impairs thinking. And then it makes your desire stronger in, 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 uh, uh, from, from, a, from a spiritual perspective. So you get more desire to want to do more things. So discipline is this muscle that's built and hunger is the medicine that allows you to build this muscle of discipline. Secret. If somebody has discipline, you're going to be very successful in your life, inshallah. It just no matter, doesn't matter what you're doing. Human beings who are disciplined, who have routines, who are able to control themselves, who are able to control their impulses, there's a different level of success that they're able to achieve. I'm talking about in this life, not even getting to the next life. And Allah says in the next life that 
those who are able to control their desires, inshallah, will, will achieve a state of Jannah, right? So that's where discipline becomes so critical and so important. And the desire to control our food intake um, is so linked to that, right? So what is this medicine of hunger and controlling the food? So when you and I lose our discipline, when we lose our, our when we start overeating, we start to lose our discipline. And then we start to fall into all these other sorts of things. Let's talk a little bit about what the benefits are. There's a hadith where the Prophet said that the devil courses through the blood in the children of Adam. Um, and you and I should limit the devil coursing through our blood, like kind of running through our blood with hunger and thirst. And, and I'm paraphrasing the hadith, the Prophet indicated that type of meaning. And he also said in the hadith, hadith is a statement of the Prophet that we use as kind of an authentic religious teaching to help guide us. Where the Prophet said that the son of Adam fills no container worse than their belly. And a few small mouthfuls of food should suffice them. But if he or she can't stick to that, then they should have one third for food, one third of their stomach for food, one third for water, and one third for, for, for breath. So room to just breathe and do thicker and just kind of, you know, be able to exhale and inhale. In our society, it's like three thirds for food, one third for water, one third for juice, one third for something else, like hey, until you have two or three stomachs, right? So remember, the devil is coursing through your blood. Prophet Islam said, this is some spiritual knowledge he's teaching us. You limit the devil with hunger and thirst. You say, no, I'm not going to let you run me. I'm not going to let you control me. I'm going to just cut you off. I'm not going to let you be inside of me all the time. I'm going to limit you with just restraining my food intake. It doesn't mean you go to extremes and you're anorexic or that you, you know, that's a different type of topic. It doesn't mean you go to an extreme and you stop eating. No, but you limit, you stop a couple bites short. You limit that. So what are some of the benefits of hunger that the scholars mentioned? These are mentioned by some of the greatest scholars in the history of our religion. Spiritual masters is what they're called. It says the benefits of hunger among them are first, that hunger purifies the heart and it illuminates the soul. Second is hunger sharpens your insight, right? And so this desire, the ability to control desires comes when your intellect is working. You and I all know the opposite of this. So we said hunger purifies the heart and sharpens your mind. The opposite of this is when you are not, uh, when you're overeating, we all know the word food coma. We've all gotten into food coma before most likely. And when we just overeat, just like, oh, I'm so full. And then you just want to like do all these other things, right? Because the, the, the fullness now leads to a, a route for, as we indicated, as the Hadith indicated, for shaitan to have more control over us. The second thing is it does is it brings a softness and a purity to the heart and it allows the heart to be more impacted, more impacted, right? So you want your heart to be soft, right? Have you ever met people who like, they cry easily? like something just small that they see or that they watch and they start crying and they start weeping. That's an amazing thing. We should not take light of that. That crying and soft, easily coming to tears means the heart is soft. The Prophet وسلم, our messenger, our master, our leader, وسلم, may Allah bless him, preserve him, increase him, send salutations upon him, that he had a very soft heart. He would regularly be weeping, regularly be crying. There is no idea of like men not crying. No, men should cry. Women should cry. Crying is very, very important. Very important. But the softness that an individual has, and, and sometimes we feel bad about it. Like, oh my God, every little thing makes me cry. That's not a, that's not a bad thing. No, it's a, it means your heart is soft. And when the heart is soft, it's impacted more seriously. So you want your heart to be able to get impacted. That's what you want, right? So when somebody gives you a reminder or when you hear something, or when you are just reflecting or when you're praying or when you're just about to do something bad, the softness kicks in and it's like, no, you're not going to do that because softness and purity are linked. You want your heart to be pure. That's one of the goals of this life. Allah says in the Quran, Qad man It's successful is the one who purifies themselves and destroyed is the one who isn't. Purifying yourself is about controlling your desires and beginning this journey of cleaning the inner self. That is what we are trying to accomplish, inshallah. And uh, uh, food is a very, very important aspect um, of that. So let's, let's you know, inshallah, we'll, we're, we're going to try to just kind of wrap this up and summarize a little bit. And again, if anybody has any questions, please post them in the comments. I don't think I see anything now. Let me see. Yeah, I don't think I see any questions. Cool. Um, so... 
let's let's talk a little bit about the the uh, different. Community. Yes, I'll mention that in a second, inshallah. So let's talk a little bit about what some of this, uh, how do we practically implement some of this? So we first just have to decrease when it comes to the desire for food, right? When we know, number one, that it's linked to everything else that we're doing. And number two, we know that it is linked to um, increasing our other desires. What we have to do is decrease, number one, just the amount that we, that we eat, just little by little, just even one bite can go a long way, just a little bit. And number two, we decrease how often we're eating. So let's say that like we eat five times a day, a bunch of snacks. We just slowly reduce it to like four times a day. And then you get to a healthy medium of three times a day, right? And let's say you're eating like this big of a portion size. You just reduce it slightly just by a couple bites and then a little bit more. Don't just throw out a whole meal or something like that. No, 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 just slightly, right? And then, and then um, from there, you actually decrease the quality, the like taste of the food. So you don't always give your nuts. The nuts is the lower self and it thrives off of, um, the nuts thrives off of um, fulfilling its desires. It loves delicious things. I want a cake, I want cookies, I want brownies, I want this, I want chips, I want fries. You know, my nuts loves fries, for example, right? So you and I have to give it, okay? If it does, if it listens, you give it good things, but you have to treat the nuts like an animal. That, okay, if it doesn't give, behave, you have to have, and you're not going to get this thing that you wanted today. That's going to start to result in spiritual cultivation. That is going to result in a successful cultivation of purity inside of you and a successful taming of the desires. So then there's then that's the tips for reducing the desire. And then there's channeling the desire in the right direction. How do we do that? All these desires are meant to be, God created them in us, right? So it's not a bad thing that we obviously we want to eat, we want to do all these things. The first thing is, okay, we try to eat cleanly, number one. And number and number two, by clean here, I mean eat halal as well. So if we aren't eating halal food, okay, we slowly work our way towards that. We try to aspire. Okay, I'm going to try to eat halal meat. I'm going to try to eat some fish. Even if I'm not able to do it all the time, I'm try to eat halal meat because there's a spiritual secret and a spiritual benefit in halal meat that, that only the person who eats it um, will be able to feel that benefit. And it comes in a narration that, person who eats halal for 40 days is able to achieve a state of light inside. So it's okay if we're not doing it, but we just slowly work on that, right? And a more kind of haram that we limit, um, not in like a way that we are so negative on ourselves that we feel like we want to get despair or quit, but the more that we limit and the more that we start to add good things, the more we're going to be able to progress spiritually, the more we're going to be able to tame these things. The second aspect is for us to eat cleanly eat clean and pure food. These days, a lot of the food is manufactured. A lot of it has MSGs. A lot of it has, uh, it's been, you know, food has been raised in very, very problematic ways. And so we just have to also try to eat in a clean way. And the more you and I can eat in a clean way, the more pure we are going to be able to become because what you are, what you eat. We've heard that saying, right? So if you're eating some like animal that has had all this anxiety and all these other types of things, that have manifested because of the way some corporate farm is treating that animal, it will manifest inside of you. No doubt it will. And we ask Allah protect us, but that type of stuff is real. So eating halal, ideally, then eating cleanly. And then the third thing is just kind of stopping before we're full. Just stop a couple bites short. This will start to impact our other desires in the right way. Now, some of us might be thinking like, dude, talking about food over here, I am, you know, um, uh, I am like struggling with all these big things and you're talking about food, you know, I'm struggling with drinking and I'm struggling with smoking and I'm struggling with partying and so all this is a framework. Keep that in mind. So anything, this will work for any desire, whatever you and I are following or struggling with, we just simply reduce that. So we have three methods, you decrease the amount, you decrease how often you do it, the cadence, the frequency, and you decrease the overall, like, you could say deliciousness of it when for the food instance, or you could say the, uh, what's the right word? The overall pleasure it gives you. Does that make sense? So if like somebody is watching something they shouldn't be watching, they should reduce the amount, they should reduce the quality of that, and they should reduce how often they're doing it. These types of things are going to give us the inner cultivation that we need, and it's going to help us tame our desires in the right way. And so if we do that, inshallah, we will start to, Feel. We'll start to feel closer to God. We'll start to feel this type of spirituality manifesting inside. And we live in a world where 
There's too much focus on the outward and not enough focus on the inward. Remember this, Islam is an inward path. The outer rules are like, if I take this water bottle, the outer rules are just the like shell and the casing of the water bottle. You've got to follow the outer rules. We know that we struggle with them, but we got to follow them. But the goal is to get to what's inside, which in this case, you know, until I'm thirsty, this, this case is water, right? You want to get what's inside. The inside of it is the spirituality. And so there's so many people that are focused on you, this and that, this, this, they just make this black and white difficult thing that constricts you because they have never tasted the sweetness of what's inside. You and I have to have the outer framework and then be able to arrive at what's inside. If we do that, Allah, inshallah, will not let us down. He will give us success because he says that if you strive in his way, he will guide you. And you, there's a hadith which indicates if you come to him, uh, hand span, he comes to you in arm span. If you come to him walking, he comes to you running. You and I just have to take the first step. So let's make that intention right now, inshallah, today that we're going to take that step. We are going to work on taming our desires, on channeling our desires in the right direction, on trying to control ourselves, on not being like every single other person in this world um, uh, who, broadly speaking, is just caught up and is a slave for our desires. Let's be slaves of God and not slaves of anybody else and certainly not slaves of our own nafus, of our own lower selves and of our egos. Let's try to submit to him. And he will help us, inshallah, not only in this life, and inshallah, he will help us in this life, but also in the next life. We pray that Allah give everybody tawfiq and success and taseer and easiness um, in this path. And now we'll go ahead and um, you know field any questions or comments um, that are posted. So I'm seeing here, Bismillah, somebody asks, uh, Assalamu alaikum, how often should one cry? Should one make oneself cry to soften the heart? I cry about, uh, okay, uh, how does one? Okay, got it. So uh, there's not like a prescribed amount that one should force themselves. I think it's when one, when you are feeling overpowered by emotions or by crying, that you should release that. You should not control it. It can actually result in internal emotional blockages when somebody doesn't release the emotions that they're feeling. I'm sure some of us have seen this movie, uh, Inside Out, a Pixar movie, which kind of uh, shows this in a very, very nicely um, crafted way, right? That what happens when you and I don't, allow ourselves to express our emotions. But the second thing is if we are able to, we should try to just, it's like the watering of the heart. Crying waters the spiritual heart. With the heart doesn't get water, it's not going to flourish spiritually. So you have to engage in moments where you just feel like humbled before God and just saying, I'm sorry for this, or I'm scared of this, or I love you for this. And so these types of things will in, in, inculcate a type of softness and the crying should come from that. So hopefully that's helpful. And then somebody says, how does one reduce the anxiety about the afterlife, um, e.g. death? So, good question. Um, I, I would say that it's not a bad thing to be worried about death. Like, that's not a bad thing at all. The believer should regularly remember death. Like, we're going to die. I'm going to go in a grave. I'm going to be, like, it's a very, very real thing. In today's society, they try to hide death from us. They try to just completely not talk about it. It's this like weird subject. And in, 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 in Muslim society, it's not supposed to be like that, right? Like, you know, there's certain times you shouldn't speak about death, like when somebody's eating and whatnot. But otherwise, it's something that like should be discussed and it should be thought of because it can immediately, I mean, I don't remember when I, when I really ch tried to like change in my life was when a couple people really close to me back in college, just they started dying. And I was like, dang, man, death can come at any moment. I better wake up, I better stop some of this stuff. Right. So um, that anxiety actually in that case helped, but it shouldn't be an overwhelming anxiety. What it should be, it should be balanced. So uh, the way to do that is to actually be, okay, like I'm looking, because when you die, that's when you can meet Allah. And Allah says that Allah loves the one who loves to meet him. Right. So Allah loves to meet the one who loves to meet him. And I'm paraphrasing here, but that will be the moment that you can kind of be released from the pains of this world. So it shouldn't be a negative thing. We should feel like death is going to be positive and positively beneficial for us. So hopefully that makes sense um, with this question about how does one reduce the anxiety about it. Uh, and the, the anxiety should not become overwhelming, should be balanced. And we should remember that it will be positive, hopefully, that the one who lives their life in a good way, we should pray for a good ending. And we should hope and pray that it will be a positive experience for us, uh, inshallah. So hopefully that helps. Let's see if there are any other questions. No questions. Yeah, cool. If anybody has questions, just please post them in the Q and A or um, in the chat. 
Okay, somebody asked a question here. How does one help someone who is having a crisis in faith? Okay, so this is a very good question. How do you help somebody who's having a crisis in faith? Um, Bismillah. First and foremost, do not overwhelm them and try to convince them of all the intellectual reasons to like come back to the religion. That's not the way to do it. You don't want to overwhelm any human being. What you do when somebody's having a crisis with their faith is first, you got to try to pray for them. Wow. Like sincerely, if you really care about them, sincere levels of prayer, ideally in the in the middle of the night at the Hajj time, if possible, the time right before Fajr, if possible. That That's the first thing, especially if it's a loved one or somebody you really care about, that's very important. Second is um, try to understand why they're having a crisis. Just talk to them. Ask questions. Don't give them a lecture. Ask questions. What's going on? What is it that's leading to this crisis? What is it that's leading to this issue? Right. So try to understand uh, a little bit more of the details. And then the third thing is give them, okay, you know, this is what helped me in this situation. This is what helped me in that situation. Don't, don't make it a, um, what's the right word? Don't make it about you, but also don't make it like such a bad thing that, oh my God, they're having this crisis and like, what are they going to do? They're going to leave Islam. Ultimately, guidance is in Allah's hands. You have to keep that in mind. It's where the dua helps. But if somebody is having a crisis in their faith, which is the question, first, pray for them. Second, um, uh, try and ask them a lot of questions. And third, give them examples of times that you or somebody else you know has struggled with something and how they overcame it. That will be the first step. And then remember, you put in a little bit of effort and Allah will take care of the rest. Don't, don't worry if uh, you know, they're, they're really, really, really struggling. Um, and if they are having a trauma, as somebody just asked if it's a trauma, a lot of us are traumatized with the spiritual upbringing that was problematic. And if that's the case, then try to point them to like beautiful examples of people who don't have that background. So many people came from a very, very strict black and white halal haram. This is it. This is the only way everything else is some innovation. Everything else is this. You can't do anything in your religion. You can't even live your life because you're going to go to hell type of approach. I see a lot of Muslims and they eventually leave like the major practices of the religion because it's just too constricting. And that's not Islam. Try to work, help them work through what the trauma is. You mentioned that you said, I told a loved one that life is a test. That works only when somebody has the spiritual framework for understanding what a test is. You can't tell somebody it's a test if they don't even understand why tests come, right? The first step is belief that tests are going to help them get closer to God. And that's a hard belief to cultivate. It's not easy. So I wouldn't start with that. I would kind of go at that um, when you feel like they're ready, but try to work through the trauma and have them seek like a proper spiritual counselor or spiritual guide in order to work through that crisis. So that was the question. Um, inshallah, that helps. Uh, and inshallah, they'll, 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 that situation will get better. Inshallah. Don't worry. Just pray and Allah will help, inshallah. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Let's see if anything popped up here. Mm. Um, somebody mentioned, sorry, it's just hard to find balance between being sincere and soft-hearted and strong world in today's society. Um, that is a really, really good point that somebody mentioned. Um, so it is, it is certainly difficult to find a balance between being sincere and soft-hearted. Thank you for mentioning that point. Uh, it's, it's important though, to not lose the beautiful aspects of our religion and the beautiful aspects of, of our tradition, because this society just limits us. Don't let this society limit you. Don't let the society that's been created by the white man to do the things that serve the white man and serve their corporate interests limit the way you and I operate. No. You and I should be sincere. You and I should be soft-hearted. You and I should follow the example of the Prophet Islam to the best of our ability in balanced ways that we can do it in this society, but not let the frameworks and the colonizing frameworks and the problematic frameworks and the subjugating frameworks and the subverting paradigm and all these types of things prevent us from the inner, inner beautiful traits that our religion has to offer. This is what Islam has to offer the world. We have character to offer. We have spiritual development to offer. We have personal development to offer. When a human being has all these things, that's really when they start to succeed. But that we have to kind of put in that effort first and foremost, and then uh, people will see that beauty and they will start to be guided, inshallah. So try to keep that uh, in mind. It's a very, very good point somebody brought up. If anybody has any more questions, please post them. We'll just wait for another minute and we'll end, inshallah. I'll just go ahead and close with a quick dua. And if any other question pops up, we'll cover it, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. So, Ya Allah, Ya Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, 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 Rabb
Ya Allah, we ask that you guide us. Ya Allah, we ask that you guide all of those people, Ya Allah, who are struggling with their deen, who are in difficulty, who are facing a crisis, who are facing a trauma, who are facing any problems. We ask that you allow us to curb our desires. We ask that you bless this month. Allahumma barik lana fi rajab wa sha'ban wa balighna Ramadan. Please put blessings in this month of Rajab and Sha'ban and allow us to reach Ramadan. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, allow us to get closer to you. Please don't allow us to be discouraged. Please don't allow us to have despair. Please don't allow us to have any worry, Ya Alameen, Ya Allah. Anybody who's struggling with any aspect of their life, any sins that we're struggling with, Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, forgive us, Ya Allah, and pardon us, Ya Allah, and cure us, Ya Allah, and remove this difficulty from us. Remove our challenges, remove our tribulations. Give us our sincerity and give us as much as much closeness to you as possible with ease, fi khayr, wa lutf afiyah and give us guidance on our ability to get close to you, coming directly from you, and allow us to strive in your way as much as possible. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumallah khair. So inshallah, we'll continue this every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Sorry, we're in a little bit late today. It started a little late today. I was having some technical difficulties. Inshallah, uh, Allah will help, uh, and we'll get that together next time. So we'll start again next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Uh, Jazakumallah khair. Please keep us in your prayers. Everybody have a great week. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. All right, so we are continuing in this conversation that we've been having uh, about desires, deceptive desires. And today's topic is we're going to focus on the desire for lust. So we, we've been touching upon this a little bit, and so we're going to dive a lot deeper uh, today, inshallah. So uh let's 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 dive straight into it um what we just dis- what we discussed last time was the kind of mother desire and so there's one mother desire that the human being has and a couple of things to keep in mind that the human being that's able to successfully control their desires in this life is the one who will be rewarded inshallah the most in the next life there's a direct correlation between how many of our appetites we follow how much of our nafs we follow and whether or not we are going to be successful in the next life. And so we really want to try to be uh, people who are controlling our desires regularly. So we spoke last time about food and how food is this kind of mother desire. Um, And now we're going to talk about how other desires stem from food. So we'll dive into lust today and sexual desire. So sexual desire is not necessarily a bad thing, even though many times it's made out to be. Um, In moderation and channeled in the right direction, it's a good thing. And so what we've been trying to do is talk about all of these desires at a high level and talk about when they are negative and when they are positive and how do we channel the desires in the overall uh, right direction. So the way to think about this, um, you and I have a certain type of desire because Allah has created it within us. Sexual desire has a couple of reasons, according to Imam al-Azali, that God created this desire in us. First is the obvious one of allowing the human race to continue, right? If the human being did not have this desire, then the desire for relations, uh, then obviously that would not result in the human race continuing because we would not have offspring and whatnot. Um, And the second reason is actually what Imam al-Hazali says and what many of the other scholars say is to allow you and I to know the delight of the afterlife. That one, that there are indications that the desire that one feels uh, in that experience is a very, 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 very small portion of the experience one is going to have in the afterlife and the type of euphoria one is going to experience in the afterlife. Now, this is, of course, when you're talking about channeling it in a permissible way, when you're talking about channeling this desire in a halal way. Now, let's talk a little bit about the condition of the society that we live in, right? So we live in a society right now that is filled with uh, overall promiscuity, following desires, not really like being in touch with ourselves in a deep way such that we try to control these desires or channel them in the right direction. So the job of the Muslim is to say, okay, how am I going to ward off the different aspects of the society that are negative? And how am I going to channel the desires that I have in the right direction uh, such that I can achieve success in this life and the next life? We also see in this society, just small examples, you have apps, like Tinder and other dating apps where people are literally just like scrolling through these apps in order to uh, find, you know, ways to release their sexual desire and find lust. You have, uh, find ways to release their lust. You have uh, phones and devices that every single, you know, anywhere from a teenager all the way to an adult has access to that literally you have the entire internet at your fingertips. And so anybody who wants to engage in some type of impermissible 
uh, lustful desire, if they want to watch something uh, that they shouldn't be watching, if they want to listen to something that they shouldn't be listening, if they want to um, chat with somebody or start talking with somebody that's going to lead to an eventually uh, 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 desirous sexual relationship, they are able to do that very easily. Even in a pandemic, you're able to engage your lusts and your and the 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 the, the, the traits of zina. Uh, you're able to engage them in forbidden ways, even though you and I might be just literally sitting in our homes, right? And so we live in a society that is full of promiscuity. It's full of pornography. It's full of hypersexualization, and it's full of trying to make us follow this desire from a young age. So now regularly we see, for example, in, in, in Western society, um, you see promiscuity at a young age, and you also regularly see people getting, uh, having sex before marriage, right? That's very, very common. Uh, in fact, it's, I believe the statistics show now that more people now engage in relations before marriage than people engage outside, or than, than, sorry, more people engage in relationships outside of marriage than they do in marriage. Right? And so this is a very, very uh, big shift, even in Western society. So this is, these are the impulses that we're facing. These are the lusts that we're facing. These are the desires that we're facing. But what we have to know, we have to know that God created us as human beings in order to test us. That's, that's one of the main reasons why Allah created us. And, and he created us in order to test us. And he created us in order for us to be able to for him to see, okay, who is going to respond to this desire and who is going to refrain themselves from this desire. Right? Those are the main reasons why we are created. Just checking something here. So that's up to us now. The more tests that somebody has, the more reward they're going to have when they resist that test, right? And so Allah knows our condition and it's not expected that our condition is going to be the same condition as uh, people of past societies. That's not an expectation um, that, 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 that exists, right? Now, what does Allah say in the Quran with regards to desire and sexual desire and controlling it? First is that he commands uh, the believing men and the believing women. He says to, t tells us to lower our gaze. And he tells us to lower our gaze because he indicates that lowering, your, that lowering the gaze is, is a way to um, prevent the desire from developing further. That that's what happens when somebody lowers their gaze, that the desire doesn't develop further. The desire starts to be tamed, right? Because... The eye is the entry point. And as soon as somebody sees something, they see somebody attractive. Now the thoughts start to stir in the heart, right? And when the thoughts start to stir in the heart, what starts to happen is they start to get ideas. And when somebody starts to get ideas, then they start to say, okay, maybe I could reach out to this person. Maybe I'll start texting this person, right? And the kind of overall sexual desires are uh, uh, incited within somebody. And all begins with the eye, which is why God commands us, right, to lower our gaze. That that is one of the first cures you have to this desire. And by the way, as, as folks have questions, please just put them in the comments section um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get to them. And if you're having any issues with the audio, just please also put that in the comment section. Let me know. Uh, I can't 100% tell if the audio is, is working properly or not. So um, that that is the, uh, oh, where was I? Sorry about this. That is the situation of how God tells us to, okay, this is how you start to reduce this desire by preventing it at the onset to lower your gaze, right? But then he also gives us many indications that human being is created weak, right? He says, that we created mankind weak. We created the human being weak. So when you're created weak, what does that mean? Well, when you're created weak, it means that you and I are going to slip up. We're going to fall into things and they're not always going to be able to lower our gaze. We're not always going to be able to control ourselves. But God gives us routes, right, to say, okay, look, I know this desire is inside of you, and you can release this desire in a permissible way, right? Thus, uh, he tells us, okay, you can get married, right? You are allowed to get married, and we are not a tradition that is you're forced to be celibate, right? You have other traditions that in order to reach certain stations of spirituality, you can't get married. Um, our tradition, alhamdulillah, doesn't, doesn't have that. The Prophet ﷺ did marry, um, and he encouraged us to marry. It's a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But to release that desire in the halal way is what we're ta taught to do, to not let our lust get to the best of us, like has happened in most of these societies that we live in. So those are some of the ayahs of the Quran. And then, you know, the, Allah describes zina, fornication, and adultery in very, very intense terms in the Quran, just saying how uh, uh, reprehensible these things are to him, right? So these are things that obviously we do our best to stay away from. Now we'll talk a little bit about... Um, uh, 
uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, the Hadith now. So the Prophet ﷺ, he indicates, he says that whoever can guarantee me what is between his two lips and what is between his legs, right? So his uh, the food that he eats and the sexual uh, 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 the sexual relationships that he engages in, guarantee them, do them in a permissible way. He can guarantee for that person Jannah. And this is, I'm paraphrasing the Hadith here, but this is generally what the Hadith indicates. Another Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says that a lustful gaze is a poisoned arrow from shaitan. Whoever abstains from that gaze in fear of Allah shall receive an increase in faith and the sweetness of which they feel in their heart. So when you and I like are about to look at somebody, we're about to check somebody out, we're about to go on a haram website, we're about to do something we shouldn't be doing. And this is especially happening for sure amongst um, a certain age groups, especially like, you know, if you're, if you are a teenager or if you have teenagers, this starts to become more and more of a thing, right? Pornography is a very, very big problem in our community, unfortunately, not discussed enough. Um, and the types of images that people are looking at, both hard pornography and soft pornography, what are these? The Prophet ﷺ says, poisoned arrows from shaitan. Now imagine if shaitan shoots a poisoned arrow at you. You're screwed. You're in trouble, right? Your whole body and your whole system is going to be impacted. So whoever abstains from that at the gaze, at the onset, right? Whoever abstains from it, they will receive an increase in faith. And they will feel the sweetness of the faith in their heart. Because you're like, okay, I'm doing it for the sake of God. Remember that it's harder when it comes to worship. It's harder to stay away from disobedient things than it is to do obedient things. It's actually very, once you, you can get to a point where it's like, okay, you got the prayers in a rhythm, you're doing your dhikr, you're doing all this stuff. But when, when sins get presented in front of you, when your lusts get challenged, when haram things come up in front of us, that becomes difficult to tame. Right? And we see that some of the biggest uh, prophets in the history of Islam were challenged with this. So the story in the Quran of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, that he was challenged with being seduced. Right, And it's mentioned that he even indicates the ayat in the Quran that, that he would have given in had there not been a sign from his Lord. Right, That this is a desire that's naturally there that, that any human being can fall into. But of course, Allah protected his prophet. Um, may Allah uh, grant him mercy and peace from falling into that. So this is no small thing. This is very, very much a uh, an easy thing for people to fall into. But the Prophet says, cut it off at the beginning and you'll feel the sweetness of faith. Why is sweetness of faith important? Because when somebody tastes the sweetness, when you taste dessert, when you taste the sweetness, um, uh, when, when you taste sweetness, when you taste the dessert, you taste something, right? You want more of it. Right? You have a really delicious cake and you're like, dude, I want, I want that cake again, right? You have really good cookies or brownies. You're like, I want more of those. Or where did I get those from? It's the same thing with the sweetness of faith. And when somebody tastes the sweetness of faith, you have people like, it's like faith is just this kind of burden, this like boring, intense thing that we feel sluggish doing. And then you might have people who they actually enjoy it. And you, might, you and I might see like maybe our parents or others, like they're literally enjoying their prayer and they want to pray more. And you're like, man, I can't even do the basics. And you want to pray more. And for them, it's not a burden because they've tasted the sweetness of faith. The sweetness of faith is tasted when you and I stay away from haram. And when we stay away from things we shouldn't be doing, right? And when we do engage in them, it's we just ask forgiveness and we try to change. It's not about um, uh, expecting everybody to be perfect. Remember, we said Allah created mankind weak. He knows we're going to mess up. He created us to mess up, but it's about messing up and turning back to him. And then the Prophet ﷺ said that every limb fornicates in some way, right? And he said the eyes fornicate and they do so by looking and the hands do so by touching. And this is a very, very like, this is, you know, very much a... Um, uh, comprehensive hadith. He said the feet do so by walking to the haram place, right? Um, the mouth does so by kissing and the heart does so by forming the thoughts, right? And the wishes and then so on and so forth until the other actions somebody engages in. What's uh, important about this, that uh, if you apply this to our times, right? You could even be texting and your hands are in a state of fornicating because you're like trying to flirt with somebody. You're trying to like, you know, uh, spark up a conversation with somebody and you are doing so with a lustful intention behind it. Um, and so there are a lot more ways. Now, remember, every single limb gives account. I mean, subhanAllah, every limb will give account and Allah will ask that limb and the limb will speak out either for us or against us. So say she or he, was uh, the eyes will say that they read Quran and that they watched uh, that they looked at the Quran or that they watched pornography, right? Like which end of the spectrum does somebody want to be on? And then of course there's mediums in between the hand will say that they used me to do good and to give charity or no, they used me to like, you know, send flirtatious text message and to swipe right and swipe left on Tinder. I mean, these will be statements 
And we'll have to stand before God and answer about these statements. And some of them, I'm sure many of these things, we'll feel embarrassed, right? Now imagine all of humanity watching us as Allah asks these questions and we ask Allah, Allah veil us and protect us on the day of judgment, ask these questions about why did you do this? Why did you do that, right? And our hands are, will speak, our limbs will speak. That day, the mouth is where you and I won't get to give explanation. Rhetoric will not help. It's going to be the other limbs that are speaking in in in, in their stead in uh, uh, during, on that day. So we have to keep that in mind. And that is the indication that we, we try not to get engaged in any form of zina, any form of fornication by preventing it from even by even looking at something haram, let alone you know, reaching out to somebody who we know we have a lustful desire attached to them, let alone walking to a place that we know we're going to do something, we're going to mess up, and so on and so forth. This is very, very important. Now, what are the challenges, though, in our times that people struggle with, right? And again, I, by the way, the goal for these talks, um, and I appreciate some of the comments here that, um, uh, you know, it's often taboo. Uh, to, so so the goal for these these conversations is to be really real. Like, the, it's we're just trying to be real, and these are real issues. And my understanding is, and I could be wrong, but that our elders, our teachers, and of course the Prophet they didn't shy away from addressing the real things that were happening in their society. And there were some really serious things, right? So let's talk about the real stuff. Let's start with the major thing that I believe that people in our society struggle with when it comes to lustful desires. Um, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, we'll start with this, which is pornography. Why is pornography so dangerous, right? Pornography is dangerous because first and foremost, it is the most intense form of zina of haram that the eye can commit, the most intense form of fornication. And it, it is a spiritual pure, it is a spiritual spear to the heart. It will destroy your heart. Literally, it will completely destroy the spiritual heart when somebody engages in that. And look, that doesn't mean that if we're caught up in it, we forget, we 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 give up. No, 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 no. We turn, we turn back to Allah. Allah can wipe our hearts clean in a minute. Ramadan is coming. We're already in a special month of Rajab. We're about to enter Ramadan in about a month and a half. So there's a lot of time, inshallah, for us to change. The goal is not for us to despair, but it is for us to realize that, hey, we might be struggling with it. And if you're, if you're, if you have like siblings or you're a parent and you have kids, just know. And I know this through like having worked with a fair amount of youth that people are struggling with pornography, like a lot. And they're doing so on their phones. They're doing so in the middle of the night on their laptops. They're not like you, you would likely have no clue that somebody in your house is, is engaged in that, but they are. And that leads, and it has significant damages in their worldly life, just in terms of how it's going to impact future marriage, future relations. There's a lot of damage it's going to have, let alone the spiritual damages and the uh, uh, the spiritual damages, sins, and uh, that, that people accrue and the impact it's going to have in the next life. So what do we do about this, right? So if somebody is struggling with this, or you know somebody is struggling with this, it's important to, to realize a couple of things. First is just realize the damage that it does. Number two is to actually, and I've 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 uh, seen people who like work in this field mention this to, to those who are like addicted to this stuff. Imagine that if somebody else was watching some like a, a, a mother or or sister of yours engaged in this activity. Imagine if somebody they were watching that person. What would you do? You couldn't stand it for sure. You couldn't stand it, right? You would. Um, you would uh, just lose your, you would completely erupt if you, if you thought that someone was watching your mother or sister doing that type of act. Now, you got to keep in mind, if you're struggling with this, that that is someone's mother or someone's sister or someone's daughter. So how could you allow for that type of object, objectification to happen to somebody? No, the human being is dignified. Somebody might be in a state where they're caught up in engaging in that act or doing so for the sake of money and whatnot. That doesn't mean that we get caught up by promoting that industry, by encouraging that industry. No, we have to be people that, that are calling to good and that are staying away from that. So that's the first thing to remember. The second thing is if someone is struggling with it is okay, you reduce it slowly. You might not be able to get rid of the addiction immediately. You slowly work on it. Okay, I'm going to go from this many times a day to this many times a week to this many times a month. And then I'm going to work towards quitting this, this type of behavior and this type of action. The third thing that someone does is to pray to Allah to sincerely, this should really be the first thing, but I'm just kind of going, you know, no specific order here. Pray to Allah to really help you with this situation, right? And if you, and if you're a sibling or a parent, well, pray for Allah's protection for your children or for your, you know, siblings or whoever it is with this, because this is very much present across society right now very much present. So pray for special protection for this type of stuff. It's not the same as it was back in the day. It's really not. It's too accessible. 
right? And this is, we're talking about, there are two types here. You have like people actually going and logging in on like what are actually pornographic websites. And then you have what's called basically soft pornography, which is people seeing like people posting pictures of basically themselves naked on even basic on platforms like Instagram, even on TikTok and other platforms, stuff is happening. And so how do you respond to it? Well, you and I have to control ourselves and we have to help ourselves and we have to help other people who we know that are struggling with this. The, fifth, the next thing that we do is we increase the amount of protective thicker that we're doing. So remember this, the more thicker somebody does, the more light someone will have. The more light someone has, the farther away shaitan will, the less effect rather that shaitan will be able to have on them. And we see this in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he says, he tells Sayyidina Omar that if you were to take, if you were to travel one path, shaitan fears you so he would travel another path because the light and the 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 augustness of sayyidina omar it was so amazing that shaitan couldn't stand it right satan couldn't stand it so that's possible the more protective thicker somebody does the more they will assist in this i know people who told me that they couldn't control lowering their gaze they couldn't control this desire and then they started adding more thicker to their schedule they started doing a couple of basic protection duas they started adding in the sunnah morning duas and the sunnah evening duas they started adding in a couple of these basic things, right? A, a recommendation that I've made before, and I would say again, is to read regularly, try to at least listen to on YouTube, if not read, what's called the Wird al-Latif of Imam al-Haddad, which is a compilation of the duas the Prophet would do in the morning and the evening, and try to at least read that in the morning time. Right? Wird, W-I-R-D, al-Latif, L-A-I-T, uh, L-A-I-T-I-F. Uh, sorry, L-A-T-I-F. So that is the uh, way to protect ourselves. You got to do more thicker. We know we're going to struggle. So like if we're going into battle, and remember when you are on the internet, in some way, shape or form, you are entering into a territory where people are going to be coming at you in a negative way, whether that's hate, haters, which happens a lot, or whether that's um, uh, haram coming at you. So you have to be protected. When you're out in the world, you have to be protected. It's like entering a spiritual battle. Spiritual battle should not be entered without spiritual preparation. Spiritual preparation is... Uh, done so by asking Allah for protection and it's best done through the sunnah du'as that the Prophet ﷺ allocated and told us to do with regards to protection. And if one isn't able to do that, just make general du'a that Allah protects you from uh, the type of lust that you and I might be uh, might, might have or we might channel that. So that is a very high level overview, right? So first is realize it'll destroy your heart. We're talking here about someone who might have an addiction or regularly engaged in pornography. Second is Imagine if someone is doing this to like someone who's watching, you know, someone in your family, a mom, sister, daughter, and realize that that person who someone is watching is a mom, sister, or daughter to somebody. So like, that's how could you do that, right? Third thing is to reduce it slowly. Fourth is to realize that um, uh, pray to Allah regularly to help you and pray for your family and your kids and others to be protected. And lastly is to increase the amount of protective dhikr that you're doing. If you do these four or five things, Allah will help, inshallah. Allah helps the person who starts to uh, starts to work on themselves, inshallah. So that's the first major bucket. The second major bucket of things that I believe that I've seen that people struggle with in our society is just an overall, like, you know, not an ability to lower their gaze. And then that gets into, like, illicit relationships, right? So this comes from a desire of, like, maybe someone always wants to flirt. Maybe someone always wants to get attention. Maybe somebody always wants to present themselves in a very specific way so the opposite gender could be attracted to them. It happens all the time. And, you know, the filters that we have on social media make that a lot, like, more inauthentic by just we can make ourselves look like ways we don't even truly look, right? And that comes then and someone sees that image and they might not lower their gaze, right? And so what do we have to do? First and foremost, we have to be people who follow that, try to follow that commandment. Okay, I'm going to follow Allah's commandment in the Quran. It says to lower my gaze. I'm going to try. I might not succeed. But if one out of every five times I can succeed, if today I'm lowering my gaze zero times, now every time I see something I shouldn't be looking at, if one out of every five times I can succeed in lowering it, alhamdulillah, I'm improving. Remember, Shaitan will try to get you to go from zero to 100 real quick. He'll be like, if you're either like a super, super saint in the religion, or you're like a terrible, terrible, you know, sinner who has no hope, like he's going to try to point, paint those extremes. And remember, the, um, this ummah is a middle nation, as the Prophet Islam said. So you and I don't have to be on either extreme. We just have to try our best. Allah rewards it when you try. Remember that always. Allah will reward you when you try. It's not about being perfect. It's not about getting it right. So with regards to this, we try to lower the gaze. We remember, number one, the sweetness in the worship that will come and this overall calmness will feel. 
Number two, we realize that when we see haram and when we text somebody haram things, when we text haram images and when we start to do this type of stuff, what happens? Anxiety builds up in the heart. Anxiety and depression come from a spiritual perspective, from the limited understanding that I have, is um, from the sins that we are committing. And it's very, very real. The more sins one commits, the darker the heart gets, as the Prophet told us. And the more dark the heart gets, the more trepidation and worry and anxiety and problems the heart has. So we might have anxiety that we're feeling now because of certain things that we were doing a, a, a six months ago or a couple months ago or even last week. You might not feel the effect of the sin immediately. There is an effect that that happens, right? So keep that in mind. It will help you when you lower your gaze. It will help you with your anxiety. And third way to help reduce lowering the gaze or sorry, to increase lowering the gaze is to, again, increase the number of thicker that someone is doing, the amount of thicker someone is doing. The same prescription for that the, the one struggling with lust and pornography is very similar here, right? Now, the other thing to keep in mind is um, let's talk about specific places that you and I get into when someone might start to, the desires aroused. Many times it'll be a specific app like Tinder or Instagram or something else where they're, or, you know, TikTok, something else that someone is on and they see something, you know, that they shouldn't be seeing. And uh, then the desires get aroused and they start to follow down a bad path. So, or it's a specific person that they're texting, they're DMing, they're messaging, and there's a certain type of uh, lustful slash love interest that's forming that we might think it's going to lead to marriage, but it might not. We don't know, right? So we we're, we might be doing something we shouldn't be doing. It's damaging us spiritually in the process. So if it's a specific app and we're, we're or a specific website that we're not able to control ourselves, we should take a break from it. Doesn't mean permanently delete. Just take a break from it, though, until you're able to control yourself. I know people who've deleted these apps, and it's had tremendous spiritual benefit for them because they were able to take a break reset, clean themselves, or Allah, of course, cleanse them. And then, you know, keep, 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 still had stuff to work on, but just, okay, now they were able to go back into it because the intense power of the lust that was being ignited wasn't as present. So if it's a specific app, delete it. If it's a specific website, block it. There's blockers you can get like on MacBook, they have a blocker called self-control, which is an app. Sometimes when I'm working, I'll like put, you know, a couple of websites, news sites and others on that app. And then even for the whole day, I can't access those sites, I, even if I want to go read the news or, or whatever other site somebody wants to book. So if it's a pornographic site, someone's struggling to stop looking at, block it. Just control those things, put those control mechanisms in place. Parents, you don't have to do this forcefully for your kids if you are a parent. You should talk to them about it. And because the helicoptering type of issue, um, uh, uh, the helicoptering type of issue might might become more um, challenging for somebody. Um, so you want to make sure you do it in a very, very gentle way uh, with, with somebody. So what do we say? Specific, specific app, delete it. Specific website, block it. If it's a specific person that is inciting those desires, distance yourself from them. If it's a specific place that one goes to, stop going or bring someone with you. So if you know that like when I have my device alone in the room at this time, at this time, I'm going to mess up, put your device away. If you know, if I go to this person's house, I'm going to start to flirt with them or whatever it is. Don't go to their house. It's, it's difficult. These are like simple things, but they're difficult to do. So we just have to take, you know, what we can do and, and do our best with it. And if it's a specific time that we engage in this, this activity, we fill that time with something else, right? So we do our best. And again, Allah will guide us. Um, the other two things to help with this. First is uh, to fast regularly. And you don't have to do that as like a full day fast if it's not Ramadan. If it's you're just trying to control the desire, you just reduce the food intake. So maybe you skip one meal, right? The less full someone is, the less they will act on their desires. That's a proven methodology according to our religion. So you lessen the food intake and the animal instincts inside of you become weakened. And then you don't act in that type of way. So food and lustful desire are directly linked. The second thing to do to make sure to, to, to do this in more broad way. So the first is to um, control the food intake. The second thing is to increase the thicker intake, as we mentioned. The third is to say regularly. As soon as we are about to do something to say it'll stop it to a degree. It will, inshallah, because shaitan is coming at you and it immediately he'll leave. 
The next thing is to never be alone with the opposite gender in either some type of you know private communication in the same room to the best of our ability, best of our ability, because that's when the desire starts to start, right? So when you and I are like texting somebody uh, and we're not married to them and we're you know slowly starting that conversation, DMing them, and doing all this stuff, we know where it's going to lead to. We want it to lead somewhere, and that place we want it to lead to is a desire of ours that's impermissible. So we have to just cut it off at the root, right? And keep this in mind, the best thing to do, the best thing to do, Imam Ghazali mentions, is to break this at the outset, that to, to, to cut it off at the outset. He said to cut the desire off at the outset, meaning to like immediately lower the gaze or immediately close the app or to immediately delete it or something like that. He's like, it's like pulling a bull before it gets to the gate. Imagine you have a bull, like an animal, a bull, and it's about to get to the gate. It's like, you know, there's a gate and it's going to run in the field after that. It, if you cut it off at the outset, it's like controlling the bull before it gets to the gate. But if you try to treat it after it has, after the outset, after the desire has been stirred, it's like the bull is running loose in the field and you're literally chasing it and trying to catch it from its tail. That's not going to be easy to do. It's possible. It's not going to be easy though, right? So this is why cutting the desire at the outset is important. These are addictions and addictions, they take, they take us completely. They completely consume us, right? So uh, that's a kind of general prescription that the scholars outline. So what is what we'll review one more time. It's to control the desire at the outset. It's to never be alone with the opposite gender. It's to reduce our food intake and fast regularly. It's to increase our thicker intake. And it's to say, out billah in the shaitan regime. And it's to cut that thing off. So it's an app, we cut it off. If it's a website, we stop going on it. If it's a, or we block it. If it's a person, we limit our communications with them and so on and so forth. This is the... The, the way that um, we can hopefully start to do this. And, and most importantly, inshallah, Allah will help us. And lastly, what is the way to channel this in the right direction? So I did say that um, that we'll talk about the way to channel this in the right direction. Having sexual desire is not haram in and of itself, but channeling it in the wrong direction, in the lustful direction is what's not allowed. So we can channel it in the right direction. What do we do? The first thing is to actively channel the desire in the right direction is to get married. Now, what does that mean? Obviously, someone has to be in a position where they're capable and they're able to get married. At the same time, though, we do need to have real conversations in our community about like having extremely high expectations that parents might impose on kids. Say you have to be this age, the, per the girl or the guy has to be like this, look like this, walk like this, be of this position, be of this race in order for you to get married to them. We set the expectations so high. And I can guarantee you for the parents who if you're doing that, your kids are in some way or another starting to get into some form of illicit relationships. It's, it's almost impossible to control desire in this country. And if you and I, as people, who, if, if we have kids, if we are the ones who limit them from getting married when they feel like they're ready to get married, the haram and the sexual desires that they get into, the lustful desires that they get into, that's on us. That's on the person who limited them. Keep that in mind. So uh, be much more open-minded. This is not the same as things used to be way back in the day. Like, there, this stuff is way too easy to get into. You don't want someone's spiritual heart to be ruined, someone's mental health to be ruined, someone's addictive um, addictions to go up, all because we were not able to have a very frank conversation about getting married at an appropriate age. If someone is out of college and they're able to like earn some money, they're like in their early 20s, I believe personally they should get married. Even younger than that, I think if they're able to manage it, they should do it. Because otherwise, the, 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 the desires just keep increasing. People are hooking up with people. People are on Tinder. Like, and again, 95% of, of, of people, of, uh, of, of like parents and whatnot, don't even have a sense of the stuff that's going on on the internet because, we're, because they might not be engaged in it themselves or the different apps someone's in. So that's the first thing is to get married and to have a halal way, right? That someone is able to release these desires. The second is if you're not able to do that, the, the, the energy that one is trying to activate or release with these desires, one does so in other means. So one takes up a sport, one exercises, one does some other intense activity to release that energy. That is not a long-term cure like the way marriage is, but it is a way for us, practically speaking, to say, okay, every time I'm about to do this, I'm going to go run instead. I'm going to go do this instead. It's going to release a certain type of dopamine inside of you that is going to still trigger similar things that would have been triggered with that other addiction that one has. So those are really the two like ways that I believe, and Allah knows best, there's probably more if you have others, please comment and suggest um, that one can can channel this desire and this lustful desire in the right direction. So 
those that's really the main thing we want to keep this brief so if anybody has any questions um i'll wrap up and if anyone has questions please post them in the chat or the q a section wherever it is um and i'll go ahead and try to answer a couple of these questions or comments or things you've seen or you know concerns and whatnot um please do so and we'll go ahead and try to uh, answer it i see someone said yes this topic needs to be addressed i'm the line i totally agree um so just as a kind of recap while we wait for any questions to come in and again the goal here is like be open, create an open forum, ask whatever questions it is that are on someone's mind and we'll do our best to address them. And inshallah, if not, we'll do our best to check with a qualified person and hopefully get back to you, um, you know, in a future week or in a future discussion. Um, but just as kind of a quick review, we spoke about sexual desire and we know that it is something that Allah created in us. It's something that is a good thing if channeled in the right direction. It's to allow us to, 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 to marry, it's to allow us to have, to have kids, um, it's to allow us to understand the a small portion of the delight of the afterlife as according to Mama Ghazali. At the same time though, the societies that we're living in are full of lust, full of desire, full of promiscuity, full of sex at younger and younger ages. And so we have to do our best to control this desire. And the way to do that is to lower our gaze, to cut it off at its root, to try to fast often, to try to increase our dhikr intake, and to turn to Allah sincerely and ask him for help. And if we are caught up in a major, major difficulty, like we're addicted to pornography or something else, we do what I just mentioned before and we slowly reduce our intake if we can't cut it off directly. Cutting off directly is obviously preferred and we reduce our intake of that. And then um, uh, we, we, we cut off the apps or the websites or the um, different uh, channels it is that we are consuming this stuff from or the people it is that we're engaging in this stuff with. And inshallah, slowly and slowly, Allah will facilitate Allah will help. Um, we ask that Allah bless all of you. He make this easy for you. Anybody who's sick, may Allah cure you. Uh, and inshallah, I'll see if there's any questions. I don't see any pop up. If anybody has anything, please post it um, uh, in the chat, inshallah. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and end. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Ya Allah, please allow us, Ya Allah, to channel our desires in the right direction. Please allow us to channel our desire, Ya Allah, and have knowledge of you and love of you and to desire your heaven, Ya Allah, to desire your Jannah, to desire you, Ya Allah, and desire closeness and nearness to you and nearness to your Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Allah. Please forgive us and pardon us for any impermissible things that we've done, for any haram thing we've looked at or anything else it is that was displeasing to you. And please cover us in your mercy and your love. And please forgive all of those that are struggling with their life, all those who are here and present and watching or any have any intention to work on themselves. Please forgive them and pardon them. And please assist us in all of our different situations and all of our different affairs. Please allow us to control our desires. Please allow us to lower our gaze. Please allow us to be people who are, are people of chastity and people who, who, are, who are pure inside and outside. And please allow us to have love of you and your Prophet Thank you so much. I don't see any question. Um, uh, and yeah, someone said I deleted my social media and it has lowered, yeah, it lowered my lust desires. Totally feel you, man. Like, or yeah, totally feel that. I know a lot of people that's happened with just because the amount of things that are out there that we're seeing when we're just scrolling, we can't, you don't even have time to lower your gaze because the next scroll is something else, right? So totally, totally feel you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't see any of the questions. Um, I'll give it another like 20 seconds or so. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and end. Um, thank you all so much for, for taking time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Hope everybody is doing well. Sorry, just having some difficulties here. Alhamdulillah. All right. So today we are going to talk about, we're going to continue this conversation on deceptive desires. And really the focus for today is going to be um, on the framework, reviewing the framework for desires. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about the desire for money and kind of what this does and how it relates to greed and uh, uh, treating others poorly and, and uh, just the overall sickness that having a deep attachment for money can bring to the heart. So as we've been discussing, a human being, we have desires. We have many desires. We have uh, sexual desire. We have our carnal appetites. We have the desire for food. We have the desire for money. We have the desire for fame. We have the desire for power. We have the desire to be in control and so on and so forth. Now, not every desire is considered a bad desire, right? There are some desires that are actually considered um, good desires. 
And there are some desires that are considered desires that can be channeled in a in an appropriate direction, in a beneficial direction. So that's something important for us to remember. The second point is, uh, the second kind of main takeaway uh, from the conversations thus far is that you and I can channel our desires either downwards or upwards. And the goal is to channel them vertically upwards. What that means is to channel them in a way that you and I are desiring Allah. We are desiring love of Allah. We are desiring knowledge of Allah. We, we love dhikr. We love these types of things. Now, this might seem like a very, very lofty type of state to be in, but it is possible, right? And, and that's something that we want to try to aspire to, uh, inshallah. So now we'll get into the conversation for today. Um, so we're really focusing now on the desire for money and what that is. So we live in a society that's really filled with, um, it's filled with everybody trying to get rich, right? Trying to get like, get rich quick schemes are here. Uh, there are people who are trying to not only get rich quick, but who will steal people's money in inadvertent ways, who will commit fraud, who will do anything it takes in order to get their share and to take somebody else's share. And so it's important to talk about this concept of greed and this concept of money. We also live in a society where everybody wants to be rich and famous. Now, it's important to know that there's nothing inherently wrong with having, mashallah, a lot of wealth and a lot of money. But there is something inherently wrong with just like always desiring and doing whatever it takes and forgetting our religious obligations in order to just try to be uh, ahead of everybody else and to try to be rich and, and so on and so forth. That, that is something for us to uh, keep in mind. So Allah mentions in the Quran, he says that your wealth is a test for you. He says that. And he gives us regular indications in the Quran that he's going to test us with different means and your wealth, wealth being one of them. He also says in Surah Ali Imran that the enjoyment of worldly desires, um, that he, he tested mankind with various worldly desires, including uh, he says in, in the verse, that we gave we, we have adorned various shahawat, various desires for the human being. And in those, he includes treasures of gold and silver. And, and he includes horses and he includes cattle and fertile land. All of these, he says, these have been made appealing to people. And then he says, but these are the pleasures of the worldly life. But with Allah is the finest destination, right? With Allah is the finest destination. So what does this mean? What does it mean when Allah is giving us this indication of desires and giving us these indication of uh, you know, gold and silver and horses and cattle and whatnot. Well, we don't live in a time where, you know, most of us have horses and cattle and we don't really have gold and silver much either. Um, and we don't have, you know, as not many, most, not many people have land and whatnot. So what does this mean, right? In our context, you and I could translate this as saying, okay, gold and silver includes all of our money, our salary, our stocks, our investments. Like these are the types of things we get absorbed in many times. And uh, horses in this context, right, could be translated as cars, the different types of vehicles that somebody has um, and just obsession with, Oh, I got to have a car. I got to have this car. I got to go for the utmost luxury. And the next, the next model comes out. I got to get it right. And it's like this attachment that you do you by any means necessary will go to get that thing that it is that you want. Right. And then, you know, land and cattle, other aspects of our wealth. There's this constant idea that I have to grow my portfolio. I have to grow my investments and whatnot. Again, nothing inherently wrong with doing that. But if that's our obsession, if that's the desire that fuels us, that's where the problem comes in. Right. And that's very, very important for us to discuss. It's very also important for us to discuss as generally speaking, if you come from a, mashallah, a wealthy background, a successful background, no, no, nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. Alhamdulillah, you should praise Allah. You should feel grateful for it. But if somebody allows that to get in the way of their religious obligations. If somebody allows that to get in the way of doing the right thing, if somebody wants to keep going and going and growing in their wealth and society and they go and they do haram things um, in order to grow, that starts to become a problem. And so we have to uh, look at that very, very seriously. There's also hadith where the Prophet Islam indicates that true hungry wolves do not cause a direct destruction in a group of sheep, in a flock of sheep, as much as the love of rank and wealth does in a Muslim. The Prophet is indicating right now, imagine you had a, you know, 50 sheep, right? And again, this is, we're not, most of us, we're not farmers. So these types of situations are harder for us to imagine, but imagine if somebody had that. And then you had two hungry wolves, what type of damage they would do to the sheep. They would just go after them, right? There would be carnage. The Prophet is saying that, that 
they don't cause as much destruction to the sheep as does the love of wealth and rank. And we're going to talk about rank next time, inshallah, as does the love of wealth and rank to the human being, right? So we have to take a look at this, that these are things that are happening at the heart level, the, the inner level rather, the nafs level. You and I, not every single thing that's good is seen, or not every single thing that's bad that's is seen. Or our intentions, you could have really pure, sincere intentions, and it could be a very, very good thing, alhamdulillah. And nobody would really see it though. Only Allah sees that intention. You could have very, very bad intentions. You could have very, very bad thoughts. Only Allah is seeing that in the same way. In the same way, you and I could have very, very negative um, and, uh, things going on deep down inside of us. And only Allah is going to be able to see that, right? And so the obsession to, by any means necessary, obsession with wealth could be one of them, right? You have a, another narration. Um, this is a story of uh, with Isa alayhi salam. It says the disciples of Isa alayhi salam asked him, they said, what, what is the reason that you can walk upon water and we cannot? He said, how do you, and so Isa alayhi salam replies to them, right? This is Jesus. He replies to them. He says, well, how do you value gold and silver in your hearts? What's the value of these in your hearts? And they said, that they're, they're good. They're good. He said, they're the same as earth to me. They're the same as dust to me. They're the same as dirt to me, right? Like that, the, the, one of the traits, right? Is that you ha he had this trait of ascetic detachment where these types of things were not valuable. These are not inherently seen as valuable. And as a result, he was able to achieve very, very lofty stations and Allah blessed him. And through Allah's uh, power, he was able to have many miracles on his hands, right? So those are some of the examples of, you know, where wealth can become a risk for us and what we need to try to aspire to, right? With regards to this kind of love, obsessive love that many of us have, this de deep attachment that we might have to money. And that manifests in a couple of ways. It can manifest when we have a hard time letting it go. It can manifest that when somebody needs our help, we don't want to help them. It can manifest in a way that we have a hard time um, spending on other people. It can manifest in a way that we are constantly stressed about money, not like, am I going to make ends meet, but how am I going to get more and more and more? We're never really satisfied. It can manifest like that. This is a sickness that that many of us have inside. I mean, I know I definitely struggle with this, right? And this is something we all have to work on, right? So there's another story in the Quran where Allah mentions the story of someone named Qarun. And this was a man at the time of Musa alayhi salam. And he had so much money, he had so much wealth, insane amounts of wealth, like next level amounts of wealth, that it took a group of, like it took a whole group, imagine a whole group of like really strong dudes filled this, this whole room, this back room. And that's how many people would not, not be needed to carry his wealth, to, but to carry the keys of his wealth, to carry the keys. That's how many people would be needed, right? A whole room of people would be needed in order to carry a group of strong people would be needed to carry the keys of this guy's wealth, right? So he had a lot. And what would people do? People would look up to him. People would be like, oh, look at him. It's Karun. He's the boss. He's the rich man. He's like, they would um, uh, give deference to him. They would have a next level level of respect for him, kind of, you know, as though, as though he has uh, some right over them just because of his money, right? So they had this immense respect for them. And people with other people, more, more righteous people would say like, why do you guys respect him so much? Like, what are you doing? And it's because, oh, he's, he's, look at this position that he has. Look at the station that he has. Look at all these types of things that he has, right? So what happened? He became arrogant. He's like, you know, when you have this much and you have a group of dudes who need to carry your keys, just literally the keys to all your money, you think you're a big shot, right? So he became super arrogant and he thought, you know, he, he calls all the shots, everything is about him. And so he became so arrogant that in Allah opens up the earth and swallows him because of his arrogance, because of his attachment to money and because of the arrogance that results. Now was money the problem? No, it was the arrogance that was the problem. But if somebody has a lot of that, how many of us could manage it? That's we have to know. We have to know the trades. And that's what we're trying to, you know, trying to discuss. Right? It's just like we talked about last time is, let's say, um, sexual desire in and of itself. Is that the problem? No, it is the way that that manifests and the way we're not able to control it. Same thing with the desire for food. Is that in and of itself a problem? No, but we needed to eat. But if we start doing haram and, and so on and so forth, then it starts to become a problem, right? So these are things for us to keep in mind. Now, 
remember, we have to just remember a couple of things here. What is the benefit of this wealth? Why do, what is the benefit of, of money, right? What is the benefit uh, of this? Well, the main benefit that we have to keep in mind is it is a means to an end. That's what it is. It's a means to an end. It's a way you are going somewhere, just like you need a car. You need a car to get you from A to B, right? Money is a car. It's a vehicle to get you from where you are here to the next life, to traverse. And you need a map, you need it in order to not be always stressed, in order to not always be worried, in order to not um, uh, 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 be, be worried about different conditions that are going to go on in your life, right? We need that. But when you spend on our families, food, house, alhamdulillah, that Allah has given us all this type of stuff. However, the way in which you spend it is the issue, right? And it's can somebody handle the potential negative implications of having it and it, do they become greedy as a result? We, we all have probably heard the hadith of the Prophet Islam said that the son of Adam, or he indicates the son of Adam, that if he or she had one mountain of, or one valley of gold, they would just want another. Like it, they're never, they never get the only thing to fill them will be the dirt in their grave, right? And Allah says in the Quran, He says, Al Hakum Tatta that vying for worldly increase has distracted you. It's occupied you. You've become so into it until it is that, 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 that you will actually be, um, you know, visiting the graves where you, whether you are yourself in the grave or it is this kind of realization that I'm going to end up in there. And then Allah says, Kalla sofa that you will then know. That's when you and I are going to realize. So like our goal in this life is to realize that this is not the end game. It is not the end game. And I'm saying that to myself first and foremost. It is not the end game to become rich. It's not the end game to become uh, 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 wealthy. It's the, that, that's not the end game. The end game for us is to get to the next life and to successfully uh, successfully get to the next life. And if wealth helps us do that, alhamdulillah, but we have to be on guard for any negative uh, aspects of it. So let's talk now about how this desire manifests, right? How does it manifest? Well, Remember this, that desires are the root and the sins are the branches. So you have to be able to, to, to cure the root before it becomes a disease, right? And spread throughout everything else and becomes a sin. It can also become a good deed, though, if you cure it properly. So what happens here? A couple things happen. If some, the desire for wealth gets to somebody in a, in a bad way. First is that you begin to want everything around you. you. It manifests in greed. I want this. I want that. I want more. I want more. It's always about more, 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 more. And that goes back to this hadith that if the son of Adam had one valley of gold, right, they would want another. The next thing that happens, you and I become envious. If we start looking at other people, be like, oh, he has this. He has that latest iPhone. I should get that. Oh, he has a Benz. Why don't I get a Benz? Oh, I should get this car. Oh, he has a BMW. Oh, he has a Tesla. Oh, she has this purse. Oh, look at that. They have a five-bedroom house. I have a four-bedroom house. I should get the five-bedroom house. What if I get a six-bedroom house? What about a swimming pool? What about this? Again, nothing inherently wrong except the fact that overly getting into these luxuries and forgetting the main point of our existence can become a problem because the one who keeps going and going and growing, it's like, okay, now the next thing is once the love of wealth is not sufficient for people, then the love of fame comes in, which we'll talk about next time, the love of status, the love of power, it keeps going and growing and growing, which is why you'll never see people in a society be content with just being rich. They will actually want to then be more than rich. They're going to want to quote unquote climb. Now I need power. Now I need influence. I got to run for this position. I got to run for that position. Once you have that, you've got to keep getting it, right? And so because it doesn't stop, the desire doesn't stop, right? And it can end up manifesting in negative consequences if it's not tamed properly. So then what ends up happening? If somebody does not tame desire correctly, they end up taking haram means many times. They end up taking the wrong means to get wealth, right? And so the goal here is for us to always keep in mind, if we do want to have a, a strong intention in mind and we do want to achieve worldly success, alhamdulillah, nothing wrong with that. But if we now start to, three things usually manifest with regards to someone taking the wrong means to acquire wealth. First is they just go after haram jobs and haram income. And that's important for us to not do. There are the obvious ones like selling, you know, liquor, having a liquor store, selling drugs, these types of things. But there are the unob, they're the ones that are not so obvious, like maybe uh, working for a super unethical, like weapons manufacturer. I mean, that's kind of obvious, but like working for an unethical organization or somebody that's uh, an organization that's getting most of its money from completely haram sources. These are questions we have to ask. At the very least, we have to look into it and we have to try. We might not fit, we might not succeed, 
We might fail, but we have to at least try. Because, but if you and I become so obsessed, so obsessed with this, um, uh, with how much money we have, how much rank we have, how much influence we have, and so on and so forth, we'll go to any means necessary. And I know many people that, you know, really, really, really high paying jobs, like will they will we'll reach out to them, but they're in an industry that they're just not comfortable going in that industry. And they'll just kind of turn, they'll just turn down the job because that's not worth it to them. It's not worth, these are Muslims, it's not worth sacrificing that income for them, right? Even if it's paying them two, three times more than they might be making. So that's one way. The second way is if this love of wealth uh, manifests is we start to take out impermissible amounts of money in the form of loans. What does that look like? Well, we live in a society where lending is a huge part of the society. And so let's say again that we've given that car example. Oh, I have a, you know, uh, a solid car, but everybody else around me has a Mercedes or a BMW or a fan some other fancy car. Now what? Oh, I got to get that too. Well, I don't have enough money to buy it. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to go home and take out a car loan. I'm going to take out a two, 3% APR car loan, not thinking that there's any problem with it. Well, there is a problem with it because having a car loan that has interest associated with it under no circumstance, like under most circumstances, right? Why we couldn't be, we shouldn't be doing that. We know that interest, Allah very severely warns against interest in the Quran. He says that, uh, tells us to stop taking interest. He says, stop giving interest. He says he wages, Allah and his messenger wage war on the one uh, who takes out interest, right? So there's very, very, these are verses in the Quran, very serious, but we don't consider them because the love of money is so deep rooted. And then it becomes in, I got to have this thing. I got to have that thing. And then that's one example. Okay. Well, maybe there's somebody who um, wants to go and remodel their house. Okay, cool. Well, now I'm taking out a, per, a, a loan at 5 to 10% APR over going on my credit card bill just so I can have really, really nice cabinets, let's say. Okay, nothing wrong with having the nice cabinets if we say Alhamdulillah, but what means are we going? These are just examples. But apply them to whatever situation we have in life. But the excessive credit card debt, the excessive debt that accrues as a result just because we weren't satisfied, just because the love of and that greed deep down inside of material objects and money was just deep down inside. Right. And then the third way this manifests is we just overindulge, right? Overindulge. All we do is just shop and buy things. And I got to get this. I got to get that. And that's an issue. Right? We can't, we can't be getting into a life as Muslims where like all we care about is consumption. No, we have to care about giving back to others. We have to care about if, if, if somebody uses their wealth to give to others, to build masajid, to assist others, of course, to take care of their family, you know, alhamdulillah, if you have nice things, we say alhamdulillah for them. But in the appropriate ways in the time that we live in, that's so different than somebody who just is like, I gotta have the best of five designer bags and then 10 this. And, you know, I have to, I have to buy a $5,000 shirt and, you know, $5,000 dress and just all these types of things that like, just keep on accumulating. Because when you have the money, it's all relative. People say that, right? Wealth is relative. $100,000 to somebody might be chump change versus to somebody else. It might be their entire year's salary. It just depends. But it doesn't mean that it's worth squandering. That's when luxuria, which is a disease that was, that's part of the kind of Catholic framework and the Christian framework, but it's also manifest in our, in our sense, right? Like, like this love of luxurious things. And all we want to do is spend our money on luxurious things. It's a problem. We have to think about that. Nothing again wrong with doing things within limit, but overdoing it beyond, beyond even a, 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 a bit more than what we need it can become an issue. So we have to think about that. So what then is wealth for us? We talk about this desire for wealth and desire for money. What is it for? It's for three things. According to Mama Lasal, he says, first, it is a vehicle, as I mentioned, to get you to the destination. Use it wisely. It'll help you in the next life. The Prophet Sassam, he indicated, he said uh, in various hadith and stories, how much have you sent forth for the next life, right? And it's or how much have you saved for the next life? And he said that everything it is that you give in the way of charity is what you've saved for the next life. Everything you've saved in your savings account, if you don't give it away at some point, right, or use it for something beneficial, it's not saving for the next life, right? It's used in this life. So there is that aspect. Use it to get to the next life. This is in two ways. It's to be to, to, to give or to help us get the things we need to have a car, to have a home and to take care of our family and put food on the table. All these things, alhamdulillah, are great things if done with the right intention. And we try to do them with the halal income, but that's the main goal, right? It's not to, the, we cannot let the means become the goal. It's not the goal. It really isn't the goal. 
The second thing wealth is for is to help build either ourselves, our families, our institutions um, to, let's say you, you want to hire someone to help you so you can focus on your taking care of your family or focus on learning the deen or something like that. Those are praiseworthy things. Mama Ghazali mentions that, right? Because you will free up your time to do things only you can do, right? Let's say you want to read Quran and someone, some, and, and so on and so forth, rather than spending, you'd say Allah has blessed you with wealth, rather than spending four hours cleaning your home, you spend that time in beneficial activities and you maybe get some help to clean your home. Alhamdulillah, you're using it in an appropriate way. You're, you are focusing on building your own knowledge, your own skill set. And the same way, building out institutions, taking care of family and, and, and whatnot. It's all positive things, right? And then, um, so these are really the vehicles that we can keep in mind. And this is what the, 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 the goal, one of the goals for, for wealth is. And so the Prophet has warned us against this kind of intense, greedy competition and told us and indicated to us many times how detrimental it can be for our community. And we don't have to go much farther than the Muslim world even to see like, the level of the how much the negativity, the, the desire for wealth and the desire for money and fame has crept into some of these societies. I mean, you it's it's amazing. You can have literally people who are struggling significantly and then people who are competing to build super tall buildings and who are paying like, for example, in parts of the Emirates, you have people who pay uh, insane amounts of money to get their license plate to be the absolute best license plate. So like, it's something like, I think, I think it's in Dubai, the fewer numbers you have license plate, the more high class you are seen in society. So they'll pay like hundreds of thousands of dollars equivalent to getting the numbers reduced on their license plate. They have like very few numbers. It's a form of status. It's part of love of status, but it also just shows that like, what is that wealth being used for, right? How is it that we can get into that level? I mean, what is the point of that? It's literally zero, zero point absolutely zero point zero benefit to that it's just but somehow muslims we're, we're doing that type of stuff because we've lost we've lost the way of where we're supposed to be going right so what is the cure for this what is the cure for this excessive love of money the cure according to the scholars is first is to get rid of the haram sources of the money so if we are in love with it so much that we spend a lot of money on haram things or sorry we're getting a lot of money from haram sources we have to reduce that either slowly or get rid of it completely. We can't keep getting access to our wealth from sources that we know are questionable. We have to work on that. The second is to reduce haram spending. So spending that we know is not good. Things we shouldn't be buying, but we are buying, right? That we, that, that are impermissible. Same thing then goes with loans. If we all do are, are caught up in loans, we got to get rid of them as soon as possible, right? We have to work on paying them off. We have a car loan, got to work on paying it off because it shows that there are many other ways to get the car. Most likely there was probably a way to lease it and to negotiate the rate. What's called the money factor rate in a lease such that you're basically paying, you know, close to nothing. And what would be, what would be the interest or the money factor? There are ways to do that, but are we going out and finding these ways? Or are we just going out and doing what everybody else is doing and trying to compete with everybody? These are the questions we have to ask. And then the next Thing to do is to just overall reduce our consumption and to not be so focused on luxury right okay i'm gonna get what i have alhamdulillah and these are unpopular topics i know because the nafs we like this stuff i mean this is this is hard for all of us right to really 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 think about this um but the the reality is is that it should not it should not make us obsessed whatever occupies you all the time means we are obsessed with it. We got to get rid of that obsession. And you have it, alhamdulillah. You just say alhamdulillah. Being, having things is not a bad thing. We just have to say alhamdulillah. We got to keep that in mind. But excessive attachment to them such that it distracts you from your deen, that's where the issue comes. And, and we ask Allah for guidance because for some people, wealth is a blessing. And for others, the same thing is a test. A test in, in the sense that we Allah is going to see how you handle that, right? The third way to do this, and by the way, I see this question come in, inshallah, I'm going to get to this in just a second. Um, and please, if anybody has questions, please just post them in the chat. That The third thing is uh, to contemplate death. That is one of the ways to remember, okay, this is not everything. This world is not everything. It's not always about this world. I got to remember, got to remember what I'm here for. I'm here to make it across this journey of this world so I can enter into the next world, inshallah, in peace. And then hopefully make it through that journey so I can enter heaven, inshallah. That's my goal, to be with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be with Allah, 
So I, remembering that, contemplating that, just sitting, just tried a couple of things that the scholars recommend. Sit alone with all the lights off and just imagine what it will be like to be in your grave. There will be no phone. There will be no people. There will be no Facebook. There will be no Instagram. There will be nothing with you. It's just you and your grave. And Allah hopefully is with you in there, right? Like from a, from a spiritual perspective or, or not, it could be negative, right? We don't know. So we have to contemplate this, let death settle in, let the reality, again, unpopular topics, but let the reality of the fact that I am going to die. I'm going to meet my Lord. Let that sink in. Let it, let it really sink in so that we start to realize that, oh, this stuff, dude, it's petty. Why am I worried about it? I just got to keep moving in life, get through it. Make sure I'm praying my five prayers. Make sure I'm doing a bit extra and just kind of make moves, right? And then the fourth thing is, in order to cure this, is to contemplate, right, the uh, the, the fact that all this is going to disappear. And death contemplation will help with that, right? All this is going to disappear. Your The money that you save for the next life is the money you and I will give. It's not the money that we just literally save and hold on to, right? And the fifth way to cure ourselves is to be generous and to give money away if we have it. To, to be to give our, okay, I'm going to give a donation, even $5, $10, anything we can do. If we have more, $100, $500, $1,000, give it to an institution, give it to somebody in need, give it to, you know, charity or something. But to, to get rid of this idea that, like, I have to hold on to everything, right? And this is the way then to channel the money. And we said that with every desire, we'll talk about how to channel it in the right direction. The way to channel this in the right direction is to use it for the right reasons, to be generous and to build for with it, to build institutions with it, to make it a sadaqa jariya for us, to, to, to help people with it, right? And again, that means then there's nothing wrong with having it. It just cannot be an obsessive desire that we are really, really attached to. So just a quick review of these cures, we get rid of the haram sources. That includes our loans, that, in, like, that includes the haram income that we, that we have. We stop spending on impermissible and haram things. We reduce our consumption overall and we stop just becoming consumers. We're always buying. I got to buy this, you know, 50 outfits and this many bags and this so on and so forth. We begin to contemplate death, right? And then we are generous and we give our money away often. We try to be generous with it. We try to give out. We try to give back. We try to take care of people. Inshallah, if we do these things, this desire will go away. And once the desire goes away, Imam Ghazali, this is a in, very interesting analogy. He says, wealth is not, it's like a snake. He says, you have to be a snake charmer. You got to know how to work with it. Not everybody can do that though. Not everybody can do this. We can't just think like, oh, everybody can handle sometimes like, oh, I want to be a billionaire. Well, not everybody can handle being a billionaire. Most people can't handle being a billionaire because I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that come with that, right? Like a lot of accountability will come with that. And on the day of judgment, potentially, Allah knows best. And we ask, he doesn't take us to account for anything. But not everybody can handle all the different things that come with having significant amounts of money. We have to know how to handle our wealth. We have to know how to handle it, as Mama Ghazali says. So may Allah, inshallah, assist us. We'll just get to this question. If you're coming from a poorer family and you're looking, working to change your family wealth status, and um, is that an unhealthy or an Islamic mindset? No, 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 not at all. That's an amazing mindset, mashallah. If somebody is trying to do more for their family, if someone is trying to assist their family and trying to kind of, quote unquote, move up and establish themselves, I, I, from my understanding, um, there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, the main thing, though, to remember is to just do it in a permissible way, to not find impermissible sources. If something is impermissible, to to project it, right? To not like take out a, a loan to then start a business so that you can grow, Right? because that would be then impermissible root, and as a result, something impermissible to, go, to continue with. That type of thing uh, w w would be something to watch out for. But overall, like if someone is doing it in a halal way and they're able to give themselves a solid life, and that's their intention to take care of their family, take care of their parents, those that, that goes into the praiseworthy direction, inshallah. So hopefully, um, brother, that answers the, the question. Uh, so if anybody has any other questions, inshallah, please just post them. We'll just wait in the chat. For just a 30 seconds or a minute or so and otherwise we will go ahead and do a short dua and end i don't see anything i'll just do a dua and if anybody has anything please go ahead and post it bismillahirrahmanirrahim alhamdulillah allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi sallim ya allah ya rahman ya rahim ya allah please assist us 
please uh, help us with our lives. Ya Allah, please help us with any difficulty that we are going through. Please, Ya Allah, remove these, any desires that we have that are negative, Ya Allah. Please allow us to channel those in the right direction, Ya Allah. Please allow our uh, our nafs to not have control over us. And please bestow sakina upon us. And please bestow tranquility upon us. And please cure all of the Muslims of any diseases. And please cure all of our loved ones and family members, anybody else who's struggling with COVID in any other situation. Alhamdulillah. We have another question come in. Unrelated, what do I do if I have not fasted for many years since Ramadan is coming soon? Um, Alhamdulillah. So if you have not fasted for many years, so I, uh, if you could just clarify in the question, is this, what do you do if you need to make up your fasts or what do you do if you're just kind of out of practice? Um, uh, that would be, that would be helpful. Uh, if you, if Ramadan is coming up, the best thing for us to do is first to know it's, it's going to be here in about a month and a half, inshallah, for us to start to get in the rhythm of fasting. Okay. Maybe we try to fast once every other week or even once this month and then two, three, two, two times in the next month, just kind of get in a rhythm or fast once a week, whatever it is that we can do. Or just start to, maybe you skip a meal here and there, right? You start to get your body used to skipping a meal so that you can be ready for Ramadan. Um, the second thing, though, if, if you're saying for not fasting, again, if you can clarify in the chat, I, we can try to respond in a more specific way. But if you're saying, what do you do in terms of makeup fasts, right? If you have to make up those fasts, then, um, of course, you fast this Ramadan. Um, okay, got it, got it, got it. So not just makeup fasts, you're saying overall. Well, look. Don't, don't stress, get, do what you can, right? So if somebody is just getting into Islam and you're just starting to, you know, get into a rhythm, mashallah, may Allah make things easy for you. Take it slow, do what you can, right? Okay, you can do, if you can go into it, the, you gotta know the obligation is, okay, I gotta do 30 days. I gotta do the full 30 days, right? Um, with except the time for a woman when they're on their cycle. If someone is getting into the religion, newly entering the religion, newly starting to practice, you do manage it with whatever you can do. So you make the intention, I'm gonna fast, the whole month, you ask Allah for assistance and you start with that. And hopefully you, Allah will help you, inshallah, Allah will help you get through it. So just kind of begin, right? So from a, um, a basic perspective, it's fasting from the time right before Fajr comes in, uh, what's known as pre-dawn up until sunset, you don't eat or drink water. And then of course you try to pray all of your prayers during that time and try to limit any other haram things that we would be doing or try not to do any of those at all. Um, that's like the basic kind of rule of the fast. Uh, but you know, we can get more into that inshallah. We'll try to do some basic Ramadan prep. So hopefully that answers the question, um, that was being asked with regards to, to Ramadan. But, uh, if, if one does have out of practice or have a lot of makeup fast and whatnot to do, it's okay. Just take it slowly, do what you can. Okay. Of course the obligation is the obligation, get into it. But if somebody it's like impossible for someone to handle all the makeups or whatever it is that they have to do, they just slowly work through it and ask Allah for assistance. Inshallah, may Allah assist all of you and help you and make this time easy for everybody. Uh, inshallah, if there's any more questions, we'll please post them. Otherwise, Jazakumullah khair. Assalamualaikum wa bihamdik wa nashadu an la ilaha na astaghfirak wa natubu alaik wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alhamdulillah. I don't see any others. Okay, alhamdulillah. Well, Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah, we'll see you next week. Uh, same time, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Inshallah, assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyiduna Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I hope everybody is doing well. So we are going to continue this series now, inshallah, on deceptive desires. We've been talking about a different desire every week. And today, inshallah, we are going to be talking, uh, we're going to just do a quick review and then we'll be diving into um, a specific desire, which is focused on the desire that the human being has to always be right and to argue, um, and also how that stems in relates to the desire for anger. So uh, a couple of things, what we've been talking about so far is basically this idea that the human being can either go in a good direction or a bad direction. The human being who follows their lower desires, their lower appetites, their, uh, their, their, their shahawat, they will end up generally going in a bad direction, right? So these include the, de the desires that we've been talking about, that following the desire for food in the wrong direction, the desire for sex in the wrong direction, the desire for money in the wrong direction, the desire for fame and power and argumentation and to be right and all these other things, that you and I can follow those desires and we can go in the wrong direction if we follow those desires um, and we don't channel them correctly. At the same time, we, there's a reason why we even have desires. And if we follow and channel the desires in the correct way, 
inshallah, we are going to use what Allah created for us in a positive way and to hopefully ascend closer and closer to him. So the one who restrains their their themselves from doing what's haram, we all have this understanding and know this, they are going to benefit. And the one who gives in to these desires, they are going to be harmed. And Allah says in the Quran, after that destroyed, or sorry, successful is the one who purifies themselves and destroyed is the one who doesn't. So our job is to try to purify ourselves. And what better purification than to try and purify our uh, nafs, right? So what is the nafs? We've been talking about the nafs a little bit. The nafs is known as the lower self. It is the lower part of us that inclines towards following and doing haram things until it's refined. So the nafs goes through training. The more spiritually trained somebody is, the more the nafs is going to improve. And eventually the nafs can get to high stages known as, for example, as mentioned in Surah Al-Fajr, nafs al mutma'inna, the tranquil soul, where the soul will actually be in a state of accepting Allah's decree and assisting you and I in uh, accepting Allah's decree and being in a state of contentment. However, in the early stages, what is known as nafs al-ammara, mentioned in Surah Al-Yusuf and, and, and the other early stages, these, this is the evil commanding soul. And the nafs will follow its base desires and take you in the wrong direction. So you and I have to work on ourselves. Now, here is a very, very important thing. Just because somebody is starting to practice religion or has become religious or has signs of religiosity does not mean that they are refining their nafs. The two are not always linked. If they are following the right path, if they are following the right types of knowledge, if they are doing the right types of spiritual practices in line with the sunnah of the Prophet attempting to be aligned with the akhlaq and the character of the Prophet okay, that's a very, very good thing. However, if they are following a very, very outward focused, harsh way of religion that everything has to be their way or the highway and uh, 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 yes, they might be worshipping a lot, but is the worship really benefiting them? Then you have open questions about if their acts are actually benefiting them because you are, as you become more purified, your character should improve. And what is the evidence of this? The, ev- the evidence is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where the Sahaba came to him and they were impressed with a woman, a woman who used to fast a lot, extra fasts, nawafa fasts, and she would pray a lot of extra prayers, specifically the tahajjud prayer, the, 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 the prayer known as uh, the prayer at the last part of the night. Very, very virtuous things for somebody to do. And so they were impressed by her. However, the Sahaba mentioned that it was mentioned that she was also rude to her neighbor, right? And had this kind of rudeness. And the Prophet ﷺ said that she is in the fire. He said that she's in the fire because uh, even though she might have done these, the, this worship, the akhlaq, the character wasn't there. And we, it comes in the hadith that the weightiest deed on the day of judgment is one's good character. One's character will be the weightiest deed on the day of judgment. Um, and, and the Quran magnifies good character as well. So let's, let's, let's examine that, right? That it's not just about how much worship you do. No, you can do the base amount of basic amounts of worship and a little bit more, but work on yourself, work on having good character try to work on getting rid or mitigating your desires, and you can be in a very good place. And you can do a lot of worship and all these things, but if you're not doing it in the right way and you're getting puffed up thinking you're all that, thinking you're better than everybody, is it really even uh, helping you? Is it really benefiting you? So this is something to keep in mind. So what we're trying to talk about just briefly today is this desire to be right. This is a desire that in the world of social media, in the world of uh, the, the way things happen now on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram and on TikTok and even in the comments and these different threads, everybody wants to be right. And this was the case. This has been the case throughout history. But now everybody has to prove themselves. I want to be right. It's my way or the highway. It's about me. Anytime you hear somebody really magnifying themselves, me, 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 know that they are really at a subtle level worshiping themselves. They're worshiping their nafs. They're worshiping their opinion. The person, though, who's humble enough to accept that, okay, Allah, of course, is the only one in control, and there could be a different way to do things. They, at the end of the day, are following the kind of correct um, approach that we should be taking in our religion. So what is this desire to be right all the time? This is a sickness. This is a sickness deep inside the human being. And remember, from different desires stem different sins. So the sins are kind of like stems, and the desires are like roots. So 
the sexual desire when uncontrolled can result in the sin of adultery, right? Can result in the sin of zina, can result in the sin of looking at pornography and so on and so forth. The desire when it is uncontrolled, the desire for uh, uh, the, ang- the desire of anger and the desire to be right, it results in the sin of arguing. It results in the sin of yelling at people. It results in the sin of trying to always prove yourself and maybe you're even backbiting people because you're saying, oh, did you hear what they said? They're, you know, he, she, he or she, totally, you know, uh, uh, totally wrong. And you're just t- talking bad about them all the time. This is what the desire to be right leads to. And it's very, very present in the world that we live in. So there are different categories of this desire. You have those who have this desire, who argue about it, who argue about worldly matters, right? So I have to be right about, okay, I'm talking about politics. My opinion is right. My party is right. We saw this manifest in the last election, and we see this manifest throughout the United States right now, that there's very, very little cooperation between different parties, simply because they believe that their way has to be the way. There is no such thing as compromise for them because it's about their way. And that links to other desires, not only the desire to be right, but the desire to win, the desire to be in charge, and so on and so forth. So we can see how much these desires really end up ruining us. At the same time, at the same time, there are uh, uh, different ways that you and I can manifest this desire in, 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 world, in a worldly sense. So it might manifest in politics, could manifest at work, could be in our own homes. We might, oh, I have to be right with regards to like, you might be just, you know, young and arguing with your parents or vice versa. And even though you might have a sense that the other side is, is kind of on the verge of, of, of the truth, you, because you are sticking to your point, it's like, no, it's about me. I see this happen from time to time, right? People who like have this arrogance to them that it is difficult for them to admit that they're wrong about something. And it's very much a cultural practice. And, and generally speaking, many of us, of us men, we have this a lot, I would say, that right. That there is a kind of general sense that, you know, no, I'm, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, I'm right. And the, pro- the, the Prophet Islam taught us humility. He taught us that being wrong um, is okay. And Imam Malik said that saying, I don't know, is half of knowledge. So, you know, there is no concept in our religion of having to prove yourself always and to be right. So that can happen in so many different areas. It can happen at work. It can happen in, of course, you know, at work and your job. It can happen in the political arena can happen with family, it can happen broadly with extended family, so many ways it can happen. Then there are people who it's, it's, it's about arguing for religious matters. This is far more dangerous, far more dangerous. I have to be right when it comes to my view on the religion, when it comes to my specific approach, or even if you follow a madhab, it's only my madhab that's correct, right? It's all this argumentation. Argumentation does not have any place in this religion, and we have to work on ourselves to get this desire to be right if we want to really purify ourselves. Remember, Allah says that successful is the one who purifies themselves, and destroyed is the one who isn't, who doesn't. So we have to try to purify ourselves. We have to try to work on ourselves in order for us to actually grow and succeed in this religion. So when it comes to arguing about religious matters, what does this mean? Right? You do have um, many, many examples of things that have become controversial, unfortunately, because so many people have tried to fit their framework in. Here's something to keep in mind, or sorry, the religion into their framework. You have two types of people. You have somebody who they want to know the truth and they will fit their religious practice into whatever the truth ends up being, okay? And then you have somebody who has a very specific framework in mind and who will fit the religion into their framework and who will exclude this and include this in order to fit it into their framework. Now, the danger of this latter methodology and why it's so problematic is because there are groups of people, unfortunately, today who have major prominence in in, in the Muslim community and in the Muslim world who literally had a very specific view of religion in mind and they took out everything it is that they didn't like and they just made stuff up. Oh, this is weak. This is fabricated because I don't like it. Not because of anything else. May the great imams of the past had accepted certain hadith, that accepted certain statement. No, nope, I don't like it. It doesn't align with my view. It has to be my view, right? And their arrogance and their following their desires got them down a path where they became very, very harsh with everything. And it still manifests today, where if your practice doesn't fit their very narrow view and their desire to be right has become so magnified that you are excluded. There were even movements from the leader, leaders of these movements that would Say, everybody who does not follow my way is a Catholic, even though 
there are so many different differences of opinion that you could follow about how should you do a certain religious act and, and whatnot. But again, the desire to be right took them over and they were, they killed people. They straight up Muslims killed Muslims in the, in the, um, uh, the kind of disguise of I'm right and I'm on the religious truth. This is a very dangerous desire and it ruins people. It ruins people. And it's very related to the hadith of the Prophet where he said that I fear more, more than the Dajjal, the Antichrist. I fear for you, evil scholars, ulama asu, that these scholars who literally, they will fit the religion into their framework. It's about themselves. It's about their nafs. It's about their ego. It's about their fame. It's about hypocrites, like the hypocritical acts. That's very dangerous. And, it, and it's become a disease in the ummah today, such that you and I will see very... Just someone's just trying to worship. I'll give you an example. Tonight, tonight is known as Layl to Isra al Miraj. Mashallah, the MCC will have a, a inshallah a beautiful program with uh, um, uh, Dr. Ali Atayah, an acclaimed scholar, he teaches at Zaytuna College, and he lectures in many other places as well, including MCC, on the on just reflections on Isra al Miraj. Right, what took place on this night? This is the night of the twenty seventh of Rajab. We are in the blessed month of Rajab. We have just Alhamdulillah entered this blessed night, and it's good to talk about the events that took place on this night. It's good to remind the Muslims. Allah says, uh, Remind and reminding benefits the believers, right? But you have a group, you have groups of Muslims who it's about their way. So because they don't, they don't know, oh, this is how you should do certain things. It's like, okay, they're going to, you start to have people who say, no, you shouldn't practice anything on this night. There's no need to single out any specific nights of worship. Uh, there's no proof for this, so on and so forth, and just continuing the argument. Same thing, same groups of people do it for Nis Shaban, they do it for the Mawlid of the Prophet and it'll, and it'll continue to go on. Now, the danger of this, it's one thing if you're really sincere and you're really just like, okay, I really, really firmly believe at the bottom of my heart that every single thing that I do has to be like in line with the very, very, very narrow methodology of how I do things. Okay, you're welcome to do that. But then at the same time, that group of people, like you should, you should definitely stop watching television. You should get off of all social media. You should probably stop driving cars. You should probably stop um, uh, using watches uh, to tell the time and tell the prayer time because all of these things will not fit the narrow methodology or the kind of innovation methodology that somebody is trying to fit their view in. But that's not going to happen because it's only when it comes to my desire to be right. Right? I have to prove myself. And then religious argumentation begins. This happens all of the time in the community. This is a big problem. And the way we respond to this is we should not engage in argumentation. We should not. I see it all the time in YouTube threads and, and all these different threads. People just arguing back and forth, back and forth, as though you forgot that we're brothers and sisters, that we are Muslims, that we are supposed to be united, that we have enough people outside of our ummah who are going to hate on us, that we don't need to hate from within. That if you disagree, you are entitled to disagree and you can have your opinion, but disagree respectfully and just leave it, right? Just let people do their own thing. That we're living in a time when people are just barely trying to hold on to faith. So stop trying to fit everybody into the narrow technical view that you want to follow. Like, right? Like, let's, let's be a little bit, it's called magnanimity. Let's be a little bit magnanimous with regards to our approach to other people and try to be generous and try to be uh, open to harm rather than trying to shove everybody out who doesn't fit our narrow approach. This is what happens with the desire to be right. And these people, they push people away from the religion. They push people away. And it comes in narration that a people never went astray after they were upon guidance, except when they took to arguing. Right? And in one of the scholars, the great scholars, Imam al-Urza'i, he said, if Allah willed evil for people, he would give them argumentation and prevent them from action. So you have many people, a very, very special time comes in the religion. All they spend this all that time they spend arguing about it instead of just worshiping. Just go make du'a, go pray, go do something useful, or just at least not argue and it'll be better. Just remain silent, right? As it comes in in, in, in in narration, speak good or remain silent, right? There's no need to always be talking and arguing about trying to get your opinion across. But this is a, this happens, so we have to control this desire. We have to work on this desire. We have to work on ourselves. So the way that we need to approach this. Right. It's first and foremost to realize that when it comes to matters of dunya, when it comes to, you know, uh, politics and work and sports and all these things, we should engage in discussions if we want. But these are like, I mean, come on, these are petty things. Let's not let disagreements really get in, rip, create rifts between us. Let's try and be reasonable with our conversations and let's just 
be okay with being wrong or be open to hearing different perspectives. That's the kind of macro view. But when it comes to, and so that's their opinion. However, when it comes to religion, we have to know there is no room for argumentation if we are not scholars and we are not scholars and so we really shouldn't be arguing. We should know that we need to have a sunnah methodology in everything. So if you want to be right, let's say you have this desire to be right and you want to prove your point, the way in which you go about proving if you believe your point is the correct religious way, which means it's the way the Prophet ﷺ practiced, the way in which you go about proving your point must be aligned with the, 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 the sunnah as well. So the methodology has to be correct and the fact that you're presenting has to be correct. You cannot go and prove your point and then be arrogant, yell at people, get angry, get mad, use slurs, call people names, and say, my point, though, is my point. I mean, I'm on the, I'm on the truth. I'm following the sunnah. How, how are you following the sunnah if your methodology is not in line with the sunnah? Show me one time where the Prophet ﷺ argued. Show me one time where his, uh, uh, just, just, I have to be right, got in the way. No, he didn't even have that. Right? This was one of the famous nights on Isra Miraj where we know his blessed heart وسلم, was actually washed. All of these things were washed away from him. A perfect human being. So what does that mean? It means that we need to work on ourselves. We need to work on our hearts. We need to work on our nafus. We need to work on our egos. We need to stop thinking that it's my way or the highway. We need to humble ourselves. We cannot be so puffed up all the time, walking around, just looking for people to make mistakes so we can call them out. This has to go away. I know so many people who have been pushed away from Islam by, by those of us who might act in this way. And we ask Allah for forgiveness if we've ever pushed somebody away because of this methodology. But we have to work on this, right? So a couple of things to keep in mind and ways to tame this desire to be right. Number one, really recognize the, the uh, danger for you to always be praised or for you to always be up at the forefront or for you to always be right. That's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. In Western society, it's a good thing because everybody, the people don't operate with the afterlife in mind, but it's not a good thing for us in our, in, in, in our context, in the Islamic context to always have to be right because we know it's a desire. Knowledge is the first step. So once you know that this is a desire, don't follow it down the wrong direction. Where does the desire to be right come in? When it comes to, to be on the haq, when it, you want to be on the truth, that's a good thing, alhamdulillah. If you want to follow the truth, you want to really learn how does this religion really work. I want to learn the religion in the best way possible. Alhamdulillah, that's a good place. The desire to be on the right path is good. But the desire to say, now, now, I'm following the deen. Now, everything I do is the right way. Everything somebody else does is the wrong way. We can't do that cannot do that. Your kids might do things differently than you, as long as it's within the permissible, the permissible boundaries that the scholars have created, and including the differences of opinion that the scholars have created, say Alhamdulillah that they're still believing and that they're doing that. They're not going to follow every little thing. You might get disappointed at certain things. That's okay. Just, but know that it is a test for you and I, because Allah says that He will test us with all these aspects. He will test us with our wealth and our children and within ourselves and with other people. We will be tested. So we have to ask Allah for patience and we cannot let this desire to be right and to be to, 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 to win all the time get in the way. The second thing to do is to work on our anger. Usually the negative aspects of this, they result in angry argumentation, angry arguing, and it's a problem. So we have to work on our anger. How do we do that? The Prophet he told us, that if when you get angry, he told, said, say, I would be on energy. And he said, if you are standing, sit down. If you are sitting, lie down. That anger is a fire, like the, from the fire of shaitan, and it makes you rise, get up, right? You see people ever get angry and they're just like, ah, they'll be there bad. They like, they're, they want to fight. They like, say, what'd you say to me? And they start to get up. And then and you can see they're getting puffed, right? So calm it down. The Prophet said, just calm down. And then he said, if, if that, if, if you do that, and also if it doesn't work, make wudu with cold water because cold water will extinguish the fire of anger. Know when you are about to get into an argument and when you were, your desire to be right is manifesting, to leave the situation. Uh, that, that, uh, forgetting the exact verse, that when the ignorant approaches you, alu salama, say peace. When the ignorant person who just wants to argue, like, yo, come, like, Tell me about this. Tell me about your proofs for this. Tell me about this. They're, every single thing is about arguing. And you know they're not coming with, with a very hum, humble approach. There's one thing when someone comes into you and, you know, 
hey, you said this thing or, you know, I'm learning something. And I just was quite wondering, like, um, how do I think about this? Like, I heard one thing from one person. What are the different proofs for, for this type of approach? MashaAllah, they, that person is really trying to learn. And somebody coming and just being like, you, this way is wrong. Everything you're saying is wrong. Your approach is wrong. This is an innovation. This is a bidah. Now my approach is the correct way. And show me where you get this from. It's a disease. Just ignore people like that. Just ignore them. Just say Allah, uh, say Allah and leave them to their idle talk. Just leave them to that. Because that won't benefit you. I'll tell you that much. It will not benefit you enough. If the scholars want to discuss it, the differences of opinion, mashallah, they do that already. So let's let them do that. For us, it's not worth it. Let, don't let the desire to be right in religious matters get in the way. So taming the anger is very important here. Third is analyze the issue and think about, is it worth re, me really like having to be right? right? And is it really worth my time? And is it worth me getting into sin? Because when you start arguing and anger comes in the way, you are getting into sin. You are creating animosity. You are disrupting things between yourself and you are disrupting a societal harmony. You ever been in like, where does this happen a lot? I mean, we've caught, we've all been in quarantine for a while, so we haven't gone to any places. But you know, maybe at the airport or like sometimes I've seen this on on, on the subway um, back when we used to be able to ride the subway. That something small will happen. Everybody's quiet and doing their own thing. Two people like disagree on something, and boom, arguments start, and everybody's impacted. The entire harmony of the situation has been messed up. I, this happens sometimes at airports as well. Any time where people are kind of in an intense mood, this happens. Sometimes it happens, unfortunately, even in our own communities, in our own masajid. So what does that mean? Don't, don't disrupt other people's harmony. If you have inner harmony, I will tell you this, you will not be the person who's disrupting the outward harmony because your inner harmony will be a light that brings harmony to everybody else. But if you don't have inner harmony, you're just going to go out and look to pick fights. You're going to try to pick everybody apart. Argue here, argue here, argue here, my way, the highway, every single situation. That is a disease I highly recommend to your, to you, to myself, first and foremost, and to all of us. We have to work on ourselves to get rid of that disease. It will destroy us. It will destroy us. It will mess us up as an ummah. It will create problems. It will create animosity. It will create tension. And it is a desire that just like these other desires, once they get out of control, like the sexual desire, and the food desire and all these other ones, we will start doing many haram things. And we do not want to be in that boat. We don't. And people will, this one is to a degree very problematic also because people will just hate us too. So like, you know, we're going to be in major trouble with other people as well. And we will, we will create a dissension amongst people. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to post them to this chat. We're about to end inshallah. If anybody has any questions or, or, or anything, please feel free to post them. We will um, go ahead and get to those inshallah. So those are really the ways that we should approach this. And lastly, all of these desires can be controlled with us doing the following things. With us doing an abundant amount of thicker, with us fasting, often with the right intention, and with us appealing to Allah and really turning to him, and ideally in the later parts of the night, and begging for him to help us. That, ya Allah, get, this rid of, get rid of this for me. Help me with this. Those are the general over-the-counter cures that the scholars prescribe, right? That try to, and in this case, though, the fourth one actually that's also prescribed is to limit the amount that you, that you talk. So that, that doesn't mean we don't talk ever, but when you're about to get into an argument, just zip it. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I know my desire to be right is going to manifest, right? So let's work on ourselves. Let's try to do these things. And when that comes up, when a topic comes up, just say, you know what? I'm just going to leave this. I'm not going to like... I'm not going to engage. I'm going to leave it because Allah will appreciate if I leave it. We know that famous story and we'll, inshallah, end with this and we'll mention briefly on Isra Miraj. We know the famous story of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq that one time he was in the masjid and somebody was insulting him and he was, the Prophet ﷺ was with him and someone insulted him and the Prophet ﷺ stood by and he was, the Prophet ﷺ was actually standing by and I believe the narration said he was smiling. And this person kept insulting to them. Bakr, 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 didn't say anything. He kept doing it. He didn't say anything. He kept doing it. And finally, and Prophet is still listening and smiling. And finally, the person insults him again and says, Abu Bakr Siddiq, that he responds to defend himself. And at that moment, the Prophet went and he left. And Abu Bakr catches up with the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, this person was saying this such an to me. You were there, and then why did you leave? He said, Because when you were silent, right? There are angels there responding on your behalf. 
But when you decided to right, say something and engage, shaitan came. And shaitan and the prophet cannot be in the same room. Right? So, uh, and I'm paraphrasing this, the, the hadith here, but that, that's more of an indication, right? That look, look, at, look at what the Prophet is teaching us here. Just don't engage. I'm not talking about in categories where you have to respond or somebody's like getting, getting you or your family into a difficult situation or into trouble or any situation of abuse or, talk or anything. I'm talking about just when people just want to argue and prove themselves right. Just don't respond. It's a desire. Don't, you shouldn't follow it. I shouldn't follow it. And don't let someone else follow it. Inshallah, we ask that Allah help us. We ask that Allah assist us. We ask that Allah facilitate goodness and khair for us and allow us to control our nafs and allow us to work on ourselves and that he allow all of our intentions that are good to be fulfilled, inshallah, and prevent uh, us from following any evil intentions or evil thoughts that we have. Just briefly, if anybody has questions, inshallah, please post them on the chat. We'll take them now. And one thing to mention, so tonight is a blessed night, Isra wa Miraj. MCC will have a program just in about 30 minutes on uh, also streamed on, on YouTube Live and I think Facebook Live. Check it out, inshallah. Um, just briefly about this night. It's a very, very special night. It's the night that the Prophet ascended to the heavens. He went from Mecca to Jerusalem to the heavens. And this is the night in which he was gifted the prayer. And he was gifted the prayer directly. It didn't come in the same form of revelation through uh, uh, the same methods that the Quran came. No, the Prophet was gifted the prayer. Um, and uh, I'm sure the Dr. Ali Akai will get into this, but there was this whole conversation. The Prophet came with 50 prayers. He went and Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, uh, uh, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam uh, told him, Yehuma cannot do 50. And he went back in increments of five or 10. There was like this kind of back and forth until Allah eventually legislated five. And Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam said, Yehuma cannot do five. And the Prophet said, I'm too shy to go back. And he uh, accepted the five prayers. And Allah said, it is five with the reward of 50. So use this night to connect to Allah. There's not any specific ibadat that I'm aware of that we're supposed to do on this night, but it is a good night, just like all the nights are, all the nights of Rajab especially, good nights to just pray, good night to make abundant dua, good night to learn about the events that took place, and it's a good night to make dua for yourself and for the ummah of the Prophet wasallam, and just to overall remember how much he وسلم, did for us. That One of the most amazing aspects of this night was that when he was in this conversation with Allah, the Prophet وسلم, according to most of the opinions of the ulama, he met Allah on this night. And Allah says, when we say in our prayer, that, that, that whole uh, up till the end, that he's, Allah, Allah says, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, that, that we repeat that, we follow that. Allah, Allah said to the Prophet, peace be upon you, O Nabi, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And the Prophet said, said As-salamu alayna. He said, As-salamu alayna, peace be upon us. As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. That upon us and all of the righteous servants. So when he was in this amazing, intimate meeting with Allah, he, sallallahu alayhi wa didn't just think about himself. He thought about the whole ummah. He said, peace be upon us. Right? That's us. Hopefully we can fall into that category. Even if we're not righteous. And, you know, I'm definitely not there. But hopefully I can just fall into that. As-salamu alayna. And may Allah eventually make us from the righteous. Right? But look at that. He remembered all of us. So the least we can do is remember his own mind and our du'as regularly and not argue. Don't waste time arguing about anything tonight or in any of the nights. Rajab is here. Sha'ban is coming up. There will be a group of people who try to argue about Sha'ban and its merits and this Sha'ban. Just don't engage. Ramadan is then coming up. Alhamdulillah, our Ummah is united about Ramadan, at least I think. And don't argue about moon sighting. Don't argue about any of that stuff. Just worship Allah. Follow whatever it is you're down to it. Ask Allah for guidance. Worship Him. Remember all of us in your du'as. May Allah make this time easy for you, full of light, full of khair, full of abundant, abundant, abundant openings for you and your family and cure any of, of you and any of us who are going through any difficulty, remove any anxieties and depressions and problems and sicknesses and issues that we might have and allow us to have abundant secrets and blessings poured upon us on this night and all the other nights. Allahumma barak ala fi rajab wa sha'ban wa balighna ramadan wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen jazakum ala khair do not see any questions people say assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum salam um, alhamdulillah thank you for, for the comment alhamdulillah so if, if there's no questions we'll just wait another 30 seconds uh, and inshallah we'll end <coughs> We are passionate of the truth. We know which is only a favor from Allah, but we have to control our emotions in doing that one, not to fall into argumentation. 
exactly to the to the to the person who mentioned that. Part of da'wah is not arguing. That's actually otherwise it's not da'wah because Allah says ila sabili rabbik that call to the way of your Lord with hikmah with wisdom, right? And he he tells Musa alayhi salam when he's going to do da'wah to Fir'aun, he says to Fir'aun, one of the worst like tyrant ever, he says to Fir'aun to be to be gentle with him. So it's not da'wah if it's with argument. That's something else. It's from it's not from the da'wah of the Prophet. It's something else entirely. So let's just keep that in mind. But totally agree that we have to control our emotions. We can't be passionate. Or we, 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 we can be passionate, but we cannot be intense and argumentative. We have to be merciful and we have to not be harsh. We cannot push people away from Islam. We need to bring people in and we will bring people in from our akhlaq, not from our from our intellectual rhetoric. It will come from our akhlaq, inshallah, our character. Someone says, Assalamu alaikum, alaikum, salam, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, okay, I don't think there are any more questions, inshallah. I will stay on for another little bit if anything pops up. Alhamdulillah. What do we do when people say on TikTok LGBTQ Muslims are going to a bad place? Do we argue? No. So, so um, uh, good question. Uh, look, this the topic of uh, uh, of homosexuality and uh, that that entire topic is a very very broad topic. But just briefly, only Allah knows where someone is going. Number one. Number two, there are many lists of harams. It is not about having a desire. It's about acting on the desire. So somebody who has a desire before they get married for any sex, opposite sex or the same sex, and they act on that desire, right? Let's say that somebody is not married and they are like a man and they uh, uh, sleep with a woman. Well, and that's not their wife. They That's haram. Same thing if they sleep with a man. That's haram, right? And so that's one thing to keep in mind. Second thing is there are many lists of haram sins or sorry, of major sins among which are homosexuality, our zina, it is uh, adultery is another sin. Disobeying your parents is considered one of the biggest sins in our religion. There are so many sins. Taking interest loans are it's a huge sin. So when people get into very specific topics, many times that is stemming from a disease of the heart that they just want to single out groups and they don't want to look at everything in its macro context. There are many big major sins. It's not worth narrowing in on very, very specific groups, getting very, very homophobic, getting angry with, you know, the specific groups because of that, right? The, the other thing is if somebody has that inclination, it's about, again, controlling the desire. The inclination of it in and of itself is not the problem we're talking about. The desire and acting on it is the problem. So when people start to take the place of Allah and say, this person is going to hell, this person is going to heaven, this whole group is in hell, this whole group is in heaven. It's like, oh, really? It didn't know that you, that, that you, that you are, you are God next to God. Are you, are you, is that what you are? Don't engage with people who try to legislate where people are going. Leave that to Allah. Allah knows what's in someone's heart and Allah knows where someone is going to end up. They might, people might make Tawbah. People will change inshallah. And there might be righteous Muslims who, and there are hadith that indicate this, who at the end of their life, they will change and may Allah protect us from this, but they will have a bad ending. And there could be Muslims who are really doing lots of haram. And at the end, Allah will change their life and they will have a good ending. And it is about the way that Allah seals our life, inshallah. But definitely don't argue. Don't argue about any controversial topic. Just don't waste your time. It's a desire. Don't waste your time by arguing about LGBT. Don't, it's not your, it's not, not, not my business, not your business. Let the, let the scholars discuss it and be merciful to people who are in that struggle. Be merciful to them. Be nice, right? Don't argue about controversial things Muslims argue about. It just, just tell people like, you know, go worship, go make dua for people. And you'll see the feelings you get in your heart. You will see the light that enters the heart when you spend time learning and worshiping Allah. That is way better than the tension and trepidation that enters the heart that is associated with arguing and all the other worries. I, I face this issue all the time. and People just want to argue about stuff. And I'm just like, I, I have that inclination as well. And I have to hold myself back. Like, how do I stop this? Because this is not uh, healthy for me, even mentally, let alone spiritually. Good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, sister. Okay. All right. Uh, and if there are any other questions, inshallah, please post them. Otherwise, please keep everybody in your du'as tonight. Um, inshallah, please check out this program that Dr. Ali Atai will be doing at 8 p.m. Eastern in about 22 minutes. Check it out until I think it's on YouTube for Isra Miraj. Hopefully, it will be recorded as well so we can watch it later, um, inshallah. What if you bring logical arguments just for someone to reason and come to the truth? So argument, the, the, the construct of an argument, the Quran is full of arguments, meaning Allah is presenting to us in a very, very logical way. This is why you should believe. 
right? So that's not a problem. When I say arguing, I don't mean the classical definition of argument. What I mean is the like this kind of intense, angry debate that people engage in to prove themselves right. So if you bring logical arguments, let's say that, what's an example here? Let's say somebody wants to know, um, uh, uh, let's say that somebody wants to know uh, interest. Let's talk about interest. Okay. Someone's like, Oh, I, uh, I don't really understand interest. Like, uh, is it haram? Is it not? Like, what is it about? Is it just me? Is it just like when the interest rate is really high? So you say, well, according to the scholars, the first thing you started, what is the consensus of the scholars? The consensus of the scholars is that interest based instruments are problematic. Then if they really need to look at the proofs again, it's really not actually for you and me to look into all the proofs because there's, hundreds of thousands of proofs. So we're not going to know them, most of them, right? Just like a doctor, when they're treating you, they're not going to tell you the different chemical formulas that came up in that treatment that result. When you take the coronavirus vaccine, you're not diagnosing all of the different ingredients in the vaccine. No, you are just taking the vaccine and you're hoping it's going to help and hoping it's going to work. Same thing with you go to the scholar and you say, what is the situation here? And they will tell you. So let's say with interest, though, if you really want to look, go in the Quran. Allah has many verses with the Baqarah and other ayahs that talk about interest. He says he wages war on the one who takes him and the, uh, Allah and his messenger wage war on the one who takes interest. Then you can look up different hadith. There are various hadith that indicate um, uh, the, 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 the problematic place that somebody who is giving interest or bearing witness to interest or taking interest will be. So you can present those to somebody and say, you know what, you should check these out. I think it's very dangerous. I think we should get out of interest. I think we should stop taking car loans and stop taking student loans and ideally convert any other loans into any Islamic loans that are possible. Right? You can do that. But if it's like an intense argument, and usually the argument comes with like on, contra on very controversial topics. Uh, logical proofs are fine, but just be careful not to let it get into a bad place. Right? Just be very careful because what happens is just like the, let's say somebody's going to engage in, in, in um, uh, zina, in, in haram, in like, a, like, like a, a sexual acts with somebody that they're not married to. It's not necessarily haram to like just you know, say hello or something like that. But it starts with the hello. Then it goes into a text conversation. Then it goes into a little bit more and a little bit more. And next thing you know, the haram act has happened. So you have to know yourself. Is the logical argument you are bringing going to lead to the haram argumentation that's going to happen? If so, don't do it. But if it's just to, and the person is receptive, mashallah, bismillah, and you are able to control yourself, uh, then we should, we can engage in that. So with our intention that people come to the truth. Yeah. Good question, Alhamdulillah. If there's anything else, inshallah, we will go ahead and answer it. La ilaha illallah. Or we'll try, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, may Allah forgive us. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody's preparation, inshallah, for Ramadan. It's going to begin soon. Uh, inshallah, it's something we need to start preparing for. Alhamdulillah. Okay, I don't see anything else. Jazakumallah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Sabarak ala humwa bi hamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha illallah. إلا أن أستغفرك أن أتوب إليك الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله. So we are going to continue on in this series where we've been talking about different desires that the human being has. And today we are going to move on to a desire that is very, very prevalent in the world that we live in. Uh, and this is the desire for fame and the desire for followers. So what we're really going to be focusing on is to understand why do we as human beings, why do we have this desire to be famous? Why do we have this desire to have so many followers? Why do we have the desire to have the most amount of views and to have the most amount of people uh, constantly watching us and praising us? And, and what is the spiritual cause for that? And what are the spiritual cures for this desire for fame and this desire for followers. So we're gonna to try to keep it brief, inshallah, and as you have questions come up, please feel free to post them uh, in the chat, whether you're following along on, on YouTube or on, on, on anywhere else. So alhamdulillah, you know, we live in a society where uh, followers and fame are really, really, really big part of the uh, culture that we live in. It has become universalized and almost democratized in the last 10 or so years, where as before it could be that, you know, you had to be among a very, very specific class of people. Um, you had to have a very, very certain type of privilege in order to kind of rise through the ranks and become famous. That's no longer the case. And now with the advent of more and more social media platforms uh, and with all of us having our smartphones, it's very, very easy to just 
put something out there and to try to become famous and to try to get followers and to try to get views and to try to get likes. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with trying to do some type of good or spreading some type of benefit using different types of platforms, it definitely becomes risky when you and I start to uh, desire this stuff. When we actually start to want more, I want more people following me. I want more. I want to be more famous. I want to be more in charge. I want to get uh, more and more people under my purview. I want to get more and more people listening to me. I want more and more power. I want more and more control. That actually becomes very dangerous for the human being. That's why it's called a desire. And that's why it's actually warned severely against in our religion, because what it can do is it can eventually go on to ruin you and me that you and me desiring people to follow us and people to be like us and to people to uh, uh, like everything it is that we say and everything it is that we do, it can actually end up ruining us spiritually. And this is important because you and I won't notice this when we're young, but as we get older and older and older, the more and more we let this get to us, the more and more the impacts of this start to happen and they start to creep in, the more and more we start to become stressed out and the more and more the spiritual ramifications start to take hold. And we've seen this happen in all realms of life. We see this happen where somebody begins their life in a very, very specific way. They begin their political career or their social media career or whatever it is. And initially, right, they're just trying to do something. And then from there, what happens is people start to like what they do and people start to inflate them a little bit. They, and they start to get a little bit of a bigger head, right? And then from there, it starts to become about how much money am I going to make through this? So we touched upon this in two, two classes ago where we talked about the desire for money and we talked about what the desire for money uh, is linked to and why the desire for wealth can very, very much ruin us because the Prophet Sallallahu he said in the Hadith, I mean, he indicated this, that uh, the love for money and love for wealth are worse for a Muslim than wolves are in a flock of sheep, among a flock of sheep, right? And so I see somebody says, Salaam Alaikum, Wa Alaikum, Salaam Wa Rahmatullah. Um, so the the love for wealth, the love for, for fame, the two are linked and we'll talk a little bit about that, but that can ruin you. It can really, really, really ruin you because your whole life becomes about pursuing empty things. That's at the first level. Remember, you and I are here for a very specific reason. We are here to try to get through this life and to try to get to the hereafter. We are not here to collect fortune. We're not here to collect a bunch of things. We're not here to collect a bunch of fame and a bunch of followers because guess what? When you die, your bank account doesn't go with you. Your social media following doesn't go with you. All the likes that we collected don't go with us. All the views that we collected don't go with us. None of that's going to go with us to our grave. All of our stocks, all of our investments, all of the money that we've gathered, none of that stuff is actually going to go with us when we pass away. So what is going to go with us? Our good deeds will go with us. The amount that we gave away will go with us. These types of things are what go with us when we pass away. So the perspective of the Muslim is always a perspective of what am I going to have? Not in, in the life that I'm living right now. No, it's what am I going to benefit from after? What am I going to benefit from when I leave this world? Because the afterlife, that is at the end of the day, what matters. That Allah says in the Quran that the akhirah is better for you, right? It is better for you than where you are. Uh, right now. So that is the reason, one of the reasons why this desire for fame and status and followers and rank and all these types of things are very, very uh, condemned. And we'll talk now a little bit about what it does. So what it does as you and I start to spiritually, the impact that it has as you and I start to follow our desires is it starts to ruin you slowly and slowly and slowly. And so people become very much destroyed by searching for this type of stuff. And we see in the hadith of the Prophet says that love for rank and property causes hypocrisy to grow in the soil as water causes like plants and leeks and other types of things to grow. So just like water will cause certain things to grow in the soil, the love for rank, the love for followers, the love for people watching you and people being and basically kind of sort of in a very, very mini way, mini worshiping people, that love in the spiritual heart, in the soul it causes hypocrisy to grow. Now, what is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is to do one thing on the outside, but to actually be somebody else on the inside. And why is it that this grows? Well, one of the reasons it could be, Allah knows best, is because when you and I are trying to do things for other people, we are not necessarily doing things sincerely only for the sake of Allah. That we require a certain amount of work on ourselves first and foremost. We have to work on ourselves before we start doing things publicly 
because otherwise the hypocritical aspect can come in. And even if we still do all that, the hypocritical aspect can still come in. But we, that's where we ask Allah for protection and we ask for assistance. And um, uh, Allah says in the Quran that we have made the hereafter for those who do not seek elevation on the earth. They're not going about and seeking elevation. Like, what does that mean? That sounds, you know, very, very like a, a, a big, big word, big phrase, right? What does it mean? Allah is saying that if you and I are not going out and actively seeking that I want to run the show, I want to be the boss, I want to have be the most popular, I want to be the most famous, that that is who the hereafter is meant for. And this applies to all aspects of our life. So we really have to think about this, that the culture that we live in, it glorifies and magnifies people who are popular. It glorifies and magnifies people who are famous. It glorifies and magnifies people who have some type of inherent um, uh, popularity or fame about them. Right. And maybe they're in the like, for example, these days, the royal family, these types of things, these types of things are all ir irrelevant. What does it matter whether somebody's popular? We know this in high school. We really see it in high school. I remember in high school, high school was a scarring place, very weird place, because it was all about like, oh, what are the popular kids doing? You know, popular kids going to this party and this. And, and dude, at the end of the day, like nobody even remembers the popular kids anymore. I mean, and if we were among the popular kids, OK, cool. But like. What did we do that actually is going to benefit us later in life? Most of the people that I knew that when, when we were in any of those circles, most of the stuff that those of us who got caught up in that stuff, it, it hurt us, right? It ends up hurting you. But that's all irrelevant. Why does it matter? Who cares? These days, everybody's talking about the royal family and this thing and that thing. I mean, why are we giving so much attention to, the, to, to, to these monarchs who, who colonize so much of the world? They're irrelevant. They should be completely irrelevant. I mean, the wrongs that they do, we need to notice them and we need to call them out. But like they've been doing wrongs since for the last, you know, many, many centuries. The fact that they even get attention is a problem, right? But it's because, oh, they're famous and there is this fame. And same thing with celebrities. You see this all the time. A celebrity does something and everybody's talking about it. Who cares? What, why, do we, why is it relevant to us? When you and I die, is that person going to be relevant to us? No. So why do we give so much of our worldly attention then to that? It's because they're famous. And when they're famous, there's a there's an aspect of we elevate them. And actually what ends up happening, and spiritually, this is something mentioned in our religion, that what ends up happening is they become a mini god that we worship. They do. They become a mini idol that we worship. That I'm worshiping this athlete. I have to know everything about them. I'm worshiping this celebrity. I'm worshiping this president. I'm worshiping this per And it's not that you're bowing down to them. Actually, when you make sajda, right, in, in prayer, you're bowing down to Allah. But when you spend all of your time and when you and I spend all of our time thinking about something and always just being obsessed with it, in a mini way, we have that mini worship. And that's what the desire is. Because Allah says in the Quran, have you seen the one who takes their hawa, their desire, as their Lord? So the one who takes their desire as their Lord is the one who gives something preference over giving preference to Allah, right? And so we have to think about the danger of this stuff. And now what ends up happening is we grow up in a culture that magnifies this stuff. And then we ourselves want to be magnified. We ourselves want to be elevated. We grew up in a culture that emphasizes so much on, oh, fame and popularity and rank. And now it's so easy. Everybody wants followers. Everybody wants likes. And then we grow up and that's what we think we have to do. And we end up in this stressful pursuit all the time of these superfluous, empty things. And it ends up impacting us because we don't focus on the big stuff that matters in life. So this is something just for us to keep in mind, for us to reflect on. This is not something that goes away immediately, but we have to at least think about it and we have to know about it, right? And so let's talk about why, the spirit, spiritually, why the human being wants this, as the scholars mentioned. And again, as anybody has comments or questions or anything, just please post them in the chat. So why do we want it? The human being, what you and I want is we, event, we, we, we have a desire deep down inside of us to want um, everything. That's really what it is. And so um, we wonder why do people want fame more than they want wealth, right? So you get to a point in life where you're rich, let's say. We see this a lot. People are rich. But at some point, the, fame, the, the wealth is not enough and the money is not enough. Now I got to be, I have to become famous. I have to have, be, have a certain type of profile. And even higher than that is the people, the desire for power. After you become a certain level of fame or have a certain level of fame, you want a certain amount of power and control. We'll talk a little bit about why that happens. Slowly what ends up happening is you and I, just like we have control over a bunch of things, so like, oh, I have this thing and that thing, now I acquired this, I acquired that, I got this, I want new clothes, I want new this. We're just always buying stuff, right? There's just this desire for wealth and I want new cars all the time and I just keep getting, keep getting. 
what ends up happening is that that the human being also desires now control and influence over people's hearts and over people's attention. So it's like, oh, I got this much now. How many people can I get to follow me? How many people's attention can I get? Oh, I have 20 people. I have a thousand people. I have 10 million people. How many people's hearts have I captured? You can't buy your way to someone's someone's attention. It's not going to work. You have to influence your way. They call these days, everybody's an influencer. You have to influence your way to them. And the more and more I have, the better it is. And you start thinking of yourself as something. You elevate yourself. And it doesn't matter what you, where we are at in life, that elevation does happen. Um, because people, they give their worth, they base their worth on this many times. You and I have been introduced to people like, oh, have you met this person? They have 1 million followers. Okay, great. Well, if the people fall, if they're, if the people are following them towards something good and they haven't, their ego is not full of themselves and they're not full of themselves, right? Okay, mashallah. But if they're following to like a, a to hell, frankly, like to, 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 to sin, I mean, none of that stuff is relevant. And even if they're leading someone to good, but they're full of themselves, they think they're all that. We see this happen all the time in the Muslim community. Somebody will achieve a certain level of, of rank and followers and people and uh, uh, kind of uh, being influenced by them. And then they go off and they do something super corrupt. They like embezzle money or they, um, you know, uh, have like a, a scandal by like having secret wives and this type of thing. I mean, what is that? Where do you find that in the in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? You don't find it because these people, they didn't prioritize correctly. They went too quickly after fame and the wrong things without grounding themselves. This is why grounding is so important. So this is now let's walk through a little bit of this kind of deep, deep spirituality that's linked to this desire for, for, for followers and the desire for fame. This, uh, and if, it, if this gets at all complex, just please post a question and we'll do our best to address it. So the human being, you and I actually have a very, very deep spiritual nature. We have a very angelic nature and we have a, have a, have a nature that is directly from the divine presence because Allah says in the Quran that he says that the spirit of my Lord, he says the, sp the spirit is from the command of my Lord. That's what he says, that he tells the Prophet to say that say that the spirit, the ruh is from the command of my Lord. Now, what does that mean? That means that deep down inside of us, we have something inside of us that has a, a, a very, very high nature, right? Because it's from the command of our Lord. Now, every, all of us at the same time, the soul, the nafs, so that's the spirit, that's the elevated part. Then you have what's called the nafs, the ego. The nafs has a desire for it in deep down inside of it, as Allah says in the Quran, right? That Fir'aun, he says, uh, that I am your Lord most high. The nafs has that desire. The nafs deep down inside wants to be the Lord most high. So Pharaoh was the personification, the embodiment of the nafs. So he had no hesitation in saying such an arrogant and very, very frankly problematic statement that I am your Lord most high, even though Allah is the Lord most high. Allah is the only Lord, right? But Pharaoh had no problem saying that. Then human nafs has a tendency deep down inside to actually want that same thing that Pharaoh wanted, to be the boss, to be in charge, to have as many people. But you and I know that we can't have that. We can't have control over everything. We can't have control over the sunrise and the sunset. We can't have control over the planets and the stars. We can't do that. So then what we end up doing is because we can't have control over all of those things, we settle for what we can have control over. And that is we can have control over how many people we are able to influence and how many hearts we are able to capture. That we can have control over. So then we start desiring that. And remember, there's a big difference between somebody who starts this with the wrong intention and someone who says, okay, look, I know that there's risk is out there, but I'm going to work on myself. Big difference. Allah does not tell us to be perfect from the get-go, but he does tell us to have a good intention and to be sincere from the get-go. That is that much God tells us. So when we go out and about and doing what we're doing, we can't get so influenced by Western culture and by Western uh, pedagogy and by the way that these that the, that the West, frankly, generally speaking, a culture dominated by white men that they have that they're that they're trying to teach us to do. We can't let them influence us. No, we have to have our own ways, our own paths. So if their technologies are created in such a way that everything is about followers and everything is about views and everything is about likes and everything is about influence, okay, we can use it, but we got to know like when it's going to get to our head and we got to know what to use it for. And to not use it in the same way that is where, where it can become negative um, or, or, or negatively impact us, right? So eventually what we end up doing is we want control and influence over people's hearts and their attention span. The more we can get that, the more we, the more 
elevated we become. Like, oh, yeah, I got that. Okay, I got one more, one more, one more. And eventually it becomes a thing. I got 10,000 more, 20,000 more, and then more and more followers, more and more fame. And that is the, that is the essence of the problem. That's not where our heart's supposed to focus. No, 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 no. That's, you and I are not supposed to be focused on that. We are not. We are supposed to be focused on worshiping Allah and getting through this life without trying to collect all these things. But the one who collects themselves, they will eventually get ruined. That's what's going to end up happening. And how does that happen? Just, just let's talk about where it's happening today. It happens all the time that the, the people who get the most famous and they get the most amount of power and the most amount of followers, they become full of themselves. They become super full of themselves. We're seeing this happening right now with you know, certain political figures here in the United States that there were moments of extreme fame, extreme popularity, extreme amount of followers, a lot of, po- lot of power and arrogance and control. And then what ends up happening? You think that you're invincible, but what goes up must come down. And so now these people, they get exposed, they get in scandals, they get caught in their sexual abuse and sexual assault scandals. You will rarely find somebody who's risen to the top in these types of ways that has not done something wrong, majorly wrong along the way, hurt people, abused people, assaulted people. I mean, it's so rare in the time that we live in, You'll, but they start to get exposed because the, 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 uh, that, that, that fake kind of image that they've put out can only last for so long until some people realize not, this is who this person really is. Now their time, it's time for them to get exposed. And Allah eventually does expose many of these people. And if he doesn't expose them in this life, the hypocrites are exposed in the next life. We already know that they're exposed in the next life, right? But that happens many, many, many times that, the, that, that you become, you think you're invincible because of the number of followers, because of the fame, because of where you're at. And then slowly life starts to, and we ask Allah for protection for all of us our brothers and sisters and all of the Muslims that this never happens, but that what ends up happening is slowly and slowly and slowly, right? The, exactly. Someone says the facade can only last for so long. Totally agree. Thank you for mentioning that. That, that fakeness can only last for so long because you're just like, dude, that's not really who you are. You put on a facade and guess what? Even if it does last, let's say that somehow you can get it to last for as long as possible, right before you die. It's not going to last past your grave. And all those millions of followers are not going to visit your grave. How many people visit the grave of celebrities and like actually do something beneficial for them? No. The Muslims, we have people come to our graves, they read Quran, they make dua for us when they're praying, all this type of stuff. But like how many people does that happen, right? Uh, uh, for at, when, when, when fame becomes the primary motive. That's not, it doesn't happen. It does not happen, right? So that is something for us to keep in mind. This will ruin us. It's just a matter of when. So we have to know what the cure is. What is the harm? So first and foremost, the cure for this type of thing, the cure for this desire for fame, this desire for popularity, this desire for followers. Just to just reorient your mind and reorient my mind, we have to start thinking this is a bad thing. I cannot be, this is not my, cannot, this cannot be my motive. I might have a deep intention. Let's say that you are, you know, um, teaching people or you, or you are um, uh, doing something in which you need to get, you need to try to uh, access as many people as possible. So you make like a Facebook page or something, or you're like an Instagram page or something, and you're trying to sell something for your business or whatever it is. They're trying to do, okay, nothing wrong with that. But if you start to become like, you're so worship, you're literally worshiping, oh my God, oh my God, I have this many followers. Oh my God, I have this many likes. Oh my God. And you're just like, that's all you get. You literally get off on that. There's a problem because you should not get that excited about anything related to this dunya, to this lower world. We might get, we might, that might happen because we're weak. I know I get excited about stuff like that because I'm weak, but I got to know the whole goal of spirituality is to know what the top, uh, uh, know what the kind of top goal is, right? And then work our way from where we're at. So like, if I know this is the aspirational goal, this is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallam, but I'm like all the way on the ground. One day I just got to get as close as possible. I mean, I'm never going to reach the full nearness but i just got to get as close as possible and allah says those who strive in our way surely we shall guide them so for anybody who has an intention to get closer to allah to become more sincere to stop desiring followers and fame let's just make that intention right now to make that intention right now somebody asked a question where are you from uh, i'm from i'm from the, the originally i'm from pakistan but i live in in the bay area uh, in san francisco bay area so that is the cure. Uh, that is the first cure. Just realize how problematic it is. The second cure is to just realize how harmful this is. The harm of rank and, and this, this, pe- this kind of empty, hollow followers and, and rank and all this type of, the harm. What is the harm? You're all, first of all, you will always be tripping about 
when something goes wrong, what's going to happen here? What are people going to think here? What are they going to say, right? Oh, what are they saying in the comments about me? What, how much are they hating on me? How much are they praising me? That's just going to occupy your mind. And I guarantee you it'll eventually get to the point where it occupies your sleep and prevents you from sleeping. It will get to that point because it's not natural for the human being to have that type of things always occupying their mind. And unfortunately, we see this happen in the celebrity culture that we live in, that many of these celebrities, they end up getting to a point where like drugs, and significant, we're talking significant drugs become their recourse because they the, the 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 stress of the press and the paparazzi and the followers and the fame is not something that's manageable. It's not manageable. You can manage it for a little bit of time, but you cannot manage it sustained for a long period of time without at some point impacting you spiritually, and that and then at some point it will impact somebody psychologically um, uh, and 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 deeper at a mental level. Uh, and that's just a reality that all of us, especially those of us. We're young. We're growing up with this technology. We just have to keep that in mind. This stuff is not sustainable over a long period of time if we don't use it in a in a in a healthy way. We have to know principled ways and healthy ways of engagement. I'm not saying we leave all this stuff. We use it in healthy ways, right? So that's the second thing to keep in mind that we have to know the stress that it's going to bring, right? The third thing is we have to know what danger lies ahead if we embark on this journey. But okay, you it, it's it sounds. Um, it sounds cool, like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I got, I'm famous, I got the followers, I drive the bands, I'm gonna buy this car, I'm gonna become like, you know, all the, and then eventually I'm gonna get power, I'm gonna be the top dog, I'm gonna come control, like, all that sounds great until you realize that, like, the more and more, if you don't manage it, the nafs, the spiritual soul deep down inside, it just becomes black and dirty because you become arrogant and full of yourself. Look at the past president of the United States, like, just look, look at him. I mean, just how, I don't even see, need to say anymore, but just look at what, look at what his journey of life led him to, right? And where he's at right now that like, yeah, you might have the fame, you might be in power, you might have all this stuff, but like, dude, I mean, where are you at really? I mean, spiritually, where are you at, right? I'm always surprised at like the Christian, uh, the, the people who are, who are, you know, Christians uh, who, who, who can vote for somebody like that because, you know. It goes against every single ethical teaching. They're, they're, that person's character goes against every single ethical teaching that does exist in in the, the sayings of Jesus, um, peace be upon him, and, and, and the Bible and whatnot. But you know that's a whole different topic. The fact is is that uh, we have to keep this in mind, right? So the third thing that will help us is we have to know that we will die. That will help us a lot. And I know this is like a heavy topic, but at the end of the day. If we can remember that we're going to die, all this stuff becomes a little bit easier. Because even if people were to literally worship you, like you could have 5 million, let's say 3 billion people following you, and they worship you, and they prostrate to you, and all the stuff that some of these people desire. When you die, that's all going to go away, and nobody's going to do it anymore. And it's not going to benefit you even if they do do it. It'll actually just hurt you, because Allah doesn't like that type of stuff, right? So it, we have to just have that perspective in mind. Right. And the last thing is, if we're serious about working on this and we know it's damaging our heart, we will slowly leave the places, right, that people are overdoing it with regards to praise for us and with regards to following us and whatnot. If they're overdoing it and we will slowly leave or take breaks from time to time because we know, hey, this isn't good for me spiritually. I got to work on myself. Everybody knows. And the last thing I'm going to say, inshallah, will end. And if anybody has questions or comments, please post them because I'll get to them right now, inshallah. The last thing I'll mention is you and I know where we're at spiritually. We know what hurts us spiritually. The way to gauge if something is hurting you spiritually is if when you do it or after you do it, you feel a certain trepidation and a certain anxiety, right? And that, that, that comes with it. You know then that there's something likely spiritually off with regards to it. And the way to know if something is beneficial, and again, this is a general rule Allah knows best, is if a calmness and tranquility descends when you were doing something or after you have done something, Generally speaking, that will be spiritually beneficial for you. So you and I just have to know where we're at spiritually. Ramadan is coming. We have about a month till Ramadan. Let's take this time to invest, to work on ourselves, to get rid of some of these deep desires and to, to, to know that it does, at the end of the day, in our 60, 70, 80 year lifespan, whatever our lifespan is, we got to know what's important. We have to prioritize what's important. We can't let the culture and the society that we live in brainwash us into thinking that superfluous, superficial things like followers, like fame, like having a lot of power, like having a lot of control over people, that we can't brainwash ourselves into thinking that that's important. No, we have to know it's important. What's important is that we are in this life 
to try to, to do our best to worship Allah and to eventually meet Allah in a good state. And when we compare million, 10 million, 100 million years in the next life, again, remember the next life is eternal. There's no number, but let's just say you assign the number 10 million because it's hard to quantify eternal eternality. You compare 10 million years to 70 years. It cancels out. The 70 literally means absolutely nothing. Because so if you spent your 70 years, just most of them in a good state, and even if you didn't spend most of them in a good state, you tried your best towards the later part of your years and you repented, you just did your best. Inshallah, all of that eternality, that 10 million years and longer will be good and will go well for you. But if you spent that 70 years in a bad state, dude, was it really worth it? Was all that stuff really worth it? Was ruining your not your, your soul really worth it then for the negative consequences that could come after? That's just something we have to keep in mind and we have to know our focus. We have to know what we're trying to do. We have to know what we're trying to accomplish. And inshallah, let's keep that in mind. Uh, may Allah bless uh, all of you. Alhamdulillah. If anybody has any questions or comments, please post them. Otherwise, we will end. I know it's Maghrib time here, at least where I'm at. Um, Alhamdulillah. So we'll go ahead and proceed to end if there's no quick questions. Uh, Jazakumallah khair. And uh, somebody had asked if we can do more lives. Inshallah, we will do more. Inshallah. All right, cool. So well, I'll do a quick dua while we wait for any questions. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barakatuh. Sayyid Muhammadin wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Bismillah. Illa dhilai dhilu ma'i sumi shayun fil ardi wa la fil samai wa sami lani rabban a'tina fil dunya hasanata wa fil akhirati hasanata wa kinna adha ban naar. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Kareem, Ya Halim, Ya Allah. We ask, Ya Allah, that you accept us, Ya Allah, that you pardon us, Ya Allah, that you cleanse our hearts, Ya Allah, and remove any difficulties and any any spiritual impurities and any dirtiness from our hearts, Ya Allah, and allow us to get near to you and allow us to be good people, Ya Allah, who are clean towards towards other Muslims, who are who are people of good character, who are people of good akhlaq, who are people of gentleness, who are people of of, of, of kindness, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, allow us to people who are sincere, Ya Allah, with you, who do not desire the life of this dunya, Ya Allah, who do not desire... The, the 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 followers and fame and and all the other things it is ya allah that could ruin us ya allah you know best what ruins us ya allah so allow us ya allah to be in a state of of, of purity and allow us ya allah to be in a state of your protection and give us everything good that the prophet system asks for and we ask for protection for everything evil that he asks for and we ask you allow us to prepare in this month of Sha'ban, for this month of Ramadan, and allow us to reach Ramadan as it approaches. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Um, and I don't see any questions. I will wait just for a second here in case anything pops up. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, please post them in the chat and we'll get to them, inshallah. Okay, alhamdulillah. Well, then if I don't, I don't see anything, so we'll see you all next time, inshallah. We're doing this every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Pacific time. We do this this short class, 20, 30 minutes on a different desire. Uh, and we'll wrap it up before Ramadan and we'll do one right before Ramadan and Ramadan prep as well, inshallah. Inshallah. Right. So we are going to continue on this topic we've been chatting about um, around the different desires that the human being has. And we have been covering the apparent desires. They're like very, very obvious desires that you and I have, what are those desires? Those are the desires um, for food, the desire to always be eating, the desire for drugs, the desire for drinking, the desire for partying, uh, our sexual appetites, our sexual desires, the uncontrolled lust that we have. Uh, those are some of the examples of the apparent desires. We've, we've also chatted about the desire for money and the desire for wealth and just kind of always chasing after dunya and not really ever stopping. Uh, so those are some of the very, very obvious apparent ones We've been chatting about some of the remedies and the ways that the human being can go about resisting those desires and channeling them in the right direction. So just as a quick review before we get into the topic for today, uh, when it comes to desires, the goal is to channel them in the right direction. And so there are cures, you could say, for each of these desires. God did not create the human being to have zero desires, not that you have to eliminate them. It's not when you, for example, you have the desire to eat all the time. Okay, God wants us to control our appetite. He doesn't want us to stop eating, though, but he wants us to control the appetite and to try to eat permissible food. The desire for sex, the sexual desire. God doesn't want us to 
uh, not have that at all, he wouldn't have created it in us. But he wants us to channel it in a halal direction, in the right direction, right? To eventually go and get married um, and to not, uh, you know, end up uh, uh, hooking up with people and in affairs and these types of things. So those are examples of ways that the human being channels their desires in the right direction. However, if the desire gets out of control, then rather than worshiping God, we began to worship our desires. And that's very, uh, it's a very, very subtle difference, but it ends up happening because we just worship ourselves. We worship a specific desire that we might have. And so as you and I are on this path of spirituality, we might, you know, we're all in different paths, but we might be in a place where we are trying to now work on a bit more of the inner parts of ourselves, right? Once you kind of get a couple things going in, in our religion, uh, it starts to become about the inner work. Uh, the inner work is the most important work. The one who can clean themselves internally, the one who can purify themselves internally, the one who, of course, Allah purifies, they're going to be the successful ones, as Allah mentions in the Quran. So that's all about the, the work of controlling our thoughts, controlling our desires, trying to not let our desires control us. The strong person, just like the Prophet said, he said, the strong one is not the one who can defeat, who's like super uh, big and can defeat someone in wrestling. The strong one is the one, and he was giving an example of anger. So the strong one is the one who can control their anger. Anger is a desire that many of us have left uncontrolled and it results in many, many, many problems. You see this problem in the Muslim community all the time, for example, unfortunately, and really frankly in other communities as well, that angry people create disruptive families, very, very tense households, stressful situations at home, and God forbid some of them even get to the point of uh, hitting their, their partner, hitting their spouse, uh, because they're not able to control their anger. And so that's why controlling ourselves and controlling our desires becomes so important. So again, we've been talking about the apparent desire, so now we're going to get a little bit into the subtle desire. We're really going to just spend one, you know, class on this, um, and then we'll do, you know, we're, we're going to try to aim to go for about 20 or so minutes, and then we'll do some question and answer um, at the end. So for, and, and feel free to post questions in the chat as, as we go along. So for... Uh, the subtle desires. So these are actually very, very tricky because these are desires that you and I have with regards to religious acts and religious worship. Uh, so example of this, this is a desire that a human being might have to want someone to notice when you worship God. So you're praying and, uh, you know, you're praying in like a, a, a mosque or something and somebody walks in and you might have been just like kind of whatever praying and then you down suddenly fix yourself and you get up and, and, you know, try to present yourself in a very, very specific way. Now, why did we do that? God was watching the whole time, right? Our angels on our shoulders were also watching. Why did we do it when a human being came into the picture? It's because we have a desire for someone to notice us. We have a desire for someone to notice our religious act. It's very, very tricky. And this, in the social media type of culture that we live in, where everything is shared and everybody wants everyone to know everything it is that we're doing, this is very dangerous. Because someone who doesn't do an act sincerely, that act can become more and more and more nullified until it's eventually gone. It doesn't even count because that act wasn't for the sake of Allah, right? So this is why the inner work becomes so critical here and becomes uh, so important. So the other example of this is if somebody uh, wants to give charity, right? It's a great thing to give charity. But if someone gives charity just so other people can say, oh, look at you, you give so much, you're so generous. And you say, yeah, yeah, I know, look at me, I'm great, right? Again, it's a desire for people to notice you. You didn't do it for the sake of Allah. It's very, very, very important for us to keep this in mind. So this eventually results in what's called subtle aspects of hypocrisy, subtle aspects of hypocrisy, right? And hypocrisy is very, very dangerous because you and I don't want to be hypocrites. God warns very, very clearly in the Quran uh, talking about why hypocrites are, are are amongst the worst types of people, right? So what what type of hypocrisy happens here? You might, when people are around and when people know what you're doing, you might do more worship. You might do more acts of uh, more thicker. You might read more Quran. You might, you know, really make it an act to like show people, oh, look, I'm reading the Quran. And, uh, like I have a Quran here. If I'm like, oh, look at me, I'm reading Quran and I'm so you know, and, and it's Ramadan and I did this many khatam of Quran and like you really want to just show off. All that worship is just boom, boom, gone. Because you showed off and Allah says that you, in many hadith indicate this, you get the reward from the people praising you. That was the reward you wanted. You didn't get the reward um, from, you got the reward from people praising you. You did not get the reward uh, when you actually should have gotten it, right? Or when you wanted it, 
which is on the day of judgment because you saw it in this life. So that can happen, right? Then there's also, for example, you just kind of present yourself in a very, very specific way religiously that you want people to know, look at how religious I am, right? So it might be in the way that you dress. And again, you're doing it for the wrong intention. There's one thing to dress, doing things for the sake of God, but there are other ways to do things such that you just want everybody to notice you. And if you do that and you just say like, you know, you might have people like, oh, I'm just so tired today. I've just been, I've been like awake since, since the hundred times I've been awake since like 5 a.m. And they said that because they wanted you to be like, oh, mashallah, you prayed to hajjud today. You prayed to the hajjud. There's a nafil prayer that's prayed before uh, in the last third of the night before Salat al-Fajr comes in. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I've been praying it. Like, and you feel, you get happy that they notice. And you start to, you know, people comment like, oh, you're so tired today. What's wrong? Oh yeah, I've just been up since so long. I've just been doing all these religious acts and just, you know, or like it's a not Ramadan and you're just like, oh, I'm just my fast. I'm just fasting all the time. I'm always doing extra fasts because, you know, I got to do them because I want to get, you know, you, you might have good intention initially. I want to get close to Allah, but you ruin it because the, the desire wasn't in control. This is very, very important for us to control our desires. So um, there was for an example, uh, there was a, somebody asked, can you pray the Hajjah 20 minutes before Fajr? Yeah, you can pray the Hajjah even one minute before Fajr. Like you can pray the Hajjah at any moment um, before Fajr enters. So I would try to make it, you know, even if you can't catch proper prayer, if you're awake before Fajr, just make dua at that time and then get your Fajr in, uh, inshallah. And, and Fajr time as well is a great time for making dua. Um, very, very meritorious times. The more, just the mo most important thing is the more struggle that's required spiritually, like to wake up or to do something, the more benefit you're going to get in that act of worship, which is why you have prayers that have such significant rewards attached to them, right? Um, and which is why you have months like Ramadan coming up where there's so much struggle, 30 days of fasting, but there's so much reward attached to it. So keep that in mind for really all actions. So there was a story of a man, um, you know, he was praying in the masjid and, uh, you know, he was praying, whatever. And then he heard, you know, somebody walk into the masjid and he like fixed his prayer and he's like, oh, someone's here. I gotta make sure they notice me. And um, they, they, they fixed them. He fixed his prayer. He kind of tried to for, you know, pretend like he was really concentrating, got into this really deep state. And, you know, he finished the prayer and he was waiting so he could see the person so he could wait for them to praise him. And he noticed that it was, it was a, a dog that, that walked, um, uh, uh, walked in the masjid and the dog, you know, obviously the dog had no benefit, but look at this man. I mean, what kind of state are you in that God is in front of you? God is everywhere and you are praying to God. And yet you thought someone walked in and you beautified what you were doing and it ended up being a dog, right? Um, so uh, that's that's something for us to to keep in mind, right? We, we should do things for the sake of God. And somebody mentioned, I grew up Catholic and I'm learning about Islam. Mashallah, that's really, really great. Uh, anything it is, may may Allah and may may God make this easy for you to learn and uh, hopefully facilitate your journey um, towards whatever path is best for you. And inshallah, that is the path uh, of Islam, uh, inshallah. So, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to post them. So why is this dangerous, right? Because why you're pretending, you're pretending and you can't, you know, and who are you pretending in front of? You are mocking Actually, you are not just pretending, you're mocking who? You're mocking the Lord of the worlds. You don't think he knows what's inside me? You don't think he knows what's inside you? But we pretend, we pretend in front of him. And he knows what's going on inside. We're really just doing it for everybody else, but we're pretending. Not only are we doing, there's one thing like the obvious hypocrite, like the person who like, like just admits, yeah, I don't really do anything for God's sake. I just do it because of other people. But there's like a whole depth, deeper level of somebody who's pretending and then actually mocking God. How do you mock God? How could we do that, right? Like, look, what kind of person, uh, what kind of state do we have to be in to mock God? But we end up doing it regularly. And all of us have this inside of us uh, in some way uh, uh, or another. So we have to really think about this. That if you really knew who was watching you, which is Allah, why does it matter who other, but other people know what you've done, right? Why does it matter that you have to share all these different things on Instagram and on Facebook? And, you know, I did this and I did this. And people don't realize that sharing when it's something beneficial is fine, but it's very, you have to be very careful. The more you share your deeds, the more, the more happy you get when people are happy about you doing deeds, good deeds, the more your deeds start to become, they start to become at risk because you should be doing them for the sake of Allah. You should not need other people's praise. 
But in this praise focused culture that we are in, sometimes we end up being, you know, very uh, much in trouble because of this. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he indicated this trait, this, this for, the formal name of this trait, this desire, the subtle desire is known in English as ostentation and in Arabic as riya. Riya is this, is this trait that we are talking about. We want to purify ourselves up. So the Prophet ﷺ, he, he indicated that this trait is more hidden inside of you than the footsteps of an ant on a black, crawling on a black rock in the darkness of the night. So think about this, an ant, an ant is already small little, right, creature. It's already black and then it's crawling on a black rock. And not in the daytime when the sun is visible, but on a black rock in the darkness of the night. So like the Prophet is indicating to us here that this is very hidden inside of the human soul. This is a very, very hidden trait. So if it's a hidden trait, we have to do something to try to um, purify uh, ourselves of this trait, right? So let's talk a little bit about how we do that. There are degrees of this. The strongest degree that somebody might have, the worst level of this is that you only do religious things when other people are noticing. That's it. You don't do them otherwise. Like you literally only will do them. If someone's watching me, cool, I'll do it. Someone's going to, a lot of people will be at the mosque. I'm going to pray. Uh, but otherwise you don't pray. You don't do anything. Like people come over to your house. Oh, I'm going to pray now, but you never pray on your own because you don't really, you know, you're not really into that, into it. That's that's obvious hypocrisy. The second level is you do it still at other points, but you get happy when people find out about you doing something. So people find out about you doing something that's like different than what a lot of other people in society do extra prayers or, or even your basic prayers these days. And, um, you get happy, like, oh yeah, I know. I mean, I'm so, and you, you feel subtly, you'll, 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 you'll neglect, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, outwardly reject it, most people, but inwardly, you feel like, oh my God, look at me, I'm so this, I'm so that, right? So that's the another level of this. The third level of this is that you, of this, of this trait, of this subtle desire of wanting people to notice you, is you expect people to treat you differently because of your quote unquote religious deeds and your religious status. So you say, I am, well, I'm, I mean, this could be as something as, as limited as you expect them to give salam to you first. I am so-and-so. I, I uh, deserve them to, for them to say salam to me. Don't they know I'm learned? Don't they know I'm, I'm the hafiz of the Quran? Don't they know I lead the prayer? Like, you know what I mean? You expect that subtly. You might not say it, but you subtly expect, expect that. And know this, that the Prophet ﷺ would always hasten to give salam first, even though he's the greatest creation, the greatest human being ever created and the, uh, uh, the, the most amazing person, the most perfect of Allah's creation, sallallahu alayhi wa And yet he would rush to give salam to everybody first, even though people should, you know, uh, rush to give him salam. So that is a subtle hypocrisy inside of somebody. And then another tr level of this is that you desire a very, very specific title. Right. So if you are learned, you really want people to know you're learned. So you're like, I'm, you're going to, you're going to call yourself Sheikh. You're going to uh, give yourself a title, right? You might introduce yourself as, a, oh, I am Imam so-and-so. I am Ustada so-and-so, right? It's very, very ajib when people do this. I see sometimes I literally met people who like introduce themselves with a title like I am Imam this, this, and that. It's like, or I am Mufti this, this, and that. It's like, well, maybe in other people's eyes, they might view you as that. But in your eyes, you should not view yourself as anything. You should not view yourself as anything. But this is a very, very subtle desire, a very subtle desire, because you start to want title, you want recognition. This all stems from wanting praise. You know, this happens in other traditions as well, right? I am um, you know, this minister, I'm minister so-and-so, I am priest so-and-so, I am rabbi so-and-so, I am, right? and you, you think that you are doing things for the sake of God, but in reality, you're just doing things for the sake of people. Alhamdulillah, that our religion and, our, and the Prophet uh, وسلم, Muhammad وسلم, has uh, given us the cure for these things that many times uh, really mess up religious communities uh, in the time that we are living in. So this is something for us to keep in mind. So let's reflect on this a little bit. I'm just going to just pardon me for just a second. I'm just going to turn the light on in this room. It's getting dark. The sun is setting. One second. Sorry about that. All right. So the 
this is very dangerous, especially if you start to label yourself, right? So like, I've also seen this before, but people will actually label themselves on their website or on their, you or on their, um, Facebook and they'll give themselves the title of like who they are. Right. I am Stad this. I'm that's one thing. If you have like a, like, like, like somebody who's doing that for you, but it's totally another of you yourself are elevating yourself to a very, very certain position. This is not from the way of the, of the traditional, of the traditional scholars um, from everything that I've understood. So now this can happen at different points in the religious journey in the deed itself. So Imam Ghazali, he mentions that this desire for people to notice you can happen at the beginning of the deed. And this means you do the deed entirely for someone else, right? So like at the beginning, you're like, I'm just going to do this so other people can be like, you know, praise me. You're just, you're seeking that praise. And that praise, it starts to have a certain sweetness to it. It starts to have a certain like addictiveness to it. You really want praise. You want likes. You want people to notice you, right? That type of thing. So at the beginning, you might do it entirely for something else. According to our ulama, that cancels out the deed entirely. And if you did not even have any ounce of you that did it for the sake of Allah, that deed is canceled out entirely. And then the rest is kind of on a spectrum, right? So like you might do it some for the sake of Allah, some for the sake of other people, and then it can be rewarded or um, you know punished accordingly. The other thing then is that might be at the beginning, but then there's the struggle the human being has in the middle of the deed or at the end of the deed. So if you just are getting like so happy that people are finding out about your good deeds, that that's a risk that all of us have to be wary about, right? You, you and I need to be careful here because the, we should not, we should know that the one who needs to know knows what we do. He knows what worship, he knows what religious deeds we're doing. This whole thing comes, comes when you and I start to think of ourselves as something. And the whole goal is to see of our religion is to focus on Allah. La ilaha illallah. There is nothing, nothing except Allah. Nothing worthy of worship except Allah. Nothing worthy of your attention except Allah. No true attributes except Allah. No true essence except Allah. So that is uh, to, to 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 keep that in mind. Somebody asked, uh, "Are you?" I'm a. Someone asked, "What are you a Sunni or Shia Muslim?" I am. I'm a Sunni Muslim. Alhamdulillah. I try to be at least. Um, so the the uh, person who is happy about other people finding out about their worship and posting about it and whatnot is at risk, right? So these are things now, let's get a little bit into the cure here. A couple of things for us to keep in mind. Um, one is there's actually an interesting, interesting story of, of which to kind of another way to look at this or another way of uh, example of this, right? You have a story of a man who's praying and again, he's praying in the masjid and somebody walks in and has like his friend with him and is like, oh, are you, uh, are you praying? Uh, and says, look, look at this man who's praying. Look at him. He's, he's always praying his extra prayers. He's so righteous. He's so worshipful. Look at the way he bows. Look at the way that he prostrates. Like he's such a righteous man. And the man during his prayer, like turns around and says, don't forget to tell him that I'm also fasting today. I'm also doing a, an extra fast. Um, and, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, just, just a didactic tale, but think about that, right? Like what kind of person would be in that state where they are so obsessed with themselves? You can have narcissistic religious people, very much so. In fact, we have tons of, tons of narcissistic religious people. So that exists where you're obsessed with yourself, but instead of being obsessed with your looks or being obsessed with your money or being obsessed with something else, you are obsessed with your religion and your, your knowledge and this type of thing. And you think you are something. And this is again, very, very subtle desire. And it plagues the whole world. I mean, it's there in the whole world. This is why you have so many people who get caught up in scandals and, and whatnot, who get to a certain level of position in society, especially religious position. And then they mess up and they do something majorly wrong because they weren't worshiping God from, from the beginning sincerely. They were doing it for other intentions. If I do this, I can get this. If I do this, I can get money. If I do this, I can get power. If I do this, I can get control. And most subtle, if I do this, I can get people to praise me and to notice me. So that's something for us to keep in mind. So the cure for this at the basic level is for us to just remember that the righteous would hide good deeds like they hide bad deeds. So, so the people of Allah, they don't tell other people about their good deeds. So let's make that a practice. Like don't, un unless you really need to encourage somebody, like you want to tell your, you know, siblings or your friend, like, dude, really like, you know, you got to get on the prayer grind, like prayer is so helpful for me. Like, that's different. But like, don't go and tell other people about, especially about extra good deeds that you do. Like, yeah, like I gave a thousand dollars the other day or like when I was, you know, 
10 years ago, I had so much money and I gave $10,000 to the, to this masjid or something like that. It's like, no, 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 no. If you did it for the sake of Allah, he already knows that you gave it. You don't need to tell everybody else. Otherwise the deed starts to get canceled out. So that's the first thing. Um, the, the, the second thing is that, um, you tell yourself, so hide those deeds, right? The second thing is you tell yourself, if Allah already knows, why do other people need to know? Keep that in mind, right? You don't need other people to know if Allah already knows what you're doing. You don't need other people to know about your worship, right? Why do we, so ask yourself, what is in me that I got to tell everybody? Why do I got to post about this on social media? Why do I got to get other people's attention? Why do I got to get other people's attention drawn to me, right? Then the next thing you mentioned to yourself to cure this is you say, what benefit will it bring? Uh, if people know about this deed, but if God doesn't even accept it, like what benefit is it going to bring me? If people know about my religious acts, but God didn't even accept them. Because when you do it for the sake of people, like we mentioned, the worship and the reward can get canceled out, right? And so overall, the last thing is you just detest this. You don't, you resist it. Look, none of us are going to get to the point where th this is a very subtle deed. Remember the prophet me indicated this, this, this subtle desire of wanting people to notice you and basically of riyah and hypocrisy is such that it is more subtle than a dark ant crawling in the depths of the night on a black rock. It's very hard to see. That's why you got to do the work. But the person who is spiritually illuminated will be able to see at night better than they can see in the day because their light is so powerful and nighttime is the time of spiritual awakenings and spiritual lights that are descending. So the goal here is to become spiritually illuminated people. Become spiritually illuminated and these desires, these traits, these bad traits, they get cured inside of you, inshallah. Because the light of Allah is so powerful. And when the light of Allah is literally, the light of Allah is, is, is so powerful that when, when it is shining inside of you, right? In no relation to the actual essence of it, it's amazing things can happen. And, and we see that with people, the most foremost of the, of, of the prophets, the prophets of Allah sallam, that his light was so strong, so strong that you actually have hadith where they would say that it was like a dark night and the moon wasn't out. And yet the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face would be so illumined that they could like pick things up on the ground because how much light was coming from it. These are the great people of Allah. These are all the great prophets of all the prophets are great. The prophets, may Allah be pleased with them. This is the type of light that they have. So our goal is illumination. We have to fight this though. The more you resist, every time you resist a bad deed, Every time you resist it, you get illumined in some way. Every time you do it, you get darkened. Every time you do something good, you get illuminated. Every time you resist something good, right, and you do something bad instead, you get darkened. So the whole goal is this process of illumination, of illumination, until you are able to see so clearly your spiritual heart becomes uh, so powerful that it's able to navigate things and it's able to see. And you'll pick up on things. Did I do this for the sake of Allah? Am I being sincere? No, that wasn't sincere. I, I got happy that that person noticed. This is a subtle thing. It takes spiritual effort and work and struggle. But you'll start to then eventually, when you're worshiping, it'll just be you and Allah. That's the goal we want to be at. That it's just us and Allah. It's not about someone else noticing or someone watching uh, and whatnot. So the big, most important takeaway here is to keep on struggling, no matter what we're, what we're at, where we're at religiously. If we're talking about this specific disease or this specific desire, keep on struggling against it. Just keep on fighting it. Don't don't want people to know. Don't let people know about your worship. Don't let people know about the good deeds that it is that you're doing. And don't get happy when they find out about them because it is a sickness inside of the heart. But if you do, just say, nah, man, I messed up this time. I got to keep going. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep resisting this. And we just keep working at it and keep working at it, inshallah. So we're going to we're gonna uh, change the topic just briefly for two, three minutes. going to talk about um, uh, later to Nis Chaban which is a very special night coming up in about five days. If anybody has any questions, please post them in the chat and we'll get to the questions, inshallah. So on this, at least where I'm at in California, this Sunday night is a very, very special night in our religion. It's called Laylatul to Nis Sha'ban, the 15th of Sha'ban. And it is the day of that, of the 15th of Sha'ban is Monday and Islam, the night precedes the day. So this is a very important night to stay up. It's a very important night to worship. The, the following that Monday is a very important Monday to worship uh, or to fast if possible. And it'll also help us get ready for Ramadan. So this falls on Sunday, March 28th, Sunday, March 28th. And we, we hear in the, 
in an amazing hadith that one night Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha noticed that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa had left uh, the house. And she went out to see where he was and she found him in the graveyard, in the Baqi graveyard, raising his arms to the heavens in dua. And he then said to her that on this night, the night of, Mi- of Nis Sha'ban and the 15th of Sha'ban, that Allah forgives more people than there are hairs on the tra- on the sheep of a specific tribe that was known for the amount of sheep that they had, right? So not just the amount of sheep, let's say they had a thousand sheep, the amount of hairs that were on the sheep. So you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are forgiven on this night, right? And then he also said to Allah Sallam, that Allah gazes at his creation on the night in mid Sha'ban and forgives all of his slaves. Except God forgives everybody except two people. Those who attribute partners to Allah, who say that there is more than one God, who attribute partners to Allah, and those who have rancor for others in their heart, who have hatred towards other people in their heart, their other brothers and their sisters and their fellow people uh, in religion and their fellow Muslims. So this is, again, I'm paraphrasing the hadith here that the Prophet mentioned. And he said that when you and I, when this night comes, we should spend part of the night at least, he said that the night in prayer and fast the following day because Allah calls out to his slaves from sunset until dawn, right? So from the sunset of Maghrib up until the Fajr, is there anyone seeking forgiveness from me that I may forgive them? Is there anyone seeking provision from me that I may provide for them? Is there anyone suffering so I may relieve their suffering? Amazing things happen on this night. And Imam Ali uh, regularly, uh, he, he mentions uh, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anha, radiallahu anha, he also mentions many of the virtues of this night, mentions that du'a is accepted um, uh, and, 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 and others. And, and just in case those who want to know, there is, by the way, a uh, difference of opinion on this night. So for those who don't want to worship and who want to do something else, you are always welcome to do whatever it is you would like. The hadith here are narrated in the collections of the Muslim Imam Ahmad, uh, in the collection of Imam Tirmidhi, the collection of Ibn Majah. Uh, you have scholars uh, who, who differed though on this. So again, uh, keep that in mind. It is very, very virtuous. The majority of the ummah took this night as an important night to worship. However, uh, there are some scholars, including very, very, very prominent scholars who said, you know, it's it's it's, it's better to not single it out, um, uh, even though there are, again, very strong hadith that indicated. So just, just something to keep in mind. Not a night to argue, not, not a night to waste your time about like, oh, should I do this? Should I not? The most important thing is use Sha'ban to worship Allah as much as possible to get your heart ready for Ramadan, right? And this this day of Nis, this night of Nis Sha'ban, according to many of the Tabi'in, first and foremost, according to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then according to many of the Sahaba, then according to many of the Tabi'in, is very, very uh, important for us uh, to try and do extra worship to get in the zone. Remember, we are not in the zone like these people used to be. So we have to do things that go above and beyond many times to get in the zone. So use this time to get in the zone. Don't use it to argue. Don't use it to waste time. Don't use it to watch Netflix. Make it a time where you put phones away, put TikTok away, put Instagram away, put Netflix away, and just focus on worshiping Allah. And whether you do that with any any specific time or any specific night, mashallah, but at the very minimum, try to do it on Laylatul Shaban, which is, uh, again, Sunday, March 28th, uh, at least in the area that I'm in, in California. Uh, so may Allah reward all of you. May he make this time easy and, uh, and you know, for, for this lesson that we just discussed, these subtle desires about, about may he cure these desires that we might have about uh, wanting other people to, to notice our religious deeds, to notice our worship. May he remove them from us. May he uh, purify us. And may he make us people of a nearness to him. May he make us people of nearness to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May he bless what's remaining in this month of Sha'ban, allow us to reach Ramadan. May he give an excitement to us in our hearts uh, for the month of Ramadan. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله اللهم صل على سيد محمد وعلي وصحبه وسلم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب لنا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا عاتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله if there are any questions otherwise we will end it is Maghrib time here I don't think I see anything بسم الله if anybody has any questions about the topic Please feel free to post them or any other random questions. Okay, not seeing anything. Again, any questions, just post them in the chat or any anything else that's relevant, please post it.
Alhamdulillah. Do you know more about Do you know more about Surah Taha and its benefits? Subhanallah. That's a good question. I do not. No, I'm sorry. Do not know uh, specifically about Surah Taha and its benefits. Uh, it's amazing. Surah describes the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam going to Fir'aun. Um, but the specific kind of benefits uh, of, of, you know, of that specific surah, I'm not aware of. That's a good question, though. Okay, any other questions? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Jazakumullah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Baraka Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha ina astaghfirullah wa na atubu ilayk. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbi shah sadri wa yasalli amri wa ahli al-uqtata min lisani yafqa qawli. استغفر الله لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم everybody الحمد لله hope everyone is doing well so we're going to continue on this topic and today we're really going to be focusing on the overall cure for our desires so every human being has desires Allah سبحانه وتعالى mentions this in the Quran so we're going to be specifically thinking about how do we go about curing these desires we've been talking in the last like six or seven classes. Um, and discussions about specific desires. So the desire for food, the sexual desire, the desire to be right, the desire to, to win arguments, the desire to be in control, the desire for fame and followers, these types of things. And those are all individual unique desires, each of which have their own unique cures, their own kind of prescription that, that you can get, right? At the same time, what the scholars of our deen have done, um, and most importantly, what the Prophet has done, he's given us a kind of general over-the-counter type of uh, cure, right? So it said, okay, if you do these three to five things and you do them regularly, and you do them consistently, inshallah, you will be on your way towards spiritual success. You'll be on your way towards curing your desires. And those three to five things are very doable. Everybody can do them. And alhamdulillah, we're coming upon a month, uh, this blessed month of Ramadan, which we have like 12 or so days left before this month comes, inshallah, that everybody's going to have a chance to work on themselves. We're all going to have a chance to work on our desires. Um, so, alhamdulillah, that's a very, very good thing. And somebody says, salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam, So, um, and as, as folks have questions come up, just post them in the chat or in the comments or Q&A section and, and we'll get to them, inshallah. So, uh, as we mentioned, some desires are really strong and others are, are weak. And so, our goal is to figure out how do we go about curing all these desires, inshallah. Remember that the goal for the human being is not to eliminate your desire. It's not that you should never desire food or you should never have a sexual desire or you should never desire um, uh, you know, speaking or this type of thing. No, it's that you and I have to tame the desire and channel it in the right direction. So Allah gave us the desire to eat, to eat permissible things, to eat in, 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 in balanced ways, to eat uh, Allah says in the Quran that to, to, to eat halal and tayyib food, to eat clean and pure food, that type of thing. And to give us energy for worship. What he didn't do is he didn't create us to eat. Like you need to eat to live, right? But you don't live to eat. Same thing with all other desires. So you, you and I have to have, for example, sexual desire in order to just continue to, for the world to uh, function and for populations to grow. That desire is there but it has to be channeled in the halal way. It can't be channeled in an impermissible way because if it is channeled in an impermissible way, then that obviously hurts us spiritually. So the goal is to channel the desires and remember that you can channel your desires upwards. Your desires can pull you closer. If you use them correctly, you have the right intention, you can actually get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus what usually happens is that the nafs and shaitan team up to bring us down. They actually bring us down and drag us down. So our goal then is to live this life with this pursuit. One of our main goals in this life has to be, okay, how am I going to control myself? Now, why is this important? Think about it. You and I work really, really, really hard for other parts of life. Like many of us will go to school for 12 years to get a diploma from high school. And then another four years for some six to eight years, if you're doing a professional degree to get a degree. And then you enter the workforce. And so we spend 16 to 20 years learning, waking up every day, 
eight o'clock or before eight have to be at work or be at school by seven thirty or eight, many people, and then they continue that grind for so many years, 16 years, 20 years. And then of course the work, that work grind continues for, you know, God knows how long. Now that's some for, for what? For dunya, for like, oh, I want to be learn. I want to learn, which is a really good thing. Or I want to get money or, you know, I want to have a job, all these things, no problem with them, but that's what we do it for. Allah has given us another challenge, which is that, okay, you can also work hard, but work hard for me. That there are people who strive for the sake of the dunya, and then there's people who strive for the sake of Allah. And you can work hard. You and I can become people who work hard for the sake of Allah. That is totally doable, and that's what we should be aiming to do. So why do I mention that? Because this path to taming the desire for the human being is not a path that like we can just we can just completely you know win in one day. No, we have to work hard at it over and over and over again. We have to be consistent with this. So I'm now going to get into, and these are all things. The goal here is to really focus on Ramadan um, prep. Alhamdulillah, we're, you know, short of just shy of two weeks away from Ramadan. So let's think about this from the perspective of how do we use the skills, hopefully, that we're going to learn today to then apply them in the blessed month of Ramadan, inshallah. So the first thing that we want to be doing is in order to cure our desires, in order to cure the heart, in order to bring about spiritual success, is regular amounts of worship and dhikr. We can't have a spiritual path. We can't spiritually flourish if we don't worship. That's just, It's just impossible. Now, there, I'm going to talk about the basic level, and then I'm going to talk about what we should aspire to. At the basic level, in order for us to like get in control of our desires, for us to not be angry all the time, for us to not lose our, our cool, for us to not lose our... Um, for us to not let lust overcome us or overpower us, for us to not, you know, always uh, feel a need to listen to something or feel a need to look at something or, or look at things that we shouldn't be looking at. We need to do the basics. And then we start adding more on top in order to help control more and more parts of us and channel them in the right direction. Basics are the five prayers. Now, all of us, we struggle with that, right? Many of us, we struggle either with doing the prayers or with focusing and paying attention to the prayers. So our goal needs to be, how do we come up with a program for ourselves, especially this Ramadan, that, okay, I'm going to get on the five prayers. I'm going to make an intention to pray five times a day this Ramadan, and I'm not going to miss the prayers. And if after Ramadan or you, if, if, if outside of Ramadan I struggle with Fajr or I struggle with something else, I'm going to make an intention to uh, really, really prioritize my Fajr. There's many ways to do this. Anything human being wants to prioritize, you can prioritize. Don't let anybody ever tell you, oh, I, you can't do something. You can do anything you put your mind to. And I'm not just saying that. I really, really, that that's 100% fact. Because if somebody had a flight early, early, early in the morning at 5 a.m. or 4 a.m., even if the flight was at 6 a.m., they would get up at 4 o'clock, they would get up at 5 o'clock, and they'd be at the airport on time to catch the flight. But when you and I have this kind of flight that we're going to be meet, that we're going to have a spiritual flight with uh, to the heavens at Fajr time, we don't join that, right? Because we just, you know, our nafs is lazy, and what it, what which desire overpowers us at the time? The desire for sleep. The desire for sleep overpowers the human being when it comes to waking up for Fajr, or when it comes to praying another prayer. The desire to say, "I'll do it later. I want to do this instead. I want to read this instead. I want to watch this video instead." Those are the desires that overpower us during certain times. So the first thing we have to do is establish consistent worship there. It's, 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 it's doable and we need to believe in ourselves. And we need to know that Allah would not have given us the worship to do if he didn't believe, if he didn't know that we could do it. We just have to put in the energy and inshallah, Allah will take us the rest of the way. Now, once we've established, and this is a big deal in and of itself, once we've established the five daily prayers and we wanna get more spiritually advanced and we wanna start controlling the desires at a deeper level, then we need to do the following. We need to start adding in the sunnah dhikr, the sunnah adhkar that the Prophet ﷺ would do regularly or he would encourage us to do. Of which there are three things that I would recommend. That if somebody wants to flourish spiritually, I'm not just talking about get by anymore. You have somebody who gets by. Let's say like you're planting a garden. Getting by is like you got the dirt in the garden and you got a couple like weeds growing. But somebody who's flourishing, they are going to have be planting flowers and flowers are going to be growing. They're going to want fruits. They're going to want trees that eventually lead to fruits. That's the type of stuff they're going to want. So spiritually flourishing, the goal of your deen and my deen, the goal of this deen is to flourish. It's not to just get by. 
We have too many of us who just want to get by. And as a result, we end up right giving in to the, the whims of this and of, and of, 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 of other people's uh, values and whatnot. But if we realized how much we had, how, mu how much Allah has given us in this deen, subhanAllah, we wouldn't want anything else. But, but how do we go about doing that? So the Prophet ﷺ regularly would encourage us to first do du'as. Uh, they are known as the du'as of uh, the morning and the evening. The person who does the du'as of the morning and the evening, the sunnah du'as of the morning and the, e and, uh, and the evening, will have tremendous success, inshallah, in their life and any of their efforts that they, put their, uh, that, that they try to do that day. It will also help us control our desires. It will help you with anger. It will help you with sexual desire. It will help you with desiring to eat all the time. It will help you with desiring to uh, drink or smoke or uh, be in a relate an impermissible relationship. All these things, these these, these dickers, they they are a car. They control help us control that. Why? Because they are light, and light. Uh, what what lights do is light actually penetrate. Uh, it, it it can pierce darkness. You can have a room that's fully dark. Let's say this room is dark. One candle could light up this whole room. You and I, you all have candles of light inside of you or more powerful than candles, frankly. You have beams inside of you that are just waiting to be open. But the access has to be open. The access is open when one does regular amounts of dhikr. Somebody asked, what do you mean du'as? What are the du'as? Yeah, that's, um, that was a great question. So specific, a couple specific du'as. You can literally just, I would do two things. You can Google morning and evening du'as, the sunnah morning and evening du'as. And there's little books that are prepared, like not books, I should say a couple pages that, that would give you all the du'as the Prophet ﷺ would do in the morning and the evening. So for example, he would recite قُلْ وَاللَّهُ وَحَدْ قُلْ عَوْدُ بِرَبِ الْفَلَقُ قُلْ عَوْدُ بِرَبِ الْنَاسِ Three times each. There are certain verses of the Qur'an that he would recite. There are certain du'as like uh, the du'a Rabbi عَوْدُ بِكُمْ مِنْ حَمَزَاتِ الشَّيَاتِينَ until the end that he would recite. So those are some examples. Um, there's also a compilation. So some of the scholars have gone and taken all the du'as from different hadith. They compiled them into um, what's called a, uh, a, a litany, basically in English it's called. It's called a weird in Arabic, which is a compilation of different du'as. So one that I've uh, uh, had our, <coughs> our teachers have told us to do regularly is called the weird al-latif, right? So a weird al-latif, uh, the weird al-latif is the morning and evening du'as that, that, that um, we should be trying to do every day. That's an example for the person who asked the question. So, and someone asked, how can I become a better Muslim? Um, yeah, so we're, 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 we're definitely, it's a great question. We're, we're gonna be covering that um, throughout this, this discussion, inshallah. So the goal of becoming a better Muslim is achieved through controlling your desires. That's one of the main ways because Allah says in the Quran, uh, he emphasizes, he says, Qad aflaha man he actually tells us this is the criteria for success. He says successful is the one who purifies themselves and destroyed is the one who is who doesn't. So the one who purifies themselves, meaning the one who cleans their desires, they will be successful. The one who doesn't, they are going to be in trouble. And you and I know even in this world, when we follow our whims and whatnot, we get in trouble. So the sunnah dua is first thing. Then there's sunnah Quran that the Prophet would read regularly. We should read the following surahs regularly. We should read surah Yasin in the morning time. And ideally after Fajr, if we really, again, we're talking about trying to attain higher ranks of spirituality. We are no longer just talking about the basics. Five prayers are basics. Alhamdulillah, we got to get those in. Now we want to tame the desire. We don't want to be people who burst out in anger. We don't want to be people who let our, our sexual desire control us. We don't want to be people who just let something else control us. We want to control our own desire. So now these will help us do that. So Yasin in the morning. And um, find an, a surah that you prefer to read in the evening time. So Surah Al-Mulk is sunnah to read Surah Al-Mulk uh, before um, sleeping or at any time from Isha until sleep, ideally. So that those would be what I would recommend is Yasin in the morning and Mulk in the evening. Once one has that down, also add in Surah Al-Waqiyah, the 56th chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Waqiyah, the event. Um, recite that or listen to it if you can't recite, but, re but ideally you recite and or listen. Um, and add that after Maghrib. So those are the three. If, you, if somebody can do the Sunnah Duhas, Surah Yasin, and Surah Mulk, and it sounds like a lot, but when someone starts doing it consistently, it's like you could just go on a walk and you know you can get it in. You can just, it's five minutes that we that we give up on Instagram or on TikTok or on you know reading the news and we can get these Duhas in. Five minutes here, 10 minutes here, five minutes here, and we will, boom. We will, you will feel it. You will feel so good. You'll feel so good. You'll feel spiritually light. You'll feel happy. You'll feel a certain type of uh, uh, darkness removed. 
because these du'as are very, very, very powerful. And this is why um, they are the first step. They quiet your mind and they quiet the senses. Um, it's Surah Yasin, Surah Mulk, um, which is the uh, uh, first surah in the 29th chapter, Surah Al-Mulk, and Surah Waqia, Waqia, W A Q I A H in English as the translation, Surah Al Waqia. Those are the three that I would recommend reciting or listening to regularly based on different hadith about them and then the, the du'as uh, of the Sunnah du'as. So that's the first step. Okay, we got that down. Now we go into the second step. So we get the worship and um, uh, we get the worship in. Now we go to the second step. And Alhamdulillah, we're coming upon the, the blessed month of Ramadan. The second step can be facilitated for us. So what's the second step? The second step is um, controlling our food intake. It's actually hunger and fasting. The, the, it's amazing that Allah gives us a command, right? Um, uh, that the fasting has been prescribed for you. What is a prescription? You get prescriptions when you need a cure for something. Allah prescribed fasting for us to cure the heart. Look, if he didn't make us do it, I mean, how many of us would do 30 days of fasting in a row? Like, never we wouldn't do that, right? Like, that's a lot. But alhamdulillah, Allah is giving, he's like, you got to do this now. And alhamdulillah, Muslims from all over the world, no matter how much we're caught up in other stuff, when it comes time for Ramadan, we will do our best to, to fast. So fasting helps a lot. What does fasting do? Fasting, remember, these are all unseen things going on. So what we're talking about now is like these spiritual cures. These are not happening. You can't see them. It's not like when you apply an ointment to your face, you got a pimple and it goes away. That's not how spirituality works. It's uh, Allah says in the Quran, uh, Alif Lam Mim, Thalikal Kitab Ula Rayba Fi Hudal Lil Muttaqeen, Alladina Yu'minun Bil Ghayb. That one of the first few ayahs of the Quran is that, that um, this is a book for those who have no doubt, those who believe in the unseen. Belief in the unseen is essential part of our religion. So believing in the unseen in this case, is you knowing that there's unseen effects to your dua. There's unseen effects from your prayer. So Allah says, for example, in the Quran, that prayer prevents you from lewdness. It actually restrains you from uh, mis in inappropriate behavior. You're about to do something inappropriate, you pray. The spiritual effect of that will at least reduce the amount you are going to do, inshallah, ideally, if the heart is in a decent enough state. Um, either way, it will always help, inshallah. So hunger and fasting does the same thing. It builds a spiritual discipline. It's for us, we might be like, oh, the headaches and I'm tired and you don't feel good. That's that's there. But in reality, there's something else going on. There's something else going on spiritually. So there's two ways to do this. First, there are the, uh, the outright days of fasting, of which we have Ramadan coming up, and of which we should try after Ramadan to have a regular amount of fasting in our lives. At least one day a month, we should try. The Sunnah of the Prophet is three days a month, the three white days, or... Um, different hadiths say Mondays and Thursdays, but at the very least, the three white the white days, meaning um, the white the days of the full moon, um, 13th, 14th, and 15th of the month. But at least once a month we should try. So we can keep it up a little bit. We keep it just one day. I'm gonna not eat, right? A little. I'm just not gonna eat, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna skip. Um, you're basically just skipping one meal, but it's still it's an amazing thing to fast. What does it do for all the things you and I have been doing that whole month? It will purify them, inshallah, internally. That should be our intention. Because again, all we collect so much darkness on the internet and talking to people and just, just our own souls, the stuff we think about, the stuff we look at. Like, there's so much darkness. Fasting cures it, purifies it. So you do, you're doing your worship and dicker. Now you add in this next ingredient. Okay, so now you're starting to make this beautiful spiritual. Um, you know, all these beautiful spiritual ingredients are going to make eventually a recipe to help you with your spirituality. One, you're not fasting though. The, uh, the sunnah is still to restrain your food intake. So it's not about always fasting. Most of us, we can't fast all the time and we actually shouldn't fast all the time, right? But we can, after Ramadan, we can control our food. We can stop a couple bites short and this has amazing spiritual effects that we should try to have a day where we do the following three things in order to ascend to higher stations of spirituality. Again, talking here about somebody who wants to control their desire and achieve states of good character, righteousness, taqwa, these types of things. Not just like I'm getting the basics in, right? Person who's like content with the C in the class, that's fine. But this is the one who wants the A in the class, who wants to really crush it. So hunger means um, just okay, I'm going to reduce, if I eat like this much of a plate of food every now and then, I'm going to eat this much of a plate of food. I'm going to eat half the size. 
just because it will help me control my nafs. The more you are hungry, the more the nafs gets into control. And again, I'm not talking about like starving ourselves or anything. I just balance levels of you limit the food intake. And at the very least, if we can't limit the quantity, we limit the, the deliciousness of the food. What does that mean? It means don't let your nafs eat everything it wants unless it obeys you. Your nafs is like an animal. If it obeys you, I don't know how many folks have pets, but like I recently got a little kitten, very, very fine little kitten. And I've been having a lot of fun with him. And he, when he does a good job with something, learns something new, plays, you know, we give him a little treat, right? But not every day. And there are certain treats he really, really likes. So like when he's been extra good on that day, he gets like the treat that he really likes. And he sometimes just takes it from us and runs away with it because how much he likes it. it doesn't let us feed it to him. Now, if, I, if you give your, your nuffs is like an animal. If you give your nuffs everything it wants, anytime it wants it, it's just gonna, it's gonna rule you, rule you. You are not going to obey the nafs. Yes, sorry, um, somebody asked a question, what is the nafs? My apologies, I should have clarified. So the nafs is the lower self, the ego of the human being. The lower self, the nafs is the part in us that brings us down. So there are levels of the nafs, but the, the basic translation is the lower self or ego. And when it's impure, it teams up with the devil, it teams up with shaitan, to basically mess us up, to get us to fall into sin, to get us to do you know silly things, uh, that that's the nafs. So the nafs has to be tamed. In Ramadan, shaitan is gone. We know that the shaitan are locked up, but the nafs is still very much there. And so fasting actually helps to tame the nafs. That's the goal of fasting: to tame the ego, tame the lower self. It calls you to your lower part. You have another part inside of you known as the spirit, the ruh, the. Um, the spirit is the higher part in you, okay? And uh, someone mentioned that, that this is a, a little bit on, uh, hard to understand because your ego is your identity. So that's a really, really good point. It's not exactly like that. So that's why the ego translation is probably not the best translation. Um, lower self is probably the best transition. It is you, but it's your lower tendencies. You can, through spiritual nurturing, you can train it. You can train this part of you to become better, to become, right? Just like you and I have moments where like, we really, you know, you ever do something you regret and you're like, you know, that someone tells you like, you know, that wasn't you. Like, I felt like that was just like a different part of you. And you're like, yeah, that was like really my, you know, my, my, um, uh, the part of me that I wish didn't come out that much. If we ever have an angry outburst or we do something else, that's because the nuffs can pull you down. But sometimes you have the higher aspects of you, right? Like your, your higher angels, some people call it in this culture. You, you know, you're so generous. You see someone on the street, you help them out, like all these amazing things. There are parts in you that are bad and there are parts in you that are good. The nafs, you can essentially say in the early stage of spirituality, it's the part in you that's bad. But slowly through training, the nafs can become good. It, well, it can become trained to be good, if that makes sense. Um, so it's not exactly one's, like, uh, only one's identity. There are many parts to one's identity. Think about it. If you have different parts of you, this is one part. And then there are higher parts of you. And then there are kind of the like medium parts, right? Everybody has different aspects to them internally. So the goal with hunger is to cure, cure oneself through, um, uh, uh, through limiting the food intake. Okay. And that gives clarity and that allows for an internal purification to happen. So hunger and fasting. Then the third one, the third one is moments of solitude, moments of solitude. Why is this important? The desires many times get stirred up inside of the human being because we are always around people, always, we're always stimulated. And if, if you know, in COVID, we haven't been able to be around people. Um, many of us, you know, alhamdulillah, that's a test. And many of us have not been able to like hang out physically, but we're still always around people digitally. We're always around something or another, some show. There's always something in front of us. In order to spiritually progress, the human being needs moments of quietude, solitude. What is the proof for this? That the Prophet Sallallahu he had a long period of meditation in Ghada Hira before the revelation came. And many of us, we know the story that he would go up there to meditate for long periods of time. And say the Khadija al-Kubra radiallahu anha, our mother and the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu she would bring him food or they would meet halfway for him to get provision and food and whatnot. And then he would go back up to meditate. And it was in one of these nights that he was meditating, the beautiful night of Laylatul Qadr, where Allah then says that, um, Qadr, that then he sent down, right, the Quran and Jibreel alayhi salam came to him. And this famous verse was recited, Iqra, that recite. 
the prophet said i don't know how to read slash recite i don't know how to and the jibril islam did it again and then he hugged him and shook him and this whole intense event happened this spiritually powerful yet really intense event after these periods of meditating right because that was the the prophet sallam is is showing us and allah is showing us ultimately that this is the way to attain spiritual openings you want to get higher levels of spirituality obviously there's no prophecy and what not it's not what i'm saying but you you follow this example you have moments of silence and solitude it doesn't mean you go off in a cave for like 2 years and you don't do anything that's not what i'm saying but you got to have moments like at least 5 minutes a day where it's just you no device no nothing just you and allah that you just sit there and you think or you go on a walk and you just put everything away and you just think and or talk to Allah why is this because the senses have to be quieted in order for your thoughts to actually come out you know i have so many thoughts we have so much stuff going on all these different things we're thinking about and what not in order for us to succeed in life we need to have times where we just hear the thoughts uh this one's worthless this one's important this this that and then you just have moments of calmness and you just let everything process okay everything's processing and then you have that moment of time where you just talk to Allah about whatever's going on in your life this can be after the prayer but i'm mentioning like ideally in addition to that right so we're talking about solitude in addition to the time just after the prayer so have moments where it's just in this ramadan make it a goal at least 5 10 minutes ideally you know the best time that we could do this is the time right before iftar if we're not busy with food prep if we try to prep our food like an hour in advance 30 minutes in advance go and sit for 5 10 minutes in a place quiet just you and god and just make dua and talk to him you will see amazing wonders and those will be the best 5 10 minutes of your life for that period and you will want to do it even after ramadan because intimacy with allah and this love you remember you and i have a deep desire to love and this religion is about love and allah has a deep love for human being one of his name is al wudud and the the most loving um is one way to translate it according to scholars so that's that's that love that you and i have that allah has for us that we cultivate for him in these moments of alone in these moments of solitude so a couple of ways you can be physically alone but not actually if virtually you're still active and everything so i recommend visual stimulation have moments we need to go and cleanse this ideally But at least every day have moments of the day a couple hours or something like that or a couple minutes whatever we can manage put away all the devices put away the music put away all the things that can stir up desire it takes one look at something impermissible to stir up a desire you get excited about it or so, or one song of something you know that's 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 that that's going to bring out the bad part of us and boom now the desire is stirred it just it was dormant and it stirred you need moments of solitude in order to 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 be able to quiet the senses and to be able to actually think and to be able to progress spiritually so we have worship and dhikr is number 1 number 2 we have um hunger and hunger hunger slash fasting number 3 we have moments of solitude all of these are from the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam many of these though unfortunately are forgotten sunnahs many of us focus on certain sunnahs which are amazing but we forget some of these like crucial sunnahs related to worship um and uh, we have to bring these back inshallah into our lives this can also be though taking some time to go on a walk taking some time to think like it just it means not being either with people or with devices that's probably the best way to put that's for one way to put it in the time we live in have moments where you're not with people and not with devices and you just have time with you and god and time to think the third the third the fourth one that that leads to is we need to also have moments of silence what does that mean for somebody like me who talks a lot it means just zipping it up every now and then right but why is it because the 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 part of us it likes to talk then again back to this nafs this lower self the nafs likes talking it likes talking about itself likes talking about its accomplishments like the oh look at me i did this that da 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 and then it likes to everything from talking about itself to posting about itself to trying to get everybody to like itself to like its image all those things the narcissistic attitude they all stem from the nafs right moments of silence will help with that we need moments where we just okay yeah i'm just going to try to like think but i'm not going to talk meditation is a big big you know um it's important it's a big part of our religion as well meditating a lot it's 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 uh you could basically say re- meditating and reflecting um allah describes many parts in the quran where he encourages us to do tadabbur which is like a meditative reflection a deep reflection um so have moments though in order to do that to unlock whatever you want to get you want to 
have moments of silence, okay? Again, not all the time. You don't need to be, just be quiet, but we need to have moments of silence, inshallah. Uh, somebody asked a question. Uh, that's a good question. Let me get to that just in a sec. So a little bit more elaboration on the nafs. I'm going to get to that just a second, inshallah. So then the fifth part of it is um, night worship. Or you could say like not sleeping all the time, not oversleeping. What does that mean? Once you have the basic worship down, the hardest, for example, prayer for most people is Fajr because Fajr requires cut, limiting sleep. And the nafs, again, the, the, the lower self, the part in us that pulls us down, the nafs, the best way to think about it is the nafs pulls us down to our worldly tendencies, to our haram tendencies. That's the nafs. And I'm not going to get too into it, but you have stages of the nafs, so it can eventually get to a point where it's perfected and, or close to perfected and it can actually pull you up. But in the most of us, it's pulling us down towards bad thoughts, anger, overeating, sexual lusts and desires, always wanting to be right, trying to have so many followers, trying to be in charge, trying to be in control, trying to be the big the, the big man or big woman in town, trying to just like run the show. Every desire you can think of, negative traits that we have come from the nafs and the nafs being out of control. And Allah says um, that controlling the nafs though will help us. It will actually allow us to achieve a state of success. Um, so hopefully that kind of clarifies that um, a little bit. It's, it's, and I'll get to the second part in a, in a second. So reducing sleep and night worship. The goal is you, you want to slowly reduce the amount of, um, the amount of like indulgences that one gives oneself. So like if we always sleep through Fajr, we have to have days, of course, ideally every day, but we have to have days where we wake up for Fajr because the, otherwise the nafs thinks it's you, you and I start to think that, Oh, it's totally fine. Like, what's the point? I'll just make it up. I don't, I don't need to pray because I want to wake up at eight o'clock and Fajr comes in at six o'clock. So like that's two hours of sleep. Well, if you and I were to wake up for, for that prayer, we would actually feel a spiritual benefit from it. And we would actually have more energy than we would had we slept through it. But it's hard to understand until we start to implement it. Same thing goes for reducing sleep slowly in order to increase our night worship. One of the most important prayers one can do in order to become closer to Allah, in order to get spiritually close, is the tahajjud prayer. Allah says in the Quran, He says, tells the Prophet to do tahajjud, and that the more you do tahajjud, Prophet will attain a very specific station because of the prayer of tahajjud. Tahajjud is to pray before Fajr, anytime, ideally, really anytime after Isha until Fajr, but generally speaking, the last one third of the night. Call it two hours before Fajr. That can be one minute before Fajr, or it can be literally two or three hours before Fajr. So um, uh, that that is the um, uh, that is the most important aspect of this. Um, so in order to try and control our nafs, night worship starts to become a more and more important aspect um, of, of of our of our life. So there's a spiritual effect. Reduce the sleep slightly. Don't don't like never sleep, but don't oversleep all the time. We have to have moments where okay, I'm gonna do a little bit less sleep so I can get up and worship a lot. Because that's what the son of the Prophet someone he wouldn't sleep for most of the night. He would sleep worship for for one third of the night, one half of the night, many times. Um, so that's that's part of us. If we want to attain closer stations, that's something that we will do. Uh, Alhamdulillah. No, no problem at all to the person who, who mentioned that. May Allah bless you. Um, so uh, hopefully that 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 clarifies a little bit. The in Ramadan, and I think we'll inshallah, we'll, we'll try to end with this. In Ramadan, what happens? We reduce our food intake because we have to. And then many of us reduce our sleep intake. I was just thinking about this other day. And I was like, oh, subhanAllah, like waking up for work and everything isn't going to be tough in Ramadan. But Allah is actually setting it up. So, say, okay, you pray at night, you fast during the day. And he wants us to get up and pray at night to, to pray tarawih prayer. Ideally, it's not far, but it's a very, very good thing to do. And automatically in Ramadan, then the spiritual cure starts to happen. Because, subhanAllah, Allah already knew it was good for us. So you and I start to sleep less because well, we have to wake up for suhoor. And that's early as, it's very, very early. And then we wake, many times we might go to tarawih or, or these days we might pray tarawih at home because of COVID. But either way, you know, we have a less period of consistent sleep. But that actually might, it might hurt physically. Like you wake up and you're like, oh my God, it's so early, it's so cold. I don't want to be up right now. My head hurts. You don't want to talk to anybody at Suhur or Sari time, right? But spiritually, there's some effects happening. 
effects happening. And the people who miss out on this, they miss out on the spiritual effects. They say, oh, I'm just going to eat everything at night and just like so I can get a good night rest and they'll eat it like right after um, Isha and go to sleep and not wake up for suhoor. Well, they miss the spiritual effects, right? If somebody was passing out and they told you, hey, you come to this spot and you wake up at this time and you'll get a million dollars, let's say coming to the masjid or you come to some place and is it everybody who comes gets a million dollars. I guarantee you 99% of people would not miss it because they want the million dollars. And so you come every day and you'll keep getting a million and they'll keep coming, right? Because for money, most most of us, there's never enough. But for Dean, we're like, oh, I just got to do the bare minimum. Well, now we need to call ourselves to, to have higher aspiration, higher motivation, higher himma. Make this Ramadan, Ramadan, where you try to discipline yourself. You try to tame your desires or you try to go above and beyond just the basics. Okay, you're going to do the basic fasting. Allah Akbar, that's already amazing. But do more. We're talking about this next week, inshallah, but we'll try to do the fast of the eye, the fast of the, of the mouth, the fast of the ears, meaning you stay away from haram inputs in all these areas. Try to lift yourself up and remember that all of these things we mentioned today, the eight things, regular amounts of worship, regular amounts of dhikr, especially the sunnah dhikr, adhkar, the Prophet Sallam, regular amounts of fasting and hunger, regular amounts of solitude, regular amounts of silence, and regular amounts of extra night worship. All of these things will have such a powerful cure and impact on your heart. You won't, you do this consistently for a year. You won't even know who the, who the, you'll, 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 you'll be a completely different person because it's such a consistent effect. It's a light that purifies the heart that illuminates you, that makes you into a very, very much uh, uh, a human being who's focused on good character, who's focused on the presence of, of, of Allah and who's focused on trying to be present with Allah is what I should say. Um, so let's try that this Ramadan inshallah. And uh, inshallah, we will we will uh, pray and hope that everybody has a very, very blessed Ramadan. If there's any questions now, please feel free to post them. Somebody said, are we allowed to watch Netflix during Ramadan? Um, I mean, I would, I'm not gonna answer like whether it's like necessarily allowed or not. I would stay away ideally from Netflix and from television in Ramadan if you can. If it's really difficult, if somebody really feels a need to like, they have to watch it, then don't watch anything that has like naked images, that has shooting, that has violence, that has blood, that has curse words, that has relationships, um, that, that almost rules out like most shows that are out there. But you know, if there's something that isn't, uh, that might work. But I would try to fast from TV, from Netflix, from some aspects of social media, at least the like dangerous aspect where all we do is scroll and just kind of keep going, the kind of, you know, um, uh, scroll of death or whatever it's called, right? We just... I would try to stay away from that. Yeah. But it's not like if, as long as what you're watching is okay, it's technically okay. But if it's going to hurt you spiritually, it's going to hurt you spiritually. And for the person who wants to climb in nearness to Allah. And again, we're talking here now about higher stations, but everybody can do this. Allah gave all of us the capability to do this. They will use all of their time wisely, that they will try not to use their time in things that are going to be quote unquote, waste of time in Ramadan because you're in Ramadan, you're in a state of fasting, you're in a spiritually blessed month. So does it, you should, tr we should try to read Quran in our time. We should try to learn. If we can't do that, we should try at least not to do something that will drag us down. Um, inshallah. Uh, and, and somebody mentioned Ertugo. Uh, mashallah. Yes. Ertugo. I've heard a very, very, very powerful show. Um, yeah. So maybe that could be one, uh, that could be a, you know, spiritually uplifting, you know, documentaries type of things, you know, they could be fine if one needs to just, do what they need to do. Everybody's in a different state. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you're just so finished. You just got to get through the day and that you have a different kind of schedule for yourself and different things you do versus when you like are in a good zone, you can do extra things. You can do some Quran, you can do some dicker. You can like help somebody out in those moments when you have that himma, that energy, don't let Netflix or anything bring it down because it'll just make you stay sedentary and do that. But in the moments where you're just so finished, you can't do anything. Okay. There might be some more room for this stuff, but in Ramadan, we should try to limit it uh, either way. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll do one more question just because we're here at uh, Maghrib time, at least where I'm at. Um, if anybody has a question, please post it. Um, inshallah, question related to desires or to Ramadan or to, you know, anything else. Um, uh, inshallah. Uh, alhamdulillah. All right, not seeing oh, someone asked me what I do for a living. I work uh, in tech, uh, a startup uh, for a living. Yeah. All right, not seeing anything else. 
Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, so uh, inshallah, definitely next week, I think it's going to be our last week for this specific class. Um, and we're going to focus it all on Ramadan prep. So inshallah, tune in next week, Wednesday, 7 p.m. PST. Try to keep it about 30, 40 minutes, focus on Ramadan prep, inshallah. Um, and uh, is there a book or anything that explains what nafs means in Islam? It's a really good question. Um, the, uh, the book I would get, there is a book called the beginning of guidance, the beginning of guidance. And it's translated in English It's by Imam Ghazali. I would get that book. Yes, that, that will generally explain many of these concepts that we're talking about, um, many of which are pulled from, from that type of book. Um, mashallah, someone says, I'm deaf. Is it okay to put Quran even if I don't hear it well? Uh, Allah bless you. May Allah uh, reward you for this, for, for enduring the, 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 what I can't imagine how uh, much himma and resolve that takes. Um, it's totally okay, yes, to listen to it, to look at it, whatever you are able to hear. Um, and yes, that's that's a great idea. Putting Quran on loudspeakers, somebody mentioned if they're not able to hear fully, is a totally great idea, totally allowed to do, um, as long as you're not doing it in like, you know, a, a bathroom or an unclean place. Otherwise, it's totally good. Um, yeah. And if one can, even if one can't not, um, if you can't read, if somebody can't recite, it's good to listen. If someone can't listen, it's good to recite or to just look at the words. Just looking at the Arabic words has a powerful spiritual effect um, and make the intention that one day I want to get to the point where I can do this, inshallah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I don't see any more questions. So if there's nothing, inshallah, we'll end with a short prayer. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbana atana fi dunya hasanata wa fi al-akhirati hasanata wa kina adhaab al-nan. Rabbana taqabil minna anna kanta samir alim wa tubalina inna kanta tawab al-rahim. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Rahim, Ya Rahim, Ya Rahim, Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, bless this remainder of this month of Sha'ban, allow us to reach Ramadan, and please bless the Ramadan of all those people, Ya Allah, that are here, all the Muslims in this world, Ya Allah, all the Muslims in in in, 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 in our area, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, and all the Muslims, Ya Allah, who are struggling with their deen, and all the Muslim Ummah of the Prophet Islam in general, Ya Allah, make the Ramadan easy for us, Ya Allah, make this Ramadan easy for us, full of khair, full of light, allow us to tame our desires in this month, and allow us to turn our fear over to you, and allow us to not be worried about anything, Ya Allah, and remove our stresses, and our depression and our anxieties and our difficulties and our problems, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, that you gaze upon us and that you that you draw us near to you, Ya Allah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa barakatuh, Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallallahu wa sallam, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, alhamdulillah, jazakumala khair, salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, jazakumala khair, everybody, thank you so much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallallahu wa sallam, رب شهي صدري وارسلي أمري وحل الأقدة من الساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله. So we are continuing on. This is actually the final uh, class of the series on deceptive desires, and we are going to be focusing today specifically on the blessed month of Ramadan, and we're going to be talking about uh, what it is that we need to do in this blessed month of Ramadan in order to begin taming our desires. We've been talking about the various types of desires that we have. We've been talking about uh, the various uh, uh, different ways desires come up inside of the human being. And now we're going to be talking specifically about uh, the month of uh, Ramadan and, and, and the kind of details uh, around that. So, alhamdulillah. In this month, um, one of the main things that we can do is uh, we, we need to really invest in understanding the inner world that we have. So, there's the outer world that we engage with, and then there's an inner world that all of the Muslims have, everybody has inside of them. The inner world is the world that regulates our emotions, it regulates how we're feeling, it regulates all of these different um, spiritual aspects as well. And in order for us to really succeed when it comes to purification, when it comes to controlling our desires, that understanding of the inner world is very, very essential. Alhamdulillah, Ramadan, there are a lot of things happening in this inner world that are important for us to understand. First and foremost is that in Ramadan, we know uh, it is a month in which the heavens are open and which uh, hell is closed, right? So the gates of heaven are open in the month of Ramadan as per Hadith and the gates of the hellfire are closed. So what does that mean? We've been talking in this, in this conversation about desires. We've been chatting about um, this idea of be being pulled upwards or being pulled downwards, right? And so you can be pulled spiritually up. You can actually be be pulled up in a very, very positive way, or the downward forces of life and, and of, uh, in this case of Satan, can pull one uh, down. So we have to be able to be pulled spiritually. We have to be able to be pulled up instead of dragged down. 
And Ramadan is the month for us to be able to do this. So it's very, very important um, for us to keep that in mind. I'm just checking one thing. Sorry about this. Okay. Alhamdulillah. So Ramadan is this month for us to uh, try and achieve this kind of state of spirituality where we are again being pulled upwards. How do we go about doing that? It is a chance for us to work on our nafs. So in Ramadan, shaitan, the shayateen are gone. We know that the shayateen are gone. Um, so it's really just us and our nafus, right? And so you are left with your nafs, which is your ego, your lower self, your lower soul. Um, and you've got to resist the nafs. You have to resist the desires of the nafs. You have to fight these desires in order to succeed in the month of Ramadan because the nafs wants to eat. The nafs wants to do other things. The nafs wants to waste time. And Ramadan is this supposed to be this month of productivity. It's supposed to be this month of uh, worship. It's supposed to be a month where you and I are trying not to engage with our nafs. So if we try not to engage with our nafs in Ramadan, in, in this blessed month of Ramadan, um, the more and more we resist the desires that the nafs calls to, the more and more we will be able to succeed in this, in this blessed month. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already assisting us by commanding us that we have to stay away from food. He says we have to stay away from food and from drink and from even lawful sexual relations during the, the, the fasting period. That already begins a spiritual taming process for the nafs. Um, so that's really, really important. Uh, and then the other thing to keep in mind is you actually get to kind of microscopically look at yourself in a way you don't get to look at yourself another time. Because in other times when we do something wrong, when we do something bad, we attribute it to shaitan many times, right? So we say, oh, this is because of shaitan, or he whispered this in, in my ear, or um, you know, we feel like, oh, maybe all the bad is not necessarily coming from something I'm doing. But in Ramadan, the shayateen are locked up. So we actually now know, okay, this is something that I have to work on. This is an inner problem that I have, right? Versus outside of Ramadan, we might not always know it. This is a problem I have, but it was in, in, incited by the shayateen, by the great deluder of shaitan, as Allah mentions um, in, in the Quran. So it's a chance then for us to do what? to focus on this topic we've been talking about, which is to hone out, to control our desires. Ramadan is this month where you can achieve a state of, of higher, of a, a higher spiritual state by controlling your desires. We have a hadith where the Prophet indicated that none of you truly believes until his desires are in accordance with what I've brought. So your desires, in order for us to achieve uh, the per pinnacle of belief, in order for us to start achieving perfected belief, our desires, what we want, what we don't want, what we desire to do, what we don't desire to do, should be in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet And that's not easy. That's a, it could take a lifetime of work, but it is possible. And that's what we have to be encouraged by, that everything the Prophet is telling us, he wouldn't tell us if it wasn't possible. He's telling us because it's possible and he's encouraging us. So never let anybody tell you that, hey, I can't do this or that I can't succeed in Ramadan. No, you can do it. You can succeed in Ramadan. You can achieve your goals. You can achieve your spiritual goals. All these things are totally possible, but it takes work. And so we have to put that effort in. We have to put that work in. If we put that work in, we put that energy in, Allah can assist us in ways you would never think imaginable. Things have happened. People have changed their lives in Ramadan in ways um, that they never even thought possible and in ways that you could not recognize them after the month is over or maybe a month or so or two go by and you could not recognize them because maybe somebody who is in a state of they're going to the bars and they're going clubbing and they're drinking and they're smoking and in one Ramadan, they have one night of sincere repentance where the tears flow from their eyes and they turn to their Lord and they're sincere to him and they conquer certain desires. Allah helps them conquer certain desires and, and then you'll never see them in those places again after the month of Ramadan. I know people personally, who this has happened to. Uh, so use this as a month of change. And again, whatever desires, we're talking about the big, the big stuff or the subtle desires, this is the month to conquer those desires. Somebody's asking, uh, what is the best time uh, for du'a during Ramadan? So uh, there are many good times for du'a during Ramadan, but the specific time we should be thinking about every day is while we are fasting and right before we break the fast. So there are uh, traditions which indicate both of those as being very, very good times to make du'a while we're fasting and right before we break the fast. Um, other good times uh, to, to make dua in this blessed month of Ramadan are, uh, of course, during suhoor time, because that's already a very, very virtuous time. 
outside of Ramadan, that's that's the Hajj time. During Ramadan, it's still the Hajj time, uh, meaning the time, the last one third of the night, where Hadith indicate that um, Allah in no physical anthropomorphic way, but figuratively just to help our human minds understand it, um, uh, uh, descends and uh, he asks, is there anybody who needs anything that I may fulfill their need? Anybody who wants forgiveness or seeking forgiveness that I may forgive them. So that time, right, the time one or two hours before Fajr Salah is an amazing time for du'a throughout the year, especially in the month of Ramadan. Then it's good to make du'a right for sure before we break iftar. Um, don't try not to be caught up in food prep or to be caught up in watching something and whatnot. Definitely don't have the TV on um, in that like the last ten or fifteen minutes uh, before before iftar. It's a very very good time for du'a, um, inshallah. So those are some times. And then and then there will be specific nights um, that we know. Again, every night is amazing in Ramadan, but there are specific nights. Of course, the last ten nights, the, the odd nights of the last ten, um, where we can try to catch the night of power of which um, many, many, many du'as and openings um, are answered and are given. So there are levels then that we should try to focus on in this month of Ramadan. And what do I mean by this? Look, you you and I are all, we're all in different stages of our of our journey, right? So we might be caught up, okay, like somebody might say, hey, I'm trying to leave very, very specific haram thing in Ramadan. Someone else might be like, oh, I already left most of the haram stuff I got. I had to do. I'm trying to advance in a different way. And someone else might say, you know, I'm already done that, so now I'm trying to continue growing. Alhamdulillah, the month of Ramadan allows us, there are levels of fasting in the month of Ramadan. There are levels of fasting. So it allows us to, um, uh, it allows us to progress in these levels. So we're going to talk about these for each of the limbs that the human being has. We're going to talk about the different levels that you and I can try to achieve in terms of controlling our desires associated with the eyes, with the ears, and with the tongue. Um, and then we will wrap it up, inshallah. So, and again, as you have questions, it's just please, please, please post them and we'll, um, we'll get to them, inshallah. So, first is the eyes. Now, the, at the basic level, the eyes gravitate towards doing haram things. They gravitate towards looking at haram. They gravitate towards looking at pictures, at bad images, um, at not lowering their gaze, at looking at the opposite gender. The eyes gravitate towards that. Ramadan is a month where we're supposed to control. We, we should always control it. Ramadan is a month, though, in which we are taught to fast from what... Allah usually allows us in normal times. Allah usually allows us in a normal period to um, uh, to eat and drink food, right? To eat food and to drink. But in Ramadan, he says, stay away from this, even though it's halal in normal situations. So for sure, then you can stay away from the stuff that's haram in a normal situation, right? Um, so the eyes are going to gravitate in, in most times to looking at things that are impermissible. In Ramadan, you control yourself. Say, no, I can't look at that person. No, if somebody has like their sexual desires are acting up, no, I can't check that person out. No, I can't look at that bad image. Somebody wants to watch pornography. No, I can't do it because I'm fasting. If I do it, my, my the reward of my fast will completely diminish, right? The more sins you and I do throughout the day in Ramadan, the, the, the lesser and lesser the reward of the actual fast gets. So you might have like this much reward at the beginning, but because we look at this thing, we curse at somebody, we, we, we lose our cool with someone, et cetera, et cetera. And by the end of the day, we, our reward has diminished. All we got was hunger and thirst because we didn't actually get the spiritual training. Remember, it is a month of spiritual training. That's the, that's the purpose of Ramadan. It's a refresh, refresher for us. Um, and so it is a refresher for each of the limbs for you to remind yourself, this is why this limb was created. Allah tells us, um, Allah tells us to uh, uh, worship him as one of the main reasons why he created us. And each limb was created for a specific type of worship. So Ramadan has every limb is engaged in some form of worship if we are following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And most of us, we're going to fall short, um, but we should try to do our best to follow the sunnah. So what's an example of this, right? Um, the eyes, if we follow the sunnah of reciting Quran from time to time in Ramadan, we try to we try to recite one section of the Quran a day, one juz a day, safara a day, or even a little bit um, less if we can't do that much or more. Our eyes are engaged in worship. That's what the eyes are created for, to look at Allah's words, right? To uh, look at Allah's uh, what, what Allah has revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu But we might, or we might do something else. We might just scroll on our phone instead. It just depends on what somebody wants to do in Ramadan with the limbs that Allah has blessed them. The person who's trying to achieve a state of nearness to Allah will say, no, I'm going to use this in obedience. The person who's like, eh, I just got to get through the fast. Okay, let's just do whatever it is that they want to do, right? The same thing goes with the tongue. The same thing goes with the hand. The same thing goes with every other part of the body. So it's just about us trying our best and we're going to fall short. It's all good. We just get back up and we keep trying. 
but that's the goal is to aspire, is to aspire to higher levels, is to aspire to get closer and closer. So again, the eye at this first level is trying to, it doesn't lower its gaze and looks at haram. So we should, with reminding ourselves that I am fasting, I'm not supposed to look at bad things. We remind ourselves of that and inshallah, we will start to progress, right? The eye we will emerge at the end of Ramadan, not wanting to look at the haram things or at least being in more control because of all the fasting and all the dhikr that happened. So that's one desire specifically that we're talking about linked to the eye that in Ramadan we try to get a control of. Another desire linked to the eye or another negative trait you could say is looking down on other people. The eye has a tendency, it's not created to look down on other Muslims. That's not the purpose. Unfortunately, in our ummah today, we are filled with, we look down on each other. We Somebody might practice more uh, than someone else and they look down, they say, look at this person, he or she's not religious, he or she's not this, and they, 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 they judge them inside and they look down on them. And that's not what the eye is created for. The eye is created to have a good opinion of others, right? So you're supposed to say, okay, you, you see someone doing something wrong and you come up with, okay, what the Prophet some say? 70 excuses. You say, maybe he or she did this. Maybe they're, met, they're, 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 they're going through a tough time. Maybe this is what they are um, uh, struggling with, right? And so you try not to look down. Now that's looking down on somebody is someone who's already started to work on the major haram things with the eye will now start to focus on this one. They'll be like, you know what? I'm really trying to improve myself. I'm trying to improve my spiritual state. So I'm going to try to work on, on this aspect, right? So that would be another um, example here. And somebody asked, uh, do you have to lower your gaze uh, from bad vids and just all uh, just overall lowering gaze? Uh, yes. So, so, so anything that is, um, uh, uh, not not allowed or haram to look at in real life. It's not allowed to look at in a video, in a photo, in a drawing, in any other image representation. So yes, we would have to, which is unfortunately why this age of internet and social media, it has its positives, right? Like we can't do this video and these these classes during COVID and whatnot. If we didn't have the, the, the blessing of being connected to so many people, we wouldn't be connected to. But at the same time, it has its detriments. And so there's a lot of haram out there, right? A lot of uh, bad images, a lot of people just, you know, dressing inappropriately, a lot of um, basically, you know, near pornography type of images that are flooding Instagram, flooding TikTok, flooding Facebook, and just flooding the internet in general. So in Ramadan, if we can't control ourselves, we got to deactivate for a little bit because we're literally going to lose the reward of the fast. And remember, you only have 29 or 30 days. The point of the fast is not for to make you hungry not the point of the fast. The hunger elevates you to a spiritual station you could not achieve without the hunger. That is among the wisdoms of fasting. لَعَلَّكُمْ Allah says in the Quran that, that he has enjoined fasting up, uh, uh, for us. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That in order you, that you might attain a state of God consciousness and being mindful of God. So he didn't say so you could be hungry or so you could be thirsty. The thirst and hunger help you attain a state of mindfulness of God. But if you are thirsty and hungry, and again, cursing at this person, getting angry at this person, stealing from this person, lying from this person, checking out this person, all the different things we might do, how we, we, are, we are negating the aspect of attaining a state of mindfulness of God. So again, keep in mind the higher goal, and then we keep in mind the different things we need to do. So let's, let's come up with a goal then for each limb that we have. We're talking about three today, eyes, ears, and tongue to attain a state of taqwa, attain a state of mindfulness of Allah and by controlling our desires. So first level for the eye is not looking at haram. The second level is not looking down on people. The third level is just to not look at things that will waste the, the time, that will not be a benefit. Again, this is a higher station, but we should try to have portions of Ramadan at least. Maybe in the last 10 days, we say, you know what? For a portion of these last 10 days, I'm going to try not to look at things that are just going to waste my time. Maybe I'm not going to read this. Maybe I'm not going to go on this site. Maybe I'm not going to watch these videos because I know it's just going to waste my time and I'm in the most blessed time. I'm in the last stretch of the month of Ramadan. So I don't want to waste my time, right? So that would be um, an example, right, uh, in, the, in this situation. Same thing goes with like watching uh, movies, watching shows. Uh, as long as there's nothing haram in it, you can't necessarily say that the whole thing in and of itself is haram and and uh, and, and whatnot. But you, but you should think about, you know, is this a good use of my time in this blessed month, right? And can I control my watching habits in this blessed month of Ramadan. And remember, the angels are descending regularly in this month. Hell is closed. Heaven is open. What is heaven? If heaven's open, 
then who can come, right? The angels are descending. Already they come down all the time. And they're descending far more often in the month of Ramadan. We know that and in Surah Al-Qadr, Allah says, uh, uh, that the angels and the, and, 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 and Jibreel, alayhi salam, according to the dominant opinion, ascend, descend down. And there's a certain tranquility that comes with them. Now imagine the angels descend and they see us like, you know, watching a Netflix show. Like they would be like, come on, dude, what are you doing? Or they see us like, you know, flirting with someone via text, or they see us uh, uh, looking at something impermissible, or they see us like yelling at our, our parents, or they see us, I mean, how would they, what would they say, right? Like what would, what state do we want to be in when the angels are descending down? Just one example for us to keep in mind. So we should imagine and we should, we should remember that this is a month of, of very, very special blessings. And again, we start by trying not to look at haram things. Then we, then we improve upon that by trying not to look down on other people with the eyes. And then we improve on that even by trying not to look at things that will waste our time, especially as the month progresses and we are getting closer and closer to the end. Then we move on to the tongue. The tongue, generally speaking, can get caught up in many, many, many diseases. Most of the sins that the human being commits relate to the tongue, backbiting, lying, um, uh, accusing people of things, making unnecessary fun of people. All these types of things happen because of the tongue. Cursing, right? These types of things. So the tongue, we should come up with, okay, you know what? We all know the bad habits that we have. Well, I'm going to talk about three right now. Backbiting. So we know when we gossip, we know when we talk bad about people. We all know that there are certain types of situations or certain people that we might talk bad about. So we have to control ourselves in this month of Ramadan um, with regards to speaking bad about people. We really have to work on ourselves in, in, in this month. How do we go about doing that? Well, we should remember first that our reward for the fast will get significantly diminished. And we should remember that backbiting is worse than multiple acts of adultery. Prophet Sallallahu said in Hadith that the backbiting, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but that, that, it, that it's worse than many acts of adultery, right? And which one of us would be cool with like, you know, if, if we committed or if our family member or somebody committed adultery, like nobody's going to be cool with that. Yet regularly we gossip about people. We talk smack about them behind their back. We, you know, uh, 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 we try to try to say things, um, even if we couch them in various words, but that the other person would not like. And backbiting is defined as if the person were to hear it, they wouldn't like it. It doesn't matter if it's true. Backbiting is if it's true. If it's false, it's called slander. Um, but backbiting is when something is true. So in Ramadan, we have to be careful. We should not backbite. We should try to lim we should limit the amount we talk about other people. So the way to do that is first stay away from people who gossip. We know that we have certain friends who gossip, or we might be the friend who gossips. Stay away from texting them. Stay away from interacting with them. Number two, know the types of people who know the types of people you backbite about. Usually, there's a handful: this coworker, this classmate this family member, like we all know, hey, there's like a handful of people that we all talk smack about. And we like, whenever they talk, come up in topic and someone asks them, oh, how's this person doing? We start going off about them, right? And like, oh, they did this and they did that. And we just start to backbite. So we stay away from uh, talk, talking about those types of people and even letting that topic come up. So if we know that, hey, I might say something that's not good, just don't even say it, right? Don't mention that person. Don't mention the, the name of that person. Don't ask about them either, because you know, as soon as you ask somebody, oh, how is so-and-so doing? Boom, the door is open to backbiting and we're in trouble then. Those are the two ways that we should start with. And the other thing is just to remember the, the, uh, the punishment that comes and the amount of, of, of reward that you lose in Ramadan for doing this. Your whole fast can go, right? The whole fast can go because somebody spent an hour or two gossiping about somebody because it's such a such a bad thing spiritually and you won't feel the benefit of the fast you'll feel you'll start to feel trepidation with sin is associated with feeling off and feeling trepidation so the more that you sin the more trepidation that you tend to feel um so that's one of the the diseases of the tongue we should work on in this month second one is the lying and this is fairly straightforward in the sense that we all know if we lie what we lie about and who we lie to. So we should try to stay away from those types of topics and we should try to stay away from people who we either are lying because we want to impress them or we're lying because we feel obligated about something. Usually most people aren't like just straight up telling like huge lies about themselves most of the time. That's at least what I found. Usually little lies here and there people will say about 
you know, situations at work or at school, whatever it is. And so we have to make sure in this blessed month that we stay away from any type of lying because it is a very, very dark effect on your soul. Ramadan, the goal is make your soul full of light. Any sin makes your soul, it adds darkness to the soul. So you don't want to counterbalance all the light that you're getting from fasting with all this darkness. And then it just kind of cancels each other out. You don't want to do that. Um, and the third thing, and this is actually something a lot of us struggle with, is is cursing, cussing, like saying, you know, explicit uh, word, insert word here, right? That type of stuff. So we want to stay away from that. And we all know we should come up with a list. Hey, I say the F word a lot. I say this word. I say this, the, the, the uh, you know, D word a lot. Whatever words it is that we're saying. And we make a commitment. I'm going to stay away from it. I am going to go a whole one day in Ramadan without saying anything bad. I'm going to try because I know the reward of my fast is being diminished, right? And then watch, you'll feel good. You'll do it the next day, but then the next day, maybe you go a whole week. So you set my little, little, little goals, right? And then you say, okay, now I'm going to make this a habit. And I'm going to stay away after doing this for a week regularly. I'm going to stay away from saying things. So as soon as like something crazy happens, instead of saying, oh, and then insert word here, you, you replace that with something else, either a lighter version of it, even if it's not the best word, it's still a lighter version. Or, you know, you replace it with 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 something else. I, I know people who like as soon as you know something intense is about to happen, God forbid, like someone's driving and you know they have to brake suddenly. Most of us would say like, oh, and then some some word. They 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 say yeah, Allah, or they, their their heart is already um, their heart is already attuned in inside. They like they say Bismillah first. So they say Allah first, right? Because they're always in a state of dhikr. So they're not, the last thing that's going to come to their mind is, you know, uh, whatever word that comes to, to most of our minds. And I've totally, you know, I've been in this spot. So I, I, I uh, it's something we all just have to work on. So it's fairly straightforward. List out the words, list out the situations, the people who we talk to that we end up saying these words in front of. And, and, and then we just commit to reducing them and then eliminating them. Great. So we're just going to move on now to the ears. And the main thing here to keep in mind is that in Ramadan, you want to avoid two things. You want to avoid listening to haram, right? So you want to avoid that ideally. And you want to avoid, um, uh, so listening to, you know, explicit, explicit music and, and, and that type of thing. Um, and you want to, after you kind of establish that level, okay, I stopped listening to like generally bad things, curse words, uh, misogynistic lyrics, uh, lyrics talking about sex, anything that they're talking about killing and all these other violent things that they could be talking about, those would be considered impermissible to listen to and they will mess up your spiritual state when you're fasting. Again, there's a difference between having an outward accepted fast and an inwardly realized fast. Your fast can be accepted outwardly by you staying away from food, drink, and sexual relations from the time right before Fajr enters until the time right after Maghrib enters. Your fast can be accepted, but you could get zero reward for the fast. You might get a lot, you might not. You could get zero though, if, depending on how many sins we do. And then even more than that, your spiritual state, right, can be, um, uh, your spiritual state can be affected as well, right? So that is something to keep in mind, that your spiritual state, the state that you have of calmness, is also affected by good deeds and by sin um, that somebody does. So for at the, at the, uh, for 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 um, at the ears, we just have to keep this in mind that you know, we try to avoid listening to things that we would not want to listen to, um, or that would have you know uh, impermissible lyrics. And then we also avoid listening to, as we try to get to a higher level, we try to avoid listening to anything that won't be a benefit to us. So again, we try in the last ten days. Anything that's not beneficial, I'm going to not I'm try not to listen to it. I'm going to try not to listen to, um, uh, I'm going to try not to listen to something that is not going to be beneficial as we get closer. So these are a couple of the things. Um, and someone says, thank you for uh, thinking of fasting for Ramadan, but I'm not Muslim. MashaAllah, may Allah bless you. You know, you should just try it out. Alhamdulillah. If you're, even if you're, if, 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 if Allah is inspiring you with it, I would try it out. Try out fasting, try out some of these other you know, spiritual tips, try out doing some some prayers in, in the month of Ramadan, even if you're not Muslim, and inshallah, you'll feel the benefit. Uh, fasting is actually, God says in the Quran, that fasting has been prescribed for you, if you're speaking now to the Ummah, to the Muslim community, as it was prescribed for those who came before you. So um, those who came before us, many, many other religions had to fast. Many of them have stopped fasting, but many of them had to fast. 
We know that Moses, Musa alayhi salam fasted. We know that Dawood alayhi salam, the prophet David fasted a lot. We know that Isa alayhi salam, prophet Jesus fasted a lot. And of course, all the other prophets did as well. So uh, fasting has immense benefits. Um, we very highly encourage you, mashallah. That's really good. And someone says, what is your favorite part about Ramadan? Um, my favorite part about Ramadan is probably uh, getting a chance to kind of like quiet at my thoughts and everything that's going on and have moments where I at least have to force myself to just kind of calm down a little bit and just be quiet and just listen to what's you know going on in here and just try to connect um, uh, myself, you know, do my best to, to form a, a connection with Allah. That's one of my favorite parts about the blessed month of Ramadan. Uh, alhamdulillah. Cool. So we'll just finish off. And the last thing we just wanted to mention and, um, and, and keep the questions coming, we'll, we'll save about five minutes um, for questions, is if you have the desire to, ang to argue or get angry in Ramadan, again, while you're fasting, you actually are supposed to say, like, I am fasting, I am fasting, and you uh, lead the situation. And if it's with another Muslim, they should know and they should not try to force you to do it, right? Because this is all now us. Usually shaitan, he is going to, um, uh, he's going to push us to argue. Shaitan is going to push us to argue most of the time. But in Ramadan, shaitan, the shayateen, they're locked up, right? There's still human shayateen going around, like human human devils. We know of the many, you know, there, there are definitely many human devils in society. Um, but the 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 actual shayateen, they're locked up. So the argument of the argumentative energy or the anger, what is that hap that comes from us? So we have to work on ourselves in Ramadan to try to control it. So a couple things, remind yourself that you're fasting if that happens. And again, all these are desires we talked about in the past series. And so, um, you know, the, the, the desire for getting uh, angry and desire for arguing was covered a couple of weeks ago. So I'm just kind of distilling it now into what we should focus on for the month of Ramadan. We increase then our thicker, we increase our remembrance of God in order to calm down the anger we of course practice the sunnah of if you're sitting you if you're standing you sit and if you're sitting you lie down and you try to go make cold wudu to calm yourself down right um, and we try to leave the situation so these are things we can do in this blessed month of ramadan to avoid just doing the basics like tr I, I would encourage myself and everybody else challenge yourself this in this month really sincerely challenge yourself to aspire to higher levels and higher station don't just be content with the basics. Don't just be content with staying away from food and drink and, 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 and relations. Try to stop looking at bad things. Try to stop looking at down on people. Try to stop listening to bad things. Try to stop talking and speaking bad things and bad words. Try to stop lying and cheating and all the things we might do here and there. Try to make this a month of purity in order that you and I may attain a state of, of God consciousness and mindfulness of God that will then benefit us. It is a month where you fill your spiritual reserve to help you out throughout the year. Alhamdulillah. And, and if you fill that spiritual reserve, you and I will have so much benefit after the month of Ramadan. We just have to take one step. And Allah multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. And remember, Allah says that fasting, everything that you and I do has a specific reward to it, except fasting. God says, fasting is for me. It's for him meaning he rewards it however he wants to reward it. It has unlimited potential for reward. Fasting is very, very special. The secret of fasting is that nobody knows you're truly, if you're truly fasting except God. Because at any moment during the fast, I could literally just go and I can drink a little bit of water. Right? I could just do that. I mean, today I'm not that, and it's not a, um, it's after Maghrib, but I'm not fasting anyways, but I could just do that, right? And nobody would know. If I'm just in my room, only God knows though if you're really fasting. It's special, it's for him. That means there's a special significance of building a special relationship with him this month. So lastly, we'll just end with in, try to increase your relationship with him in this month. Talk to him more in this month. Connect with the, the book that he sent you, the love letter that God sent you to all of his creation, the Quran in this month. Try to connect to it. Recite it if possible. If you can't recite it, at the very least, read it in, in, in your language, English or whatever language it is that, that, that we might speak. And engage and deepening the relationship. Aspire, make an intention right now. We have short of a week before the month of Ramadan comes in that I'm trying to get closer to Allah in this month. Make vast intentions. I'm trying to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet in this month that we intend to try to follow the Sunnah of the, of the Prophet and follow the example of all the righteous who came after him in this month and to try to attain stations of nearness to Allah that he only gives his most pious servants and that we try to attain uh, uh, forgiveness of Allah for all of our sins and that we intend to let the fasting elevate us and to remove our sins and to uh, 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 allow us to attain a state of purity even after the month 
of Ramadan is over. And there's so many other intentions you can make. Um, so let's try to do that, inshallah. We're going to be doing, lastly, a, a class at um, on Sunday, this coming Sunday. So Sunday, April, or that be, I think, April 11th, right at 6 p.m. PST. Um, uh, we're going to be doing that, and it will be live, uh, inshallah. It will be focused specifically on Ramadan prep, tips for Ramadan prep, a little bit of, like, the, the thick review of Ramadan and a little bit of time for question and answer and, like, also how to manage our time in Ramadan, how to use our time most effectively, so inshallah, join that. Um, and then in the month of Ramadan, we're going to be doing class every Sunday um, and going live every Sunday at 6 p.m. We're about 30 minutes specifically focused on uh, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, specifically focused on repentance, repenting in Ramadan. How do we turn back to Allah in this month? How do we seek his forgiveness? So, um, you know, inshallah, if, if it's if it's uh, beneficial, um, please, you know, please feel free to attend. Alhamdulillah. So if there are any questions now, please post them. Um, we'll get to them and then we will end. Um, Inshallah. Mashallah. Yeah. You're listening to the Quran, English translation. That's really, really good. That's really, really good. Keep that up. Alhamdulillah. The mess understanding the message of the Quran and then implementing it is so important. It's so important. Alhamdulillah. If anybody has any comments or questions, again, just feel please feel free to post them. Otherwise, we will end uh, with the with the dua, inshallah. And somebody asked, do we go live every week? So kind of, um, we will be though, as I just mentioned, the, the schedule, um, uh, we will be following that in, in Ramadan and we might do some more lives um, as well. Okay, cool, we'll end with the prayer. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma aftaha ina fatul al-arifin wa fiqna tafiqa salihin ya arhamar rahimin la ilaha illa anta subhanak anni wa tumina al-balimin. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanata wa fi al-akhirat hasanata wa kina adhaba nar. Ya Allah, oh Allah, we ask you, ya Allah, that you Grant us forgiveness for our sins, Ya Allah. Pardon us for our wrongdoings, Ya Allah. Grant your gentleness and your mercy upon us and upon all of our family members, upon all of our loved ones. Please spread your mercy in this month of Ramadan. Please, Ya Allah, by your mercy, remove this COVID and this disease from us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, make, this, make us be able to meet each other again and to restore uh, a state of normalcy to this world, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, give us spiritual tranquility in this month. Make this month easy for us. Make the fasting easy for us. Make the fasting especially easy for all of our brothers and sisters who are struggling in refugee areas who are struggling in war-torn areas, Ya Allah, bring, bring, bring refuge and bring ease and bring faraj to the Muslims in Yemen and in Syria and Myanmar and in Palestine and in all the other parts of the Muslim world in Kashmir, all the other parts in, 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 in the, the Uyghur Muslims in, in China, all the other parts of the Muslim world, Ya Allah, that people are struggling. Please assist them and please please give them assistance from your uh, special assistance, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, please give us the tawfiq and the, the divine assistance to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in this month and to worship you abundantly in this month in a state of gentleness, fi khair wal lutf wal afia, in a state of health, please give us and those of us who might be sick, Ya Allah, please give us health. Please give us health. Please give us good health. Allahumma salli ala afia. Ya Allah, we ask you for afia. We ask you for complete and total well-being, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, and we ask you, Ya Allah, that you allow us to enter this month with the best of intentions and allow us to gain the best of knowledge before this month comes and allow us to use this month productively and allow us to leave the haram that we are doing and leave the bad thoughts that we have and to be excited for this month rather than seeing this month as a burden, Ya Rabbi I mean, we see, we ask you for everything good that the Prophet asked for and we ask you for protection for everything evil that he asked for. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. All right. Great. Jazakallah khair, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.